according to a centuries-old custom, when the Dogen Signorium marched in formal procession to the various churches in the city, six banners would be carried, two white, two blue and two red. In time of peace, the white went first, during periods of truce, the blue, in war, the red. That Easter, which fell on the 26th of March, still two days before the arrival of the Sultan's envoy, in the annual progress to the Church of S. Zacharia for Vespers, it was the red banners that led the way, and on Easter Monday a certain Girolamo Zane was appointed Captain General of the Venetian fleet, receiving his baton and standard from Doge Lorden at a special mass in the Basilica. Zane was 79 years old, the Doge by now 88, already more than one observer of the ceremony must have asked himself whether, at this crucial moment in its history, the fate of the Republic was in entirely the right hands. Less than six weeks later, Pietro Lorden was dead, his place being taken by a former ambassador to both Charles V, who had loaded him with imperial honours, and to Pius IV, by name Alvise Mokenigo. One Girolamo Zane, meanwhile, had sailed with seventy galleys as far as Zara, on the first stage of an expedition which was to end in fiasco and bring upon him humiliation and disgrace. The original letter which the Sultan's envoy delivered to the Collegio one on the 28th of March has not come down to us. If, however, as seems likely, the version given at the head of this chapter two is a reasonably accurate rendering, Selim's ultimatum could hardly have been more clearly, or more offensively, presented. The Venetian reply was equally to the point, Venice was astonished that the Sultan should already wish to break the treaty he had so recently concluded, she was, however, the mistress of Cyprus and would, by the grace of Jesus Christ, have the courage to defend it. The envoy was then let out by a side door to escape the attentions of the furious crowd which had gathered outside the Doge's palace and escorted back to his waiting ship. As if in an attempt to make up for so much lost time, war preparations in Venice now proceeded apace. The arsenal, its fire damage hastily repaired, was once again working flat out, to raise funds, meanwhile, the government was adopting ever more desperate measures, even going so far as to increase the number of procurators of Saint Mark, the highest dignitaries in the state apart from the Doge himself, by eight, disposing of the new titles in return for loans of 20,000 ducats. Neighboring towns and cities contributed according to their means, and, just as in the old days, rich citizens undertook to build or equip ships, or enlist private militias, sometimes of several thousand men, at their own expense. From the other Christian states to which appeals had been sent, the response was less enthusiastic. The Emperor Maximilian pointed out that his formal truce with the Turks still had five more years to run. The King of Poland was equally reluctant in view of his own exposed position. From France Catherine de' Medici, now effectively the regent, was quarreling with Spain over Flanders and pleaded her nation's old alliance with the Sultan, though she offered the services of her son, Charles IX, as mediator, an offer which was politely declined. The King of Portugal pointed out that he was fully engaged in the Orient, and that anyway his country was being ravaged by plague. The Knights of St. John, who were, incidentally, the biggest landowners in Cyprus, offered five ships, but four of them were to be captured by the Turks soon after they left Malta. Our letter had even gone off to the Tsar of Muscovy, but it seems unlikely that it ever reached him. In any event Ivan the Terrible was at war with Poland and it is hard to see what assistance he could have given. No appeal was addressed to Queen Elizabeth of England, who had been under sentence of excommunication since February. That left Pope Pius V and Philip II of Spain. The Pope had agreed to equip a dozen vessels if Venice would provide the hulls. Philip, for his part, had offered a fleet of fifty ships, under the command of Gian Andrea Doria great nephew and heir of that Andrea whose hatred of Venice had twice led him to betray the Republic's trust, at Corfu and Preveza, some thirty years before. One even this was a niggardly enough contribution, Venice had produced a fleet of 144 ships, including 126 war galleys. 
but Philip had always mistrusted the Venetians, whom he suspected, not without some cause, of holding themselves ready to make terms with the Sultan if the opportunity offered, and, as events were to show, he had given Doria, whose feelings against the Republic were no whit less hostile than those of his great uncle, secret instructions to keep out of trouble, to let the Venetians do the fighting, and to bring the Spanish fleet safely home again as soon as possible. From the start, the expedition seemed to be ill fated. The Captain General, who had understood that the Spanish and Papal squadrons were to join him at Zara, waited there in vain for two months during which time his fleet was ravaged by some unidentified epidemic, causing not only many deaths but a general demoralization which in turn led to scores of desertions. On the 12th of June he sailed to Corfu, where he picked up Sebastiano Venia, the erstwhile prove editor general of the island who had recently been appointed to the same position in Cyprus. Here he heard that the papal squadron under Mark Antonio Colonna was awaiting the Spaniards at Otteranto, but of Philip's promised fleet there was still no sign. Not till July was it learned that Gian Andrea Doria had simply remained in Sicily, on the pretext that he had received no instructions to go further. After urgent protestations from the Pope, Philip finally sent his admiral sailing orders, which arrived on the 8th of August, even then. It was another four days before the fleet set forth from Messina and a further eight before it reached Otranto, a journey which, in the perfect weather conditions prevailing, should have taken no more than two. Having at last joined his papal allies, Doria made no effort to call on Colonna or even to communicate with him, and, when Colonna decided to ignore this studied piece of discourtesy and take the initiative himself, he was answered with a long speech implicitly recommending that the whole expedition should be called off. The season was late, the Spanish ships were not in fighting condition, and, as Doria was at pains to point out, though his instructions were to sail under the papal flag, he was also under the orders of his sovereign to keep his fleet intact. Colonna somehow forbore to remind him who was to blame for the first two misfortunes, merely pointing out that both king and pope expected their fleets to sail with the Venetians to Cyprus, accordingly, sail they must. Finally, and with ill grace, Doria agreed. Girolamo Zane had by now moved on to Crete, where the papal and Spanish fleets joined him on 1 September, almost exactly five months since his departure from Venice. A council was called, at which Doria at once began raising new difficulties. This time it was the Venetian galleys that were unfit for war, if the allied fleet were to come to grips with the enemy, it would be either destroyed or ignominiously put to flight. Moreover, once they had left Crete, there were no harbours in which to take refuge. Now, too, he revealed a fact that he had not, apparently, thought necessary to mention before, he must return to the west by the end of the month at the latest. Colonna remained firm. The season, though advanced, was not yet prohibitively so, there were still two clear months before the onset of winter. Cyprus was rich in admirable harbours. The Venetian ships had admittedly been undermanned, but their long wait had given them plenty of time to find replacements and their crews were all once again up to strength. Altogether the combined fleets now comprised 205 sail, the Turks were pound thought to number 150 at the most. Why, therefore, should they fear an armed encounter? Flight would indeed be ignominious, but to retire now, before even sighting the enemy, would be more dishonorable still. At this point, Zane, who at Colonna's discreet suggestion had remained absent from the opening discussion, joined his colleagues and immediately tabled a written request that the expedition should be allowed to proceed. Dorius still prevaricated finally agreeing only on condition that the Spanish ships should be given preferential treatment, that they should be exempt from rearguard duty and that they should sail in a group apart, in such a way as to be able to disengage completely if they felt so inclined. It was no wonder that, by the 7th of September, while discussions were still dragging on, Zane addressed an almost desperate letter to the Council of Ten, complaining that Doria was obviously determined not to fight that he was continually raising new objections and resuscitating old ones, and that although with patience and tact it had so far been possible to overcome these objections, 
he was throwing all their plans into confusion and disrupting the whole enterprise. On the 13th, the fleet moved on to Sisha, at the eastern end of the island, and there, at Doria's insistence, there was a general review at which it was revealed, to his ill concealed satisfaction, that the Venetian galleys were indeed below strength, with only some 80 writing men per vessel as compared with the hundred odd in the papal and Spanish squadrons. Once again he advised withdrawal, and although once again ultimately overruled he managed to delay departure three full days, long enough for Zane to sustain another severe blow, a report that the Turks had landed in Cyprus. It was now or never. On the night of the 17th of September the fleet sailed for the beleaguered island. But off Castel Lorizo there came worse news still. Nicosia had fallen. Another council was called, at which Doria predictably redoubled his protestations. And now, for the first time, the Marquis of Santa Cruz, who as commander of the Neapolitan contingent was technically a subordinate of Doria's but who had hitherto taken a considerably more robust line than his chief, also advised turning back. The capture of Nicosia, he pointed out, would mean a vast increase in the number of fighting men available for the Turkish fleet and a corresponding upsurge in enemy morale, at the worst possible time, when the Allied crews were becoming more and more dispirited. Colonna agreed with him, so, sadly and reluctantly, did old Girolamo Zane. One voice only was raised in favor of a continued advance, that of Sebastiano Venia, who argued that, however strong the Turks might be, they would almost certainly be a good deal stronger next year when, incidentally, the Allies were most unlikely to have a fleet of over 200 sail to throw against them. They were brave words, but they failed to convince, and the mighty fleet, flying the banners of Christendom, turned about and sailed for home without having once sighted the enemy. In an almost pathetic attempt to salvage the last shreds of his reputation, poor Zane proposed that the Allies should at least try to inflict some damage on enemy territory during their return journey, but once again his helps were sabotaged by Doria's impatience to get home. By the time he reached Corfu on 17 November, having stopped in Crete on the way, a new epidemic had broken out in his ships and he himself was, mentally and physically, a broken man. Lacking even the heart to return home, he wrote to the Senate asking to be relieved of his post. His request was granted, and on the 13th of December Sebastiano Venia was appointed Captain General in his stead. So ended one of the most humiliating episodes in the history of Venice. Unless it were argued that, having provided some three quarters of the combined fleet, she should not have lost time waiting for her allies but should have pressed on alone in June, she could not in fairness be held responsible but neither could she escape her share of the disgrace, much of which fell on the undeserving head of old Girolamo Zane himself. Ordered back to Venice early in 1571, in the following year, the cause of the delay is unknown, he was summoned by the Council of Ten to answer several grave charges relating to his conduct during the expedition. After a long inquiry he was acquitted, but too late. In September 1572 he had died in prison. The fate of Gian Andrea Doria was somewhat different. Philip II had been left in no doubt of the bitter feelings his admiral had aroused. Pope Pius, indeed, on receiving Colonna's report, had sent the king a formal letter of complaint. But Philip chose to ignore it. Doria had obeyed his instructions to the letter, and was rewarded by immediate promotion to the rank of general, with seniority over all the commanders of the fleets of Spain, Naples and Sicily, in which capacity he was to do still further damage to the Christian cause before his unedifying career was over. In 1570 Venice had held Cyprus for 81 years. Queen Caterina had been replaced by a Venetian governor, with the title of lieutenant, in him and his two councillors, the three together, known as the rectors, were the Cypriot equivalent of the Signoria, rested in effect virtually all the civil power. There was in addition a great council, comprising all the nobility of the island over the age of twenty-five, plus certain of those resident Venetians who had settled there, of these latter, the nobles were immediately eligible, the rest, 
provided they were not members of the mechanical trades could purchase their seats after a five-year residence. But its functions were largely electoral, and even then its decisions were subject to the rector's confirmation. While the civil government was established at Nicosia, the military headquarters were at Fumagusta. There the standing garrison of cavalry and infantry, and the Cyprus-based fleet, were under the command of a Venetian captain, though in time of war he might expect a prove editor general to be sent specially out from Venice to assume supreme authority. Fumagusta, unlike Nicosia, was superbly fortified, omnia merbium fortissima, as an astonished traveller described it. Historically, too, it was the island's principal harbour, although by 1570 Salines, the modern Larnaca, had overtaken it in terms of commercial traffic. The total population was about 160,000, still living under an anachronistically feudal system which the Republic had made little or no effort to change. At the top were the nobility, partly Venetian but for the most part still of old French crusader stock like the former royal house of Luke Signan. Much of the land was in their hands, but under the prevailing law of primogeniture there was an ever-increasing number of unpropertied younger sons who frequently constituted a problem to the government. At the bottom was the peasantry, many of whom were still effectively serfs, owing their masters two days' service a week. For them, despite the extreme fertility of the island, life was a struggle and oppression an integral part of it. Between the two was the merchant class and the urban bourgeoisie, our Levantine melting pot of Greeks, Venetians, Armenians, Syrians, Copts and Jews. Cyprus, in short, cannot have been an easy place to govern, it must be admitted, however, that the Venetians, whose own domestic administration was the wonder and envy of the civilized world, should have governed it a great deal better than they did. Perhaps the very strictness of the standards demanded of them at home increased the temptation to feather their nests once they were a safe distance away, probably, too, they were infected by the general atmosphere of venality which, we are told, prevailed in the island long before they took power. What is certain is that by the time the Turks landed in the summer of 1570 Venice had acquired a grim record of maladministration and corruption and had made herself thoroughly unpopular with her Cypriot subjects. Even the rich nobility, however much they might oppress their own peasantry, objected to the way in which, as they saw it, the Republic was enriching itself at the island's expense, and its official representatives, by less overt methods, following suit. They resented, too, their lack of any real power. The other, humbler, sections of the population felt much the same. Many indeed believed that any change of government could only be for the better, a sentiment which was not without significance when the moment of crisis came. The joint expedition for the relief of Cyprus had been an unmitigated disaster, and yet, even if it had safely arrived at its destination, disembarked its fighting men and obeyed all its instructions to the letter, it could scarcely have saved the island. A major victory at sea might perhaps have proved temporarily effective delaying the inevitable for a year or two, but since the Turkish invasion fleet that dropped anchor on the 3rd of July at Larnaca numbered not less than 350 sail, more than double colonel's estimate, such a victory would have been, to say the least, unlikely. The truth is that, from the moment that Selim II decided to incorporate the island in his empire, Cyprus was doomed. It was doomed for the same fundamental reason that Malta five years before, had been saved, the inescapable fact that the strength of any army in the field varies inversely with the length of its lines of communication and supply. Since Cyprus had neither the means, the ability, nor, probably, the will to defend itself, it could only be defended by Venice, from which all military supplies, arms and ammunition, and the bulk of the fighting men and horses would have to come but Venice lay over 1,500 miles away across the Mediterranean, much of which was now dominated by the Turks. They, on the other hand, had only 50 miles to sail from ports on the southern Anatolian coast, where they could count on an almost limitless supply of manpower and materials. Their success seemed the more assured in that the Cypriot defences, apart from those of Fumagusta, were hopelessly inadequate. 
Nicosia, it is true, boasted a nine-mile circuit of medieval walls, but they enclosed an area considerably larger than the town and needed a huge force to defend them. They were moreover far too thin, the siege techniques of the 16th century were vastly different from those of the 14th, and despite the feverish last-minute efforts of Venetian engineers to strengthen them they stood a poor chance of survival against the massive artillery which had long been a speciality of the Turks. Kyrnia had once been a splendid fortress, but it had fallen long since into ruin, and though the two some work had recently been done to repair and strengthen the existing walls, it was unlikely to hold out for long. The fortifications of all other Cypriot towns were either negligible or non-existent, from the first it was understood that only in Nicosia and from Augusta was there any hope of prolonged resistance. Manpower too was in short supply. Accurate estimates of numbers are never easy, but it is unlikely that there were more than 20,000 fighting men including some 500 cavalry, in Nicosia when the siege began and of these little more than half were fully effective. Francis Angelo Calipio, who was present throughout, tells us that there were 1,040 arquebuses in the magazines, but that they were not properly distributed nor were any instructions given as to their use, with the result that many soldiers found it impossible to fire them without setting light to their beards. For this and many other shortcomings in the defences of the capital, the principal blame must fall on the lieutenant, Niccolo Dandolo. Uncertain, timid, forever vacillating between bouts of almost hysterical activity and periods of apathetic inertia, he was obviously unsuited to the supreme command, which would not have been his if Sebastiano Venia, the proved editor general designate who had sailed with Girolamo Zane's expedition, had managed to reach the island. Through the agonizing months which were to follow, Dandolo was to prove a constant liability his lack of judgment and immoderate caution occasionally giving rise to suspicions, as it happened, unfounded, that he was in enemy pay. Fortunately there were better men at Fumagusta, the Perugian general Astur Bagliani, who had been sent out from Venice in April as commander-in-chief, and the captain, Mark Antonio Bragadin, whose appalling fate when the siege was over was to earn him a permanent niche in the Venetian Hall of Fame and his conqueror lasting infamy. The Turkish invasion force had appeared off the coast of Cyprus on the 1st of July. Sultan Selim, the memory of his father's humiliation in Malta still fresh in his mind, had spared no pains in its preparation, and had entrusted it to two of his ablest and most experienced commanders, Lala Mustafa Pasha for the land forces and Bil Pasha, a Croat who, with Dragut, had trounced a Spanish fleet under Gian Andrea Doria ten years before, for the fleet. After a lightning raid on Limassol, where it did considerable damage, sacking the town and a neighboring monastery before being repulsed, it continued along the south coast to Launaca. Here, owing to Dandolo's timidity, Mustafa was able to land his entire force without opposition, settling in his men while he awaited further troops from the mainland. From Larnaca he then dispatched a blind Greek monk to Nicosia with the usual ultimatum, since Venice had no chance of successfully resisting his superbly equipped force of 200,000 men, let her now cede the island peaceably, thus retaining the friendship and favor of the Sultan. If she did not, it would be the worse for her. To this missive the rectors in Nicosia sent no reply, they did, however, send an urgent appeal to Famagusta asking for the return of Bagliani with reinforcements. The request was refused, on the grounds that the threat to Nicosia might well be a feint, the weight of the Turkish attack was still expected at Fumagusta. but Mustafa was not dissembling. When his reinforcements arrived on the 22nd of July he set off that same evening for Nicosia, and two days later his immense army was encamped outside the walls of the city. Now once again a chance was lost. The Italian commander of infantry begged for permission to mount an immediate attack, while the enemy was still tired by their march of thirty miles through the heat of a Cyprus summer, and their artillery and heavy cavalry were still unprepared. Once again Dandolo and his fellow rectors declined to take the risk, and the Turks were allowed to dig themselves in undisturbed dot and so the siege began. The Turkish army, though not perhaps quite as numerous as its commander had claimed 
must have been a good 100,000 strong, its cannon and light artillery were formidable and, in contrast to the pathetic firing pieces of the defenders along the walls, were employed with deadly accuracy and expertise. Meanwhile Dandolo, fearing a shortage of gunpowder, had rationed its use to the point where even those of his soldiers who had firearms and knew how to use them were forbidden to shoot at any group of Turks numbering fewer than ten. Yet, however weak-spirited the lieutenant, there were others around him who did not lack courage. Somehow the city held out, all through a sweltering August, and it was only on the 9th of September, after Mustafa's men had given the noisiest and most jubilant welcome of which they were capable to a further 20,000 troops freshly arrived from the mainland, that the defenders finally yielded to the 15th major assault. Thus, after 45 days, Nicosia fell. Even as the triumphant Turks swarmed through the city, the resistance continued, a final stand being made in the main square, in front of the lieutenant's palace. Dandolo, who had taken refuge inside it some hours before while his men were still fighting on the ramparts, now appeared in his crimson velvet robes, hoping to receive the favoured treatment due to his rank. Scarcely had he reached the foot of the steps when a Turkish officer struck his head from his shoulders. It was customary, when a besieged town had defended itself to the last, for the victorious commander to allow his men a three day period of rapine and plunder. The usual atrocities followed the usual massacres, quarterings, and impalements, the usual desecration of churches, and violation of the youth of both sexes. What was unusual was the sheer extent of the looting. Nicosia was a rich city, generously endowed with treasures ecclesiastical and secular, western and Byzantine. It was a full week before all the gold and silver, the precious stones and enameled reliquaries, the jeweled vestments, the velvets and brocades had been loaded onto the carts and trundled away, the richest spoils to fall into Turkish hands since the capture of Constantinople itself well over a century before dot as he and his army returned to the coast, Mustafa left a garrison of 4,000 janissaries to re-fortify the city. He still expected a Venetian relief expedition, if it came, an attempt to recapture Nicosia could not be discounted. Meanwhile, however, he had no intention of abandoning the offensive himself. Already on the 11th of September, two days after the fall of Nicosia, he had sent a messenger to the commanders at Famagusta, calling upon them to surrender and bearing, as an additional inducement, the head of Niccolò Dandolo in a basin. It would be their turn next. Although Mustafa Pasha can hardly have expected that his ultimatum would have the desired effect and that Famagusta would capitulate without a fight, he must nevertheless have cursed its commanders for their stubbornness. Even Nicosia had given him more trouble than he had expected but from Augusta promised to be a really formidable challenge. The old fortifications had been torn down at the end of the previous century and replaced with a completely new Encinti, incorporating all the latest advances in military architecture, and the town was now, to all appearances, as near impregnable as any town could be. Behind those tremendous walls the defenders were admittedly few, some 8,000 as compared with a Turkish force which, with new contingents arriving every few weeks from the mainland, probably by now fell not far short of the 200,000 of which Mustafa had boasted to Dandolo. On the other hand they had in Bragadin and Baglini two first-rate leaders whom they already respected and for whom their love and admiration were to grow during the trials that lay ahead. The army and the fleet, loaded to the gunnels with Nicosia loot, arrived at Fumagustu on the same day, the 17th of September, and the siege began at once. Thanks to the courage and enterprise of the two commanders, it was from the first a far more dynamic affair than that of Nicosia, with the defenders making frequent sorties outside the walls and sometimes even carrying the battle right into the Turkish camp. All through the winter it continued, the Venetians showing no signs of weakening, in January, indeed, they were considerably strengthened both materially and morally, by the arrival of a 1500-man relief force, with arms and munitions, under the command of Marco and Mark Antonio Carini, who had managed to break through the depleted Turkish blockade. 
In April the level of food supplies began to give some cause for concern, but Bragadin dealt with the problem efficiently enough by evicting over 5,000 useless mouths from among the civil population and sending them out to seek shelter in the neighboring villages. Towards the end of that same month Mustafa changed his tactics, ordering his corps of Armenian sappers to dig a huge network of trenches to the south. As the corps numbered some 40,000 and was further supplemented by forced labor from the local peasantry, work progressed rapidly. By the middle of May the whole region was honeycombed for a distance of three miles from the walls, the trenches numerous enough to accommodate the whole besieging army and so deep that mounted cavalry could ride along them with only the tips of their lances visible to the watchers on the ramparts. The Turks also constructed a total of ten siege towers, progressively closer to the town, from which they could fire downwards onto the defenders. From there, on the 15th of May, the final bombardment began. The Venetians fought back with courage and determination. Again and again their own artillery would destroy whole sections of the Turkish siege towers, but to no avail, a few hundred sappers would get to work, and the towers would be as good as new by morning. Slowly, as the weeks dragged by, they began to lose heart. Hopes of the great Venetian Spanish relief expedition, which had kept their spirits up through the winter and spring, had faded, powder was running short, food was even shorter. By July all the horses, donkeys and cats in the town had been eaten, nothing was left but bread and beans. Of the defenders, only five hundred were still capable of bearing arms, and they were dropping through lack of sleep. On the 29th the Turks unleashed a new general assault, their fifth. The Christians held them back, but at the cost of two-thirds of their number killed or wounded. On the 30th came another, on the 31st another still. Even then, Mustafa failed to break in, but that night the Venetian generals inspected their defenses and their remaining stocks of food and ammunition and realized that they could hold out no longer. By a voluntary surrender they might still, according to the accepted rules of warfare avoid the massacres and the looting that were otherwise inevitable. Dawn broke on the 1st of August to reveal a white flag fluttering on the ramparts of Famagusta. The peace terms were surprisingly generous. All Italians were to be allowed to embark, with colors flying, for Crete, together with any Greeks, Albanians or Turks who wished to accompany them. On their journey they would not be molested by Turkish shipping which would on the contrary furnish them with all the assistance they required. Greeks who elected to stay behind would be guaranteed their personal liberty and property, and would be given two years in which to decide whether they would remain permanently or not, those who then elected to leave would be given safe conduct to the country of their choice. The document setting out these terms was signed personally by Mustafa and sealed with the Sultan's seal. It was then returned to Bagliani and Bragadin with a covering letter complimenting them on their courage and their magnificent defense of the city. For the next four days arrangements for the departure went smoothly enough. Food supplies were sent in and, apart from a few minor incidents, relations between the Europeans and the Turks were friendly. On the 5th of August Bragadin sent word to Mustafa proposing to call and formally to present him with the keys of Famagusta. Back came the reply that the general would be delighted to receive him. Donning his purple robe of office, he set off that evening accompanied by Bagliani and a number of his senior officers, escorted by a mixed company of Italian, Greek and Albanian soldiers. Mustafa received them with every courtesy, then, without warning, his face clouded and his manner changed. In a mounting fury, he began hurling baseless accusations at the Christians standing before him. They had murdered Turkish prisoners, they had concealed munitions instead of handing them over according to the terms of surrender. Suddenly, he whipped out a knife and cut off Bragadin's right ear, ordering an attendant to cut off the other and his nose. Then, turning to his guards, he ordered them to execute the whole party. As to a Bagliani was beheaded, so too was the commander of artillery, Luigi Martiningo. One or two managed to escape, but most were massacred, together with a number of other Christians who chanced to be within reach. Finally the heads of all those that had been murdered were piled in front of Mustafa's pavilion. 
they are said to have numbered 350. Dot. Now that the killing had begun it was very hard to stop. Mustafa himself, who seemed at last to have regained his composure, forbade his howling soldiery to enter for Magusta on pain of death, many, however, disobeyed his orders and ran amok through the city, killing any citizen they chanced to meet, burning and pillaging in a frenzy of bloodlust. Others headed for the port, where they found victims in plenty among the Christians preparing to embark for the west. But the worst fate had been reserved for Mark Antonio Bragadin. He was held in prison for nearly a fortnight, by which time his untreated wounds were festering and he was already seriously ill. First he was dragged round the walls, with sacks of earth and stones on his back, next, tied into a chair, he was hoisted to the yard arm of the Turkish flagship and exposed to the taunts of the sailors. Finally he was taken to the place of execution in the main square, tied naked to a column and, literally, flayed alive. Even this torture he is said to have borne in silence for half an hour until, as the execution reached his waist, he finally expired. After the grim task was completed, his head was cut off, his body quartered, and his skin, stuffed with straw and cotton and mounted on a cow, was paraded through the streets. When, on the 22nd of September, Mustafa sailed for home, he took with him as trophies the heads of his principal victims and the skin of Mark Antonio Bragadin, which he proudly presented to the Sultan. The fate of the heads is unknown, but nine years later a certain Gyralama Pladera, one of the few survivors of the siege, managed to steal the skin from the arsenal of Constantinople and to return it to Bragadin's sons, who deposited it in the church of S. Gregorio. From here, on the 18th of May 1596, it was transferred to S.S. Giovanni e. Paolo, and placed in a niche behind the urn which forms part of the hero's memorial. Here it still remains today. 137 Lep until 1570 to 1571 Sembros Paul Accorti Como Negocio Venida de la Mano de Dios, Y8 Odos Nos Pesia and Suino, Por Circosa Que No Se Harjamas Visto Oido Istabutla Y Victoria Naval. There is no man at the court who does not discern in it the hand of the Lord, and it seems to us all like a dream in that never before has such a battle and victory at sea been seen or heard of. Letter from State Secretary Juan Luis de Altsamarato Don John of Austria, the 11th of November 1571 The failure of the 1570 expedition had been, for Venice and the papacy, a humiliating blow, already, however, negotiations were well underway for a firmer and more effective alliance. The prime mover of this new initiative was the Pope. Pius V had thought long and hard about the Turkish threat, and had realized that the principal obstacle to any close understanding between Spain and Venice was that Venice saw the problem in terms of her colonies in the Levant, while Spain was a good deal more anxious about the danger presented by the Sultan's Moorish vassals to her own possessions in North Africa. To Pius, therefore, the primary aim of Christendom should be to re-establish control of the central Mediterranean, cutting off the Sultan's African territories from those in Europe and Asia and thus effectively splitting his empire into two. In July 1570 the Pope had accordingly called a conference to draft the charter of a new Christian League, and over the following months, by patient argument and with active Venetian, help, had gradually won King Philip round. It was a hard struggle. After eight months, just when the last obstacles seemed on the point of being overcome, the Spaniards had second thoughts and threatened to renege on all that they had so far agreed. It was only after Venice, her patience exhausted, had actually dispatched an envoy to Constantinople to try and make a separate peace that they changed their attitude once again and allowed the remaining points to be settled. The resulting treaty was formally proclaimed on the 25th of May 1571 in St. Peter's. It was to be perpetual, offensive as well as defensive, and directed not only against the Ottoman Turks themselves but also against their Moorish vassals and co-religionists along the North African coast. The signatories, Spain, Venice and the papacy, the way was left open for the emperor and the kings of France and Poland to join if they so wished, were together to furnish 200 galleys, 
100 transport, 50,000 foot soldiers and 4,500 cavalry, with the requisite artillery and ammunition. These forces were to foregather every year, in the month of April at the latest, for a summer's campaign wherever they thought fit. Every autumn there would be consultations in Rome to determine the next year's activity. If either Spain or Venice were attacked, the other would go to her assistance, and both undertook to defend papal territory with all their strength. All fighting would be under the banner of the League, important decisions would be taken by a majority vote of the three generals commanding, Sebastiano Venia for Venice, Mark Antonio Colonna for the papacy, and for Spain the captain general of the combined fleet, the king's half-brother. Don John of Austria. Don John was the bastard son of Charles V by a German lady called Barbara Blomberg. 26 years old, outstandingly good looking and a natural leader of men, he had already distinguished himself the previous year by putting down the Morisco rising in Spain. The Venetians expressed themselves delighted at the appointment, as well they might have been, since the king's first choice about which he had luckily had second thoughts, had been Gian Andrea Doria. They would have expressed rather less pleasure had they known that Philip, who suspected that the young prince's courage was apt to override his judgment, had told him that he must on no account give battle without Doria's express consent. Although it was clearly too late to observe the timetable stipulated in the treaty, the Allies had agreed that the summer of 1571 should not be wasted and that the forces for the first year's campaign should muster as soon as possible at Messina. By August all had arrived, and Don John drew up his sailing orders. He himself, with Venia and Colonna, would take the center, with 64 galleys. The right wing, with 54 galleys, would be under Doria, the left, with 53, under the Venetian Augustino Barbarigo. In addition there was to be a small vanguard of eight galleys and a rearguard of six, to be respectively commanded by Don Juan de Cardona and the Marquis of Santa Cruz. To each group were allotted six galleases. The galleons and heavy transport, which, not being oared like the galleys, were considerably less maneuverable, were to form a separate convoy. One emboldened by the fall of Fumagustu and by the departure of virtually the entire Venetian fleet for Messina, the Turks had by now entered the Adriatic in strength, landings in Corfu and in Dalmatia had aroused increasing fears in Venice of a sudden invasion which would find the city almost without defence. At the approach of the combined fleet, however, the Turks rapidly withdrew to their bases in Greece. They had no wish to be blockaded within the narrow sea with the enemy all round them. Thus it was from Lepanto, the modern Norpactos on the Gulf of Patras, that they sailed out, on the 6th of October, to meet the advancing Christians. The Christians were in a fighting mood. Two days before, at Cephalonia, they had heard of the fall of Fumagustu and, in particular, of the death of Mark Antonio Bragadin. Rage and vengeance were in their hearts. On the same day, However, there occurred an incident which almost proved disastrous. A Spanish officer and a few of his men on Sebastiano Venia's galley insulted some Venetians, and in the ensuing fight several men were killed. Venia, without consultation and on his own initiative, had the culprits hanged at the masthead. When this was reported to Don John, he flew into a rage and ordered the captain's arrest, a command which, had it been obeyed, might well have torn the whole fleet apart. Fortunately wiser counsels, probably those of Colonna, prevailed and John was persuaded to revoke his order, but he never forgave Venia. Henceforth all his communications with the Venetian contingent were addressed to the second in command. The two fleets met at dawn on the 7th of October, a mile or two east of Cape Scruffa, at the entrance to the Gulf of Patras. The galleons had not yet arrived but Don John was determined to engage the enemy at once. Only slightly revising his order of battle, Barbarigo and Doria receiving ten more galleys each, he drew his ships up into formation and sailed to the attack. The Turks were ready for him, with a fleet that almost precisely matched his own, describing a huge crescent that extended from one shore of the gulf to the other. The Admiral, Ali Pasha, commanded the central squadron with 87 galleys, 
on his right was Mehmet Sorluk, governor of Alexandria, with 54, and on his left, opposite Doria, was Allah Chali with 61. It was about half past 10 when the battle opened, at the north end of the battle lines, where Don John's left wing under Barbarigo engaged Ali's right under Sorluk. The fighting was fierce, Barbarigo's own flagship being at one moment set upon by five Turkish vessels which simultaneously let loose a hail of arrows, one of them wounding the Venetian admiral mortally in the eye. His nephew, Marco Contarini, took over the command, but within five minutes he too was dead. Yet the engagement ended in total victory for the Christians, who, under the leadership of Federico Nani and Marco Quirini, eventually succeeded in driving the entire Turkish right wing into the shore. The Turks abandoned their ships and tried to escape in the surrounding hills, but the Venetians pursued them and cut them down as they ran. Sorlik was taken prisoner, but he was already seriously wounded and did not long survive. Now the focus of the battle shifted to the center, where at eleven o'clock or thereabouts Don John's galleys, advancing in line abreast at a steady, even stroke, closed on those of Ali Pasha, the two flagships making deliberately straight for each other. They met, and entangled, to each side of them along the line, the other galleys did the same simultaneously closing in towards the middle until the sea was scarcely visible and men were leaping and scrambling from ship to ship, fighting hand to hand with swords, cutlasses and scimitars. Twice Ali's force of 400 picked Janissaries boarded Don John's flagship, the real, three times the Spaniards returned the attack, the last time under heavy covering fire from Colonna, who had just set fire to the galley of Patao Pasha, Ali's second in command. It was on this third occasion that Ali was struck on the forehead by a cannon ball. Scarcely had he fallen before his head was sliced off by a soldier from Malaga, who stuck it on a pike and waved it aloft to give courage to his comrades. With their admiral killed and their flagship captured, the Turks rapidly lost heart. Many of their ships were destroyed in the melee, those that managed to extricate themselves turned and fled dot to the south. Meanwhile, things were going less well. From the very beginning of the advance, at about ten o'clock that morning, Gian Andrea Doria had been uneasy about his position. The Turkish left wing under Allah Chali which confronted him was longer and stronger, ninety-three vessels to his own sixty-four, and, extending as it did further southward, threatened to outflank him. It was to avoid this danger that he had altered his course towards the southeast a decision which left an ever-widening gap between Don John and himself. He should have known better. Alacha saw the gap, and instantly changed his plans, altering his own direction towards the northwest with the object of cutting straight through the Christian line and falling upon it from the rear. This new course led him against the southern end of Don John's squadron, which consisted of a few ships contributed by the Knights of Malta. They fought bravely but they had no chance against the overwhelming odds and were massacred to a man. Their flagship was taken in tow, and Allah Chali raised their captured standard on his own. By now Don Juan de Cardona, whose eight galleys had been held in reserve, was hurrying to the relief of the knights. As he approached, sixteen Turkish galleys fell on him. There followed the fiercest and bloodiest encounter of the whole day. When it was over, 450 of the 500 fighting men of Cardona's galleys had been killed or wounded, and Cardona himself was on the point of death. Several ships, when boarded later, were found to be manned entirely by corpses. Meanwhile others were hurrying to the rescue, the second reserve force under Santa Cruz and, as soon as he could leave his own area of the battle, Don John himself. Alachali stayed no longer ordered thirteen of his galleys to quicken their stroke and headed with them northwest at full speed towards Santa Mora, the modern Lucas, and Preveza. The remainder broke away in the other direction and returned to Lepanto. Despite the confusion and the appalling losses sustained as a result of the cowardice, treachery and sheer bad seamanship of Gian Andrea Doria, and there were plenty of his colleagues after the battle to accuse him of all three, the Battle of Lepanto had been an overwhelming victory for the Christians. According to the most reliable estimates, they lost only twelve galleys sunk and one captured, 
Turkish losses were 113 and 117 respectively. Casualties were heavy on both sides, as was inevitable when much of the fighting was hand to hand, but, whereas the Christian losses are unlikely to have exceeded 15,000, the Turks are believed to have lost double that number, excluding the 8,000 who were taken prisoner. One in addition, there was enormous plunder. Ali Pasha's flagship alone was found to contain 150,000 sequins. Finally, comes the most gratifying figure of all that of the 15,000 Christian galley slaves set at liberty. For all this the lion's share of the credit must go to Don John himself, whose handling of his unwieldy and heterogeneous fleet was masterly and whose brilliant use of his firepower was to have a lasting effect on the development of naval warfare. In future, sea battles would be decided by guns rather than by swordsmanship. This in turn would mean bigger, heavier ships which could only be propelled by sail. Lepanto was the last great naval engagement to be fought with oared galleys, ramming each other head on. The age of the broadside had begun. It was the 18th of October before one Jufredo Justinian, aboard the galley Angelo, reached Venice with the news. The city was still mourning the loss of Cyprus, raging against the bestial treatment of Marcantonio Bragadin and fearful as to what further reverses the future might have in store. Within an hour of the Angelo's appearance, trailing the Turkish banners in the water behind her stern, her deck piled high with trophies, the whole mood had changed. Venice had had her revenge, nor had she had long to wait for it. Suddenly the Campi, the Cili and the canals were filled with sounds of jubilation, as everyone hurried to the piazza to hear the details, find their friends and celebrate. Total strangers were falling on each other's necks, laughing and kissing each other, the gates of the debtor's prison were opened in an act of spontaneous amnesty, while the Turkish merchants, with a contrary motion, barricaded themselves for safety inside the Fondaco de Turchi until the excitement was over. In St. Mark's, specially illuminated for the occasion, a dumb was followed by a high mass of thanksgiving, Around the Rialto the cloth merchants decked the shops and houses with sky-blue draperies spangled with golden stars, while over the bridge itself there was erected a great triumphal arch bearing the arms of Venice and her gallant allies. That night there was scarcely a building in the city that was not illuminated by candles and torches inside and out, while bands played, the people danced and, in order that no one need fear to join the general rejoicing. The wearing of masks was permitted by a special dispensation. In more permanent commemoration of the event, Gambello's great entrance portal to the arsenal was enlarged and adorned by the addition of the winged lion, with appropriate inscription, and the two winged victories. A year or two later the pediment was to be surmounted with a statue of Saint Justina, on whose day the great battle had been fought and won and from 1572 to the fall of the Republic that day was annually celebrated with a procession by the Dogen Signoria to the church of that same fortunate patron, outside which the captured Turkish standards were displayed to the populace. One at SS. Giovanni e Paolo a votive chapel was dedicated to the Madonna of the Rosary, its ceiling painted by Veronese. Finally, in the Doge's palace, the great victory was twice represented, on a heroic, if ultimately uninspired, canvas by Andrea Vicentino in the Hall of the Scrutinio and, in that of the Collegio. By Veronese's radiant painting of Sebastiano Venia and Augustino Barbarigo giving thanks, while Saint Mark and Saint Justina look on Dot and Solepanto is remembered as one of the decisive battles of the world, and the greatest naval engagement between Actium and Trafalgar. In England and America, admittedly, its continued fame rests largely on G. K. Chesterton's thunderous poem, but in the Catholic countries of the Mediterranean it has broken the barriers of history and past, like Ronce's vols, into legend. Does it, however, altogether deserve its reputation? Technically and tactically, yes, after 1571 sea battles were never the same again. Strategically, no. Lepanto did not, as its victors hoped, mark the end of the pendulum's swing, the point when Christian fortunes suddenly turned, 
gathering momentum until the Turks were swept back into the Asian heartland whence they had come. Venice did not regain Cyprus, only two years later, as we shall see, she was to conclude a separate peace with the Sultan relinquishing all her claims to the island. Nor did Lepanto mean the end of her losses, in the following century, Crete was to go the same way. As for Spain, she did not appreciably increase her control of the central Mediterranean, and only seventeen years afterwards the defeat of the Armada was to deal her sea power a blow from which it would not quickly recover. Nor was she able to break the links between Constantinople and the Moorish princes of North Africa, within three years, the Turks were to drive the Spaniards from Tunis, make vassals of the local rulers, and reduce the area, as they had already reduced most of Algeria to the west and Tripolitania to the east, to the status of an Ottoman province. But for all the Christians, and particularly the people of Venice, who rejoiced in those exultant October days, the real importance of Lepanto was neither strategic nor tactical, it was moral. The heavy black cloud which had overshadowed them for two centuries and which since 1453 had grown steadily more threatening, to the point where they felt that their days were numbered, that cloud had suddenly lifted. From one moment to the next, hope had been reborn. It was, perhaps, the Venetian historian Paolo Paruta who best summed up the popular feeling in the course of his funeral oration in St. Mark's on those who had been killed in the battle they have taught us by their example that the Turks are not insuperable, as we had previously believed them to be. Thus it can be said that as the beginning of this war was for us a time of sunset, leaving us in perpetual night, now the courage of these men, like a true, life-giving sun, has bestowed upon us the most beautiful and most joyful day that this city, in all her history, has ever seen. 38 The twilight of the century 1571 to 1595 to have been leagued with allies has wrought the greatest injury to the Republic, from which experience we may draw certain useful conclusions. In war, promptness and a ready capture of occasions is all important, and for naval war it is essential to put to sea at the beginning of April. It is injurious to act in concert with princes so powerful that we are obliged to consider their wishes. We should rely on our own forces rather than on those of our allies, since allies consult their own interests instead of those of the League as a whole. Nor should the commander-in-chief be a prince, but a man amenable to reward and punishment. Finally, he who has not good prospect of totally or in large measure destroying the enemy will be better advised to seek peace with him, but if war is inevitable, let him carry the war into the enemy camp rather than remain on the defensive. Giacomo Foscarini, Captain General, to the Senate, Autumn 1570 To promptness and a ready capture of occasions, for Venice in the aftermath of Lepanto, that could mean but one thing. Their glorious victory must be followed up at once. The Turk must be given no rest, no time to catch his breath, he must be pursued and brought to battle again before he had had a chance to repair his shattered forces and while the Allies still had their forward impetus. This was the message that the Venetians now propounded to their Spanish and Papal allies, but their arguments fell on deaf ears. Don John himself, one suspects, secretly agreed and would have been only too happy to press forward through the winter, but he had orders from Philip which could not be disobeyed. By the terms of the League, the Allied forces would meet again in spring, till then, he must bid them farewell. He and his fleet returned to Messina, where they arrived on the 1st of November. By the spring of 1572 it was plain to the Venetians that their instincts had been right. Spain was, as usual, prevaricating and procrastinating, raising one objection after another. The Pope did his utmost to spur them to action, but he was already a sick man and on the 1st of May he died. With his death the spirit went out of the League. At last, despairing of Spanish help, Venice decided to launch an expedition of her own, which Mark Antonio Colonna willingly joined with his squadron of papal galleys. Only then were the Spaniards goaded into action. They had no wish to be left out if there was indeed another victory to be won. Philip's objections fell away and in June Don John was finally given permission to join his allies. The fleet met at Corfu and sailed south in search of the enemy. 
They had learned with some dismay that in the eight months since Lepanto Selim had managed to build a new fleet of 150 galleys and eight galleases, these latter being an innovation for the Turks, who had obviously been impressed by the brilliant use Don John had made of them at Lepanto. Rumor had it, however, that the shipwrights, aware of the fate that awaited them if they failed to meet the Sultan's deadlines, had been obliged to use green timber, that the guns had been so hurriedly cast that many of them were useless, and that the crews, press ganged into service after the appalling losses of Lepanto, were scarcely trained. It was unlikely, in short, that they would give the Allies much trouble. The principal problem would be to bring them to battle. And so indeed it was. The fleets met off Modun, for 250 years one of Venice's principal trading posts in the Peloponnese, until it had fallen to the Sultan in 1500, and immediately the Turks ran for harbor. The Allies followed them, took up their positions just outside, at Navarino, the modern Pilos, and settled down to wait. Modun, they knew, could not maintain a fleet of such a size for long. The mountainous hinterland was barren and without roads, all supplies must come in by sea. It was only a question of time before the enemy would be forced to emerge, and a second Lepanto would follow. But once again Venice saw her hopes dashed, and once again the Spaniards were the cause. On the 6th of October Don John suddenly announced that he could no longer remain in Greek quarters and was returning to the west. Foscarini, dumbfounded, asked why and, when the prince unconvincingly replied that his provisions were running low, at once offered to supply him from his own stock and to order more from Venice as necessary. But Don John, clearly acting on new orders from Spain, could not be shaken. Colonna took his side. Foscarini had to admit to himself that his fleet was not big enough to challenge the Turks alone, fuming at the thought of the opportunity lost, he had no choice but to give the order to return. All that went to the Venetian ambassador in Madrid worked on King Philip. The Turks, he argued, were bent on world domination, they had been constantly extending their dominions for some five hundred years and were continuing to do so. The longer they were allowed to advance, the stronger and more irresistible they would become, it was the king's duty to Christendom, and to himself, if he wished to keep his throne, to take up arms against them and not to lay them down until the work that had been so gloriously begun at Lepanto were thoroughly finished. But Philip refused to listen. He hated and mistrusted Venice, he had done his duty as far as the Turks were concerned the previous year, and with considerable success. After such a debacle it would be some time before they raised their heads again. Meanwhile he was fully occupied with William the Silent's revolt in the Low Countries. He did not go whining to Venice to help him with his problems, he saw no reason why he should assist her any further with hers. But in those same winter months, Charles IX of France was also busy, intriguing against Philip on three separate fronts. In the Low Countries, he was giving all possible support to the rebellion, in the Mediterranean, he was maneuvering to gain control of Algiers, where his machinations may well have been responsible for Philip's recall of Don John from Navarino, in Venice and Constantinople, his ambassadors were working hard to bring about a peace between the Sultan and the Republic. By the spring they had succeeded. Venice had not wished for peace. Particularly since Lepanto. She had done everything in her power to hold the League together and persuade her fellow members to join her in an out-and-out -out offensive, stopping, with God's help, only at Constantinople itself. But she had failed. Philip was frankly not interested, the new Pope Gregory XIII scarcely more so. Deserted by her allies, knowing full well that to continue the war alone would be to invite new Turkish invasions of the Adriatic and, in all probability, the seizure of Crete and her last stronghold in the Levant, she had no choice but to accept the terms which were offered her. On the 3rd of March 1573 the treaty was signed. Venice undertook, in Turalia, to pay the Sultan 300,000 ducats over three years, and to renounce all her claims to Cyprus. In the dominions of the most Catholic king, there were cries of horror and disgust. In Messina, 
a furious Don John tore the league banner from his masthead and ran up that of Spain. How right Philip had been, said his subjects, not to trust those Venetians, they were bound to betray him sooner or later. It was as if the Battle of Lepanto had never been won. It was indeed. In spite of all the jubilation, the cheering and the shouting, and the building up of the great Lepanto legend that still persists today, the truth is that one of the most celebrated naval battles ever fought proved to be of no long term strategic importance whatever. But those who lamented the loudest had only themselves to blame. The Doge ship of Alvise Mo Kenega had begun with another double disaster the failure of the 1570 expedition and the loss of Cyprus. It had continued with the triumph of Lepanto, which had instantaneously lifted Venetian spirits from their nadir to a pitch of exaltation perhaps unparalleled in the Republic's history. The old doge was to preside over another burst of popular rejoicing and another catastrophe even greater than its predecessor, before his brief but eventful reign came to an end. The first of these occasions was the visit, in July 1574, of the 23-year-old King Henry III of France. The circumstances were, to say the least, unusual. It was only in February of that same year that, thanks to the machinations of his mother, Catherine de' Medici, Henry had been crowned King of Poland. In May, however, the unexpected death of his elder brother, Charles IX, had brought him an urgent summons to Paris, where the crown of France awaited him. Fearing the displeasure of his Polish subjects, to whose service he had dedicated his life only three months before, he had fled his unwanted kingdom in disguise and under cover of darkness, taking with him, in case of need diamonds from the Polish crown which were valued at 500,000 acres, and had not stopped until he reached imperial territory. Thence, after a short stay with the Emperor Maximilian in Vienna, he had come on to Venice. Since her separate peace with the Sultan and consequent estrangement from Spain and the Empire, Venice's relations with France had become of prime importance, and the Venetians, never reluctant to put on a show had decided to give Henry a reception that he would long remember. At Margara on the mainland the king was greeted by sixty senators in crimson velvet, thence he was conducted in a fleet of gilded gondolas to Murano, where a guard of honour of sixty halberdiers awaited him, in specially designed uniforms featuring the national colours of France, together with forty young scions of the leading Venetian families, who were to form his personal suite for the duration of his visit. His state entry to the city was planned for the next day, that same evening, however, he managed to slip out in a black cloak, unobserved, for a silent, secret journey through the canals. The following morning, Doge Mokenigo arrived in state at Murano and the two rulers were rowed together to the Lido, where they passed under a triumphal arch, designed for the occasion by Palladio and painted by Veronese and Tintoretto, and entered the Church of S. Niccolo for a solemn dumb dot one the service over, they stepped again into the state barge and proceeded across the Basino and up the Grand Canal to the Palazzo Foscari, which, with the adjoining Palazzo Justinian, had been hung with cloth of gold, crimson velvet and pale blue silk embroidered with fleur de lis in the young king's honor. Dot during the next week, for every moment of the day and most of the night, Henry was kept enthralled. All sumptuary laws were suspended, the Venetian nobility were encouraged to wear their most magnificent clothes, to deck themselves with their most precious jewels. There were banquets and parades, performances by actors, dancers and acrobats. He was made an honorary member of the Senate and attended one of its sessions. The glass blowers of Murano came and gave exhibitions of their craft under his window. He called on Titian then aged 97, and posed for Tintoretto. He even found time, in one of his few spare moments, to enjoy the favours of Venice's most sought-after courtesan, Veronica Franco, selected, we are told, after diligent perusal of an album of miniatures shown to him by the Signoria for the purpose. But the Venetians were determined, too, to prove to him that they lived for other things besides beauty and pleasure. Early one morning they took him along to the arsenal, to show him the keel of a ship being laid. 
that same evening at sunset, they took him back, there was the same ship being launched down the slipway ready for action, fully rigged, fully armed and fully provisioned. It was only towards the end of the visit that Doge Mokanigo, calling on the king ostensibly to make him a present of some rare book, began to speak of political matters. Lepanto, he said, had indeed been a glorious victory but it had resulted in a still further increase in the already overbearing power of Spain, and this must be, to all right-thinking nations of Europe, a matter for regret. He sincerely trusted that France, now deservedly restored to her former greatness, would do her utmost to restrain King Philip's ambitions. As to the religious question in France, the massacre of Saint Bartholomew had taken place only two years before, this was naturally no concern of Venice, he hoped, however, that his majesty would permit him to express the wish that France would return, under her new sovereign, to the ways of clemency and a reasonable degree of tolerance. Such a policy had served his own republic well, only thus, he ventured to suggest, could peace and stability be assured. Henry was non-committal, as the former head of the Catholic party in France. He could hardly be anything else. Shortly afterwards, after a farewell banquet of surpassing opulence, he left the city, the doge personally accompanying him as far as Fusina. But he never forgot Venice, the welcome he had received the, the uniquely Venetian combination of beauty and efficiency, of elegance and wisdom. As he bade his new friends farewell, giving them rich presents in gratitude for their hospitality, a huge diamond for the doge, a heavy gold chain for his host Luigi Foscari, they and their fellow citizens knew, beyond all doubt, that their money had been well spent. And yet, if King Henry could have revisited Venice towards the end of the following year, or in 1576 or 1577, he would have seen a very different city, a city in which the cheering and the shouting had died, giving place to a strange and sinister silence. The crowds were gone from the piazza around the Rialto and the Merceria the shops were closed and shuttered. The plague had struck. It was a visitation as dramatic and as terrifying as the Black Death over two centuries before, spreading to every corner of the city and every class of society. The two distinguished doctors from Padua called in by the official Proveditore di Sanita proved useless. Before long the old Lazaretto was filled to overflowing with the sick, the new one with suspects, some superannuated galleons were towed out to the middle of the lagoon and hastily converted into supplementary isolation hospitals, provisioned with food, medicines, fresh water, doctors and priests. As the population succumbed or fled, Venice began to take on the air of a deserted city. The inns and hostelries shut their doors, the law courts, too, ceased to function, while judges, lawyers and litigants alike sought refuge on the mainland. In the prisons, few were left alive. Only the doge, his signoria and the senate continued to perform their duties, though the number of active senators was declining at an alarming rate. In the autumn of 1576, in a desperate attempt to prevent any further dissemination of the pestilence, all the surviving inhabitants of the city were confined to their houses for a full week but the measure had no effect. At last, with the onset of winter, the incidence of disease began to show faint signs of slackening, but it was only the following summer, on Sunday, the 21st of July 1577, that the government dared to proclaim officially that the epidemic was over. It had accounted for some 51,000 Venetian lives, including that of Titian. The population of the city, which was assessed at 168,000 in 1563 and by 1,575 had probably risen to some 175,000, in 1581 stood at a mere 124,000. There was scarcely a Venetian who had not lost one or more of his close relations, many families, indeed, had been wiped out altogether. Even now it was feared that a formal proclamation was tempting fate and that any moment might bring news of a further outbreak. But Venice was not slow to give thanks for her deliverance, already, on the island of the Giudecca, a great new church was beginning to rise, commissioned by the state from its greatest living architect, 
Andrea Palladio, the Church of the Redeemer, the Redentor. There, every year until the end of the Republic, on that same third Sunday in July, Doge and Signoria would attend High Mass, even now, the occasion is still annually celebrated. One Alvise Mokenega himself never lived to see the church's completion. He died, of natural causes, on the 4th of June 1577, and was buried in SS. Giovanni e Paolo, where his tomb can be seen in the middle of the west wall between those of two early in Mokenego doges, Pietro and Giovanni. A week after his death, his successor was elected, the 81-year-old hero of Lepanto and most distinguished living Venetian, Sebastiano Vigna. Testi, unbending and acutely conscious of his distinguished record one of his first acts as doge was to decree that all nobles who had fought at Lepanto should wear red robes for a week, Vigna was to reign for only a year, but that year was to bring another catastrophe more tragic in its long-term effects than even the plague itself. Already in 1574, soon after the departure of Henry III, there had been a serious fire in the Doge's palace, destroying the rooms of the Collegio and the Senate and some of the private apartments. Now, on the 20th of December, there followed a second conflagration, far worse than before. The Sala del Magia Consiglio and the Sala dello Scrutinio were both completely gutted. Works by Garianto and Bellini, and other contemporary masters such as Titian, Tintoretto and Veronese all perished in the flames, and although the last two were able to supply new works for the rebuilt rooms, the loss was permanent and irremediable. So great was the damage, indeed, that several of the foremost architects of the time, among them Palladio himself, strongly urged that the whole building should be demolished and replaced by a new palace of more classical design, we can only be thankful that saner councils prevailed and that, in the space of only eight months, the greatest secular Gothic building in the world was carefully reconstructed, its old elevations lovingly restored. To when Doge Venia, who throughout the blaze had refused to leave the palace, died less than three months later, comma three the Great Council, meeting, according to the curious Venetian practice, to elect the electors, was forced to hold its session in the arsenal. Only when the 41 had been appointed could they repair to one of the undamaged rooms in the Doge's palace for their conclave. Their choice fell, on the 18th of March 1578, on a certain Niccolò di Ponti, who, at 87, was considerably older even than his predecessor. He could look back on a blameless career in the service of the Republic, having represented it not only at the Council of Trent but also in Rome, where he had had the unenviable task of justifying to the Pope Venice's separate peace treaty with the Sultan. Fortunately, the seven years of his dogeship presented no diplomatic problems of similar magnitude, and only one which, by reason of its curious human interest rather than for any real historical importance, is worth recording here. It concerns one of Venice's few romantic heroines whose name is still remembered, Bianca Capello. Bianca was the outstandingly beautiful daughter of an old Venetian family who, in 1563 at the age of 15, had eloped with a penniless Florentine bank clerk, Pietro Bonaventuri, her neighbor in the parish of S. Appenal. Her father, outraged, had preferred charges. The Council of Ten had ordered an official inquiry and the Avogadri di Comun had declared the young couple banditi, with a price on their heads. Safe in Florence, however, Bianca had quickly begun to regret her impulsiveness. Pietro's parents, with whom the two were forced to live, could not afford servants and she had no taste for the domestic chores, including the nursing of her mother-in-law, a chronic invalid, which now dominated her life. It was therefore not altogether surprising that, having fortuitously caught the eye of Francesco, the reprobate son of Grand Duke Cosimo de' Medici, she should have yielded to his blandishments and embarked on an affair which promised to be incomparably more enjoyable, and rewarding, than life with the Bonaventuri. Since her lover was already married, to the morosely pious Archduchess Joanna of Austria, Bianca soon became the center of a scandal even greater than that which she had caused in Venice. Meanwhile, ignoring his father's fury, 
Francesco appointed her husband a member of his household and even unsuccessfully tried, through the good offices of the Florentine resident in Venice and the papal nuncio, to arrange an amnesty for her and a reconciliation with her parents. Then, in 1574, Cosimo died, and so, at about the same time but in rather less exalted circumstances, being killed in a street brawl, probably with Francesco's knowledge but not on his direct orders, did Pietro Bonaventuri. Francesco was now Grand Duke of Tuscany. He immediately installed Bianca in a palace next to his own and for the next four years paraded her about Florence as his matris entita, to the deep humiliation of the melancholy Joanna, who sought refuge in ever longer and more frequent devotions. Yet the Grand Duchess cannot have been completely ignored. In the spring of 1578, she died in childbirth. Less than two months later, on the 5th of June, Francesco and Bianca were married, although, owing partly to the need to observe the customary period of mourning, another year was allowed to pass before the marriage was publicly proclaimed. Thus it was not until June 1579 that the Grand Duke sent a special ambassador to Doge di Aponte informing him of the event and adding a special request, that Venice should signify her pleasure and gratification at the match by declaring his wife a daughter of the Republic. This request was repeated in a second letter from Bianca herself, expressing her joy in the closer ties between Venice and Tuscany that the marriage would undoubtedly bring and her determination to do full justice to those two roles in which she took an equal pride, the loving consort of the Grand Duke and the loyal daughter of the Serenissima. To promote, at a single stroke, a declared outlaw to the highest title the Republic could confer on any woman might have been thought a lot to ask. Almost without hesitation, however, the Senate gave its approval simultaneously appointing Bianca's father and brother to the rank of Cavalier and to membership of the distinguished delegation, led by the Patriarch of Aquileia, which was to represent the Republic at the long-deferred public celebrations of the marriage in Florence the following October. In return, the young Grand Duchess was as good as her word, for the next eight years never forgetting her Venetian origins and letting no opportunity slip for furthering the interests of her native city. But she and her husband had enemies in Florence, none of them more dangerous than her brother in law Ferdinando de' Medici, a cardinal since the age of fourteen, who, in default of any male children of Francesco, found himself heir to the throne. Bianca's continued inability to present her husband with a son was a source of perpetual anxiety to her. Once already, in 1576, she had contrived a mock pregnancy and birth, claiming as her own a baby who had been secretly introduced into her apartments, but her husband had discovered the deception, now, ten years later, she tried the same trick but with no greater success. It was her last attempt, before the end of the following year both she and her husband were dead. The fact that Francesco and Bianca died suddenly in their prime within two days of each other, and that, despite the mutual mistrust between the brothers, Cardinal Ferdinando was actually paying them a visit at the time, inevitably led to the usual speculations and suspicions. There were dark whispers of a poison tart, which some believed to have been prepared by Ferdinando but others maintained had been a concoction of Bianca herself for her brother-in-law. According to this latter theory, the suspicious cardinal had deliberately tried it out on Francesco, whereat the horror-stricken Bianca, seeing her husband in his death agony, had seized a slice of her own and swallowed it in a gesture of suicidal despair. One would dearly like to believe in so Shakespearean a denouement, it must, however, be admitted that at the post-mortem which Ferdinando immediately ordered to be performed, in the presence of members of Bianca's family as well as all the court doctors, no trace of poison was discovered. The cause of both deaths is now believed almost certainly to have been malaria. Although the new Grand Duke was quick to inform the Venetians of the most tragic double loss that he had sustained, he refused to allow his sister-in-law to be buried with her husband. Instead, her body was wrapped in a shroud and flung into the common ditch. He also decreed that her family crest should be obliterated wherever it appeared and replaced by that of Francesco's first wife Joanna. All mourning was forbidden, as, 
in deference to Ferdinando's feelings, it also was in Venice. In Florence, such a petty minded act of vengeance, however much it might be deplored, would at least be understood, in her own city it was unforgivable. Bianca had deserved better than that. But her fellow Venetians never forgot her, and it is pleasant to record that the house where she was born and spent her childhood, next to the Ponte Storto in the parish of S. Apanel, one of the prettiest corners of Venice, still bears a plaque to her memory. When Bianca Capello died in October 1587, Doge Niccolò di Ponte had already been two years in his grave. We should not leave him to his rest, however, without mentioning another incident in his reign which, though relatively minor in itself, was symptomatic of a significant and sinister feature of Venetian political life at this period, the increasing power, and increasing unpopularity, of the Council of Ten. The Council of Ten, as the reader may remember, had originally been established as a temporary committee of public safety to deal with the aftermath of the unsuccessful conspiracy of Bajomanti Taipolo in July 13. 10.1 Its intended lifespan had been two and a half months, at the time of which we are speaking it had been in existence for as many centuries, during which time it had become an important component of the Venetian governmental machine. Important, and yet somehow not quite integral, from the beginning it had refused to fit tidily into the pattern of the constitution. This pattern took the usual form of a pyramid, the doge at its apex, then the signoria, then downward through the collegio and the senate to the great council. The ten, however, had always remained a part, an illogical, anomalous body with extraordinary powers which, in an emergency, it could use to cut red tape, to bypass the slow-moving deliberations of the senate to take its own decisions and put them immediately into effect. Normal business, political or military, financial or diplomatic, passed through normal channels and was subject to normal reservations and delays, urgent matters, or those demanding extreme secrecy or delicacy of handling, could be passed by the Collegio direct to the Ten, which was authorized to act on its own initiative, to make payments out of clandestine funds, and even to give covert instructions to Venetian diplomats proceeding abroad. Its field of competence covered all things concerning the security of the state and the preservation of morals dash limits so nebulous as to be practically without meaning. In such circumstances, it might at first sight be thought surprising that, for most of the time at least, the ten wielded its immense power so wisely and so well particularly since it seldom needed to account for its actions to any higher authority. In practice, however, abuses were largely avoided by its own built-in checks and balances. Election was for a single year, with no eligibility for re-election till another year had passed. Two members of the same family could never sit at the same time. Leadership of the council was never vested in one person, but in a triumvirate, the Carpi which changed every month and whose members, during their period of office, were forbidden all social intercourse with the outside world, lest they be exposed to rumors or bribes. Venality or corruption was punishable by death. Finally, a vital point which is all too often forgotten, the council, as well as its ten elected members, also included the Dogen Signoria, bringing its effective strength to 17. But, as time went on, it gradually became clear that even 17 was not always enough. We have already seen one how, when really important decisions had to be taken, the Ten would ask the Great Council to elect as onto, a supplementary body of senators who would join it for the specific issue under discussion. These Zonti strengthened its hand considerably, diminishing the likelihood of opposition in other councils, but as the Ten grew stronger, arrogating more and more state business to itself, so the other, constitutionally more orthodox bodies tended to dwindle in importance, and, inevitably, to resent it. The first signs of this resentment had appeared as early as 1457, when the Ten was accused, rightly, of having overstepped its authority in ordering the deposition of Doge Francesco Foscari. Eleven years later, its authority was explicitly limited to most delicate matters only, this definition, however, still left plenty of scope for argument, 
and its activities were not appreciably curtailed. Rather, indeed, the reverse. Venice's troubled history during the last years of the 15th century and the first quarter of the 16th had led to more and more frequent requests for Zonti, until in 1529 what had started as an occasional and exceptional measure became an established institution, and a permanent Zonta was proclaimed, to consist of 15 of the leading functionaries of state. Eight years later there followed a new and still more unconstitutional departure, the enlarged ten began to appoint subcommittees, directly responsible to itself only. The first of them had been a body known as the Escutory Contra la Bestemia, which concerned itself specifically with the suppression of vice, in which it was no more successful than any other organization of its kind has ever been, but this had been followed in 1539 by the introduction of three Inquisitori di Stato a development which, in the minds of many thoughtful Venetians, awoke serious misgivings. Its declared aim, to tighten state security, was understandable enough. The kings of France and Spain both maintained a veritable army of agents throughout the Republic, to whom the sale of secrets had become a regular and profitable occupation. Venice relied on diplomacy for her very survival, plainly, therefore, so dangerous a traffic must be stopped. But when it was learned that the three, though technically responsible to the ten, had been specifically invested with the same authority that the ten itself possessed and, in particular, had the right to try and condemn without prior reference to their parent body, men began to ask whether the cure might not be worse than the disease. It was a pertinent enough question, but it remained unanswered and the Council of Ten continued effectively to govern Venice apparently heedless of its by now almost universal unpopularity. Then, in 1582, two incidents occurred which, if they did not break its power, certainly shook its confidence. The first concerned a certain Andrea di Alazza, a procurator of Saint Mark, whom the ten particularly wished to be included in the fifteen man's onta, but whom the great council obstinately refused to elect. Furious at this reverse, the ten counted by increasing by one the number of procurators who sat with it by right and co-opting D.A. Lazzo ex officio, but this step too was vetoed by the great council. The second incident concerned a brawl on the Lido, when a party of young nobles insulted a local girl and were promptly set on by the local bravi. The bravi, emerging victorious from the fray, promptly lodged a complaint with the ten, who listened sympathetically so sympathetically indeed that when on the following day the young nobles, after a day in which to recover, lodged a complaint in their turn, they were given short shrift. They thereupon appealed to the Quarantia, who upheld their cause, reversing the Ten's decision. At the next elections to the Zonta, the Great Council showed its disapproval of the attitude of the Ten by refusing to approve more than twelve candidates in place of the usual fifteen, and in December it made a determined effort to define, once and for all, the precise nature of the cos segretis I am referred to in the law of 1468. It was no use, the more the matter was argued, the more impossible it became to resolve. On the 1st of January 1583 the three unapproved members came up again for election, but with no greater success and the whole principle of the Zonta was abandoned by tacit consent. This had the effect of diminishing the powers of the Ten to some degree, but it could not obviously resolve the fundamental problem, the Ten was an anomalous body, it had always been so, and therein lay its strength. No amount of trimming would ever allow it to fit comfortably into a constitution which had no room for it. Reduced to its normal size, it drew in its horns and, for the time being, confined its activities to those limits within which its authority was beyond question. It continued to be feared, but much of the respect it had formerly enjoyed had been lost, and was never entirely to be regained. It is doubtful whether old Niccolò di Ponti, now well over ninety, was able to exert much influence during this trial of strength between the Magia Consiglio and the Council of Ten. He was failing fast. Owing to his embarrassing tendency to doze off during discussions in the Collegio, it had already proved necessary to build a sort of shelf across the front of his throne to prevent him from sliding to the ground. 
On the 15th of April 1585 he suffered a stroke which robbed him of his speech. He continued as best he could, but soon afterwards he fell asleep again during a state reception in the hall of the Senate, this time his ducal cap, the corno, is said to have fallen off and rolled across the floor, stopping at the feet of one of the procurators, Pasquale Sicogna, and it may well have been in deference to so blatant a manifestation of the divine will that, when Dea Ponti mercifully breathed his last on the 30th of July, Sicogna was elected as his successor. One, it was not the first time, either, that the new doge had been miraculously singled out, some years before, in Corfu while he was attending Mass, a sudden puff of wind had blown the sacrament out of the hands of the officiating priest and straight into his own. Thus Pasquale Sicogna already had about him, if not actually an odor of sanctity, at least an aura of being one of God's elect. His elevation to the supreme power had not, however, taken place without a struggle. It was only on the 19th day of the deliberations, and after the 53rd ballot, that he acquired the necessary majority, and even then his success was due only to the sudden decision of his rival, Vincenzo Rossini, to stand down. When the result was proclaimed, the populace, who had already staged noisy demonstrations in support of Morissini outside the Doge's palace, were furious. Their favorite was immensely rich and renowned for his generosity. Both qualities, they knew, would have been fully demonstrated during his inaugural procession round the piazza, when the Doge traditionally scattered coins to his scrambling subjects. Sicogna, on the other hand, was notoriously mean a fact which he proved by scattering not the usual golden ducats but small silver coins of five soldi, and, we are told, not very many of those. For years afterwards, they were contemptuously referred to as Sicogninae. In spite of this somewhat shaky start, however, Pasquale Sicogna had a quiet and peaceful reign, during which he gradually built up a considerable measure of popularity. The unspeakable use coaxed admittedly, continued to give trouble as they always did, but such other major problems as he encountered were all diplomatic and were tackled with quite remarkable success. The most important were those arising from the assassination, on the 1st of August 1589 by a fanatical Dominican friar, of King Henry III of France. Henry, who had long since forsaken his wife's bed for the company of his somewhat spicier mignons, had not surprisingly failed to produce any offspring, and with him the Valois line became extinct. The legitimate heir to the throne was the Protestant Henry of Bourbon, King of Navarre, but, although Henry had proclaimed himself ready to adopt the Roman faith, he was nevertheless violently opposed by the French Catholic party, the hugely powerful House of Guise, Philip of Spain and Pope Sixtus V. Venice, on the other hand, welcomed his succession. Always tolerant in matters of religion, she was also fully aware that, among the leading powers of Europe, France was her only buttress against the ambitions of Spain. All she wanted was that the country should be strong, united and well disposed to herself. The moment that the report of the assassination reached the city, instructions were sent to the Venetian ambassador in France, Giovanni Mocenigo, to seek an immediate audience with the new king to offer him her congratulations, and to assure him of her continued friendship and goodwill. She was rewarded by a fulsome reply, brought to Venice by a special ambassador, Frangos de Luxembourg, thanking her for these friendly sentiments, which, Henry cheerfully admitted, he appreciated all the more for the fact that Venice was the only state in Italy to have granted him recognition. Such an initiative could not fail to arouse the wrath of the Pope who was not slow to react. If, he thundered, Venice wished to preserve her good name as a loyal daughter of the church, she would do well to abstain from dealings with heretics. Did she consider herself the greatest nation in the world, that she should be so eager to set an example to all others? The Republic's answer was respectful, but firm, Henry of Navarre was the legitimate successor to the throne of France. He was a prudent and virtuous prince, besides being, incidentally, an extremely, strong one, who showed every sign of willingness to adopt the true faith, he had already decreed that the Catholic Church in France, 
and all its members, should remain free, respected and undisturbed. Moreover, no one else was capable of holding the country together after the agonies it had suffered. At this point the argument took on a new edge, must France continue to suffer subversion and ruination at the hands of foreign intriguers? Did the Pope genuinely believe that the foreign armies whom she had been obliged to admit on her soil were prompted by a selfless devotion to the faith, rather than personal ambition and a lust for power? It was a strong case, persistently and convincingly argued by the Venetian ambassador in Rome, Alberto Badua, and it had its effect. The Pope expressed his agreement that de Luxembourg should remain in Venice, provided that he did not appear at state ceremonies, and, more important, agreed to receive a representative from Henry at the Vatican to begin discussions on the king's conversion. Now it was Philip's turn to fume, to remonstrate, even to threaten, but his Spanish troops and the forces of French Catholicism were slowly retreating before Henry's armies. On 25 July 1593 the triumphant king embraced the Catholic faith, remarking as he did so that Paris was well worth a mass. In March 1594 he entered his capital, and 18 months later Pope Clement VIII gave him absolution and formally welcomed him into the Christian fold. Venice, clearly, could take no credit for Henry's military success in winning his rightful crown. In the diplomatic field, however, by her open and courageous example as well as by her advocacy with five successive popes, one she did much to enable him to consolidate his hold on it, breaking down the Catholic opposition and gradually winning for him the political and religious respectability that he needed. This consolidation, and Henry's recognition by the Pope, finally broke the spirit of Philip II. He continued his struggle a little longer with ever diminishing success but in May 1598 he was forced to come to terms. In September he was dead. So, indeed, was Pasquale Sicogna. He had succumbed to a short but virulent fever in April 1595. He was buried in the church of S. Maria Santa Semicolon II but his best memorial is to be found in one of the most familiar of all Venetian monuments, the Rialto Bridge. This was still the only bridge over the Grand Canal. There had been a crossing at that point, on pontoons, since the 12th century, but it was only in 1264 that the first true bridge had been constructed, on wooden piles. This was twice destroyed, the first time deliberately, by Bajomanti Tai Epolo after his unsuccessful rising in 1310, the second time inadvertently, by the weight of the populace crowding onto it to watch the passage of the Marquis of Forara in 1444. After this latter disaster it was rebuilt yet again, still in wood but on a much grander scale, with shops and a central drawbridge, as, indeed, it was painted by Carpaccio in one of the miracles of the relic of the True Cross, now in the Academia. By the middle of the 16th century the structure was obviously nearing the end of its natural life, and the decision was taken to rebuild it in stone. A competition was declared, perhaps, by the quality of those who entered it. The most distinguished architectural competition ever held, with Michelangelo, Sansovino, Vignola, Scarmuzzi and Palladio, whose plans for a five-arched bridge with pedimented colonnade still exist, all submitting designs. Faced with such an embarrass de riches, the authorities were for a long time unable to make up their minds, and they were still hesitating when the two successive fires in the Doge's palace and the consequent demand for all the best available skilled workmen caused yet further delays. When at last they were able to turn their attention back to the Rialto, the contract was given not to any of the competing giants, but to the somewhat humbler architect who had been in charge of the palace rebuilding, the aptly named Antonio di Ponti. It was he and his nephew, Antonio Contin, architect of Venice's other best loved bridge, the Bridge of Sighs, who together designed and built, between 1588 and 1591, the Rialto Bridge as we know it today, suitably inscribed with a memorial inscription to Doge Pasquale Sicogna. As a work of art, we must frankly admit, the bridge lacks distinction. Most people by now are vaguely fond of it, as they would be of any other well-known landmark, and the wood, rightly, 
be a general outcry if any alteration were suggested. Somehow, therefore, it gets by. Its very familiarity blinds us to its faults, the poor proportions, the curious air of tofheviness, the coarseness of the detail. So much the better. Only very occasionally do we suddenly, unexpectedly and momentarily see it for the mediocrity it is, but it is difficult, at such times, not to feel a quick stab of regret for the masterpiece that Venice might have had, if genius had been allowed its way. 39 The last interdict 1595 to 1607 We cannot understand how it is possible to pretend that a free principality like our republic, born such, and as such by the grace of God preserved for 1200 years, should not be permitted to take such steps as it may deem necessary for the preservation of the state when these in no way prejudice the government of other princes. The Venetian Senate to their ambassador in Rome, the 26th of November 1605 Some 200 yards down from the Rialto Bridge on the eastern side of the Grand Canal, utterly dwarfing its neighbours on each side, rises the immense bulk of the Palazzo Grimani. Begun by Michel Saint Michel in 1556, it is not by any means the most beautiful of Venetian palaces, but in its size and scale, and in the sheer magnificence of its high Renaissance facade, it is undeniably one of the most impressive. It was from this tremendous pile that its owner, Marina Grimani, Venice's 87th Doge, comma one whose reign was to usher in the 17th century, was rowed in state. On the 26th of April 1595, to his enthronement. As was obvious from the style in which he lived, Marina Grimani was one of the richest men in Venice. Rich men, so long as they were generous as well, always made popular doges, and though Grimani's election was quite phenomenally protracted, needing 71 ballots over a period of three and a half weeks, it was accordingly greeted with much jubilation by the people nor were they disappointed, in striking contrast to his predecessor, the new doge on his ceremonial tour of the piazza positively deluged them in gold pieces, his wife and sons simultaneously flinging down copious handfuls from the windows of the palace. The usual flowery orations followed, one of which, it is recorded, was delivered by a certain Dioniso Lazari, aged six. Free bread and wine were distributed to all the poor of the city in apparently limitless profusion. The celebrations continued far into the night, and no wonder. Dot yet even all this extravagance was as nothing to what Grimani spent two years later, the interval seems to have been due only to the time necessary for adequate preparations to be made, on the coronation of his wife. Such an honour was rare in Venice, it had been accorded only twice before, to the consorts of Pasquale Milipiero in 1457 and of Lorenzo Priuli in 1556. Neither of these ceremonies, however, could approach in splendor that which took place on the 4th of May 1597. First the Dogeressa, in cloth of gold and attended by upwards of 200 ladies in superb dresses specially designed for the occasion, was formally inducted into the Basilica for a joyful TV dumb after which she mounted to the balcony of the palace to witness a grand procession of all the nineteen guilds of the city. There followed a prodigious banquet in the Sala del Magia Consiglio. For three days the festivities continued, more banquets, more processions, dancing by torchlight in the piazza and on rafts in the Grand Canal, the latter somewhat spoiled by bad weather, and even a naval review, with the participation of ships from England. Holland and Flanders, ending with a regatta. There was much giving of costly presents, the Dogeressa distributing special Ozel one bearing her likeness, and receiving, in Terralia, a golden rose from Pope Clement VIII. Before long, however, the Pope was to appear in a somewhat different light, causing Doge Grimani and his subjects a good deal of anxiety. The crisis had begun with the death of Alfonso Duke of Ferrara a short while before. Having no sons of his own, the Duke had named as his heir his cousin, Don Cesarevist, but the Pope refused to recognize the legality of this succession, on the grounds that Don Cesare's heir, though subsequently legitimatized, had been born out of wedlock, and maintained that the duchy should now revert to the church. 
this claim was, not surprisingly, contested with some vigor by the new duke, whereupon Clement dispatched an army under the command of one of his more bellicose cardinals to take Ferrara by force, simultaneously calling on Venice for help. Here, now, was a problem. The dukes of Ferrara were not strong enough to cause Venice any serious trouble, but a powerful pope on her very doorstep, controlling the all-important delta of the Po, that was another matter. On the other hand, if she followed her instincts, preserved her present neutrality and refused Clement the military aid he wanted, he might well turn his arms against her, Spain, always watchful for an opportunity to do her down, would then come in on the papal side, and the ensuing war might have still more dangerous consequences. She decided to prevaricate, pointing out to the Pope's envoy that the prime necessity was always peace in Italy, and that problems of the kind that had now arisen should always be settled by negotiation rather than force. If mediation were required, she would be happy to offer her services. The situation quickly resolved itself. In January 1598, before Venice was obliged to come to a definite decision on intervention, Dance's heir, his morale shattered by the news that the Pope had excommunicated him, surrendered to the papal forces, agreeing to cede Ferrara and all the territory of the duchy in return for his readmission to a state of grace and one or two other minor concessions which cost Clement virtually nothing. Overjoyed at his success, the Pope came in person to take possession of his new dominion and made a triumphal entry into Ferrara, with a Venice, forced to make the best of what she was unable to prevent, sent four ambassadors to offer him her congratulations. Unfortunately, her difficulties with the Pope were not over, indeed, they had scarcely begun. First, Clement made new attempts to diminish the Republic's authority over the local clergy. Then he protested against Venice's employment of one Marco Sera, an excommunicate, in her continuing struggle against the Euskox, next came an argument over frontiers and navigation on the Po, next, indignation when Venice proposed to tax the clergy of Brescia, together with their fellow citizens, for the restoration of the Rand parts, and in 1600 there followed another, more serious quarrel, once again over the question of jurisdiction. This time it related to the little town of Senator Comma one which, although Venetian for the past two hundred years, had been effectively ruled by its local bishop since the early Middle Ages, a fact which encouraged the Pope to send the bishop a monetary letter denying the authority of Venice and demanding that all appeals should in future be addressed to Rome, on pain of excommunication. In the dispute that followed, Venice, believing that an important point of principle was involved, refused to budge an inch. Clement realized that he had overreached himself and partially backed down, but the affair rumbled on, heralding, could the Venetians but know it. The far more furious storm that lay ahead. As the new century opened, it was plain that Venice's instinctive tendency towards religious toleration was becoming more and more unacceptable to Rome. This worsening state of affairs was the fault of Rome, and not of Venice. With the spread of the Reformation across Europe and, in particular, the promulgation in 1598 of the Edict of Nantes, in which Henry IV had confirmed the Pope's worst suspicions by granting to French Protestants freedom of worship and, equal political rights with Catholics, the Roman reign was being steadily tightened and increasing pressure brought to bear on Catholic governments to submit to papal control. This Venice refused to do. In taking her stand she believed herself guilty of no religious insubordination, as her doge was soon to expostulate when charged with Calvinism, what is a Calvinist? We are Christians, as good as the Pope himself, and Christians we shall die, whether others like it or not. One the difficulty was that what the Pope saw as a religious problem the Republic saw as a purely political one. Her duty of doctrinal obedience she did not question. Her political independence, on the other hand, was sacrosanct to her, and could not be set at risk. Besides, as a cosmopolitan city whose very existence was founded on international commerce, how could she discriminate against heretics, any more than in the past she had discriminated against infidels? Though Clement VIII never relaxed his efforts, Venice did score a few victories. 
the question of Senada was won, there had been another in 1596, when a special concordat actually granted to Venetian booksellers and printers the right, under certain conditions, to handle works figuring on the Index Expurgatorius. In the event they very seldom did so, but the principle was at least admitted, the Republic defied papal protests in allowing Protestant merchants and craftsmen from the Swiss canton of the Grissons to settle in her territory. She also staunchly defended the religious freedom of foreign diplomats. When reproached in 1604 for allowing Sir Henry Wotton to import Protestant prayer books and to hold Anglican services in his private chapel, she sent Rome a firm reply, the Republic can in no wise search the baggage of the English ambassador Comitou of whom it is known that he is living a quiet and blameless life, causing no scandal whatever. The Pope did not insist, and Sir Henry continued to perform his devotions undisturbed throughout the fourteen years of his Venetian embassy. Three, but in March 1605 Pope Clement died, and was succeeded, after the reign of Leo XI which lasted only 26 days and is memorable for no other reason, by Paul V. Camillo Borghese, despite a distinguished ecclesiastical career, seems to have been genuinely astonished by his election, which he could only interpret as a sign that he had been divinely appointed to stamp out heresy and to impose the supremacy of the Church, down to the very letter of the canon law. Papal legates sought even more frequent audience with the Doge, to remonstrate and protest. Why had the Senate recently prohibited the erection of any more religious buildings in the city without special license? Why had it even more recently forbidden the alienation of secular real property to the Church, thereby depriving the latter of profitable bequests from pious Venetian testators? Venice protested in vain that it was becoming impossible to maintain even the existing churches and monasteries, which already occupied half the area of the city, or that since Pope Clement had decreed that no church property might be sold to laymen, some reciprocal law was necessary to prevent more and more land passing out of the hands of the Republic. Such arguments were simply not accepted, and the papal communications began to acquire a new edge, of menace. The two parties were thus, from the very beginning of Paul's reign, set on a collision course from which the one would not, the other could not be deflected. Venice did her best to maintain friendly relations, even going so far as to enroll the Borghese family among the ranks of the nobility, a gesture which delighted the Pope, who sent a fulsome and flattering letter of appreciation, but the polite veil could not be maintained for long, and it so chanced that even before Paul had been a year on his throne there had occurred three events any one of which might have precipitated the coming crisis. The first of these was the death of the Venetian patriarch. Matto Zane, and the appointment by the Senate of Francesco Vendramin as his successor. On such occasions it had long been Venetian practice, as a matter of courtesy, to request Vatican approval. At the time of Zane's appointment, however, Clement VIII had replied that such approval could no longer be considered automatic, and had insisted that the new patriarch should personally present himself in Rome to be examined. Venice had at first refused and then agreed that Zane might make the journey on condition that it was not for examination, but merely that the Pope might honour him with a special audience. Now, with the appointment of Vendramin, Paul replied as his predecessor had done, in terms still more abrupt. Again Venice was ready to compromise as she had before, but this time the Pope was adamant. The matter was still unsettled when the next storm broke. Or, more accurately, two storms, but storms so similar, and occurring in such swift succession, that they can virtually be considered as one. They centered on two professed clerics, Scipio Saraceni, who was subsequently found never to have taken holy orders, and Mark Antonio Brandolin, who, in August and September respectively, were denounced to the Council of Ten, the first for persistent attempts on the honor of his niece, which, when they proved unsuccessful, he followed up with publicly slandering her, abusing her and plastering her front door with filth, the second, in the words of the noble uncle who laid the charges, for murders, frauds, rapes and every kind of violence against his dependents. 
In each case the ten ordered an immediate inquiry and, when both of these seemed to confirm the justice of the charges, arrogated to itself the responsibility for the trial and punishment of the two offenders. Instantly the Pope forgot his Venetian ennoblement and reverted to the attack. These two prisoners, as members of the clergy, were outside the jurisdiction of the Republic, which had no right to hold them in distraint. They must be handed over at once to the ecclesiastical authorities, who would then take whatever action they deemed appropriate. All through the autumn of 1605, the argument went on, in an atmosphere that grew steadily more tense as the year drew to its end. Then, in mid December, with relations rapidly reaching breaking point, Venice appointed as her spokesman in Rome one Leonardo Donia, an experienced diplomat who had represented his country in Spain and Constantinople and was a veteran of many former missions to the papal court. It was too late. Donia was still on his way through the Apennines when the Pope ordered the dispatch of two briefs to Venice. One dealt with the question of church property, the other with the cases of Saraceni and Branda Lynn. If Venice did not forthwith annul her decrees in the first instance and surrender her two prisoners in the second, the ban of the church would be laid upon her. The missive was presented on Christmas morning, and was consequently not opened at once. It was still unread when, that same evening, the old doge died semicolon one and so it remained until his successor could be elected. That successor was Leonardo Donia himself. Hastily recalled from his mission, it was he who finally broke the seals of the papal ultimatum. This grim communication had now been in Venice for the best part of a month, and the attitude of the papal nuncio in the interim had left no one in doubt of the general tenor of its contents. Apart, therefore, from the discovery that a careless secretary in the Curia had omitted to send the second of the two briefs, inadvertently enclosing in its place an additional copy of the first, the new doge can have felt little surprise. The inevitable crisis had come. That being so, since capitulation was out of the question, the Republic must prepare to resist. But with what weapons? The time for diplomacy was past, the battle must now be carried into the enemy camp. Paul V., as was well known, fancied himself as a legist, what Venice now required, to present, argue and defend her case before the world was an expert on canon law who was also a theologian, a dialectician and a political philosopher, a man deeply versed in ecclesiastical history and a polemicist who could argue with clarity and pitiless logic, turning all the Pope's own arguments back against himself. The Senate did not hesitate. It sent for Paolo Sarpi. It is a misfortune, both for the historian of Venice and for his readers, that the tale he has to tell should be so lacking in great personalities doges apart, and even those appear a fairly dim lot when viewed in their mass, if only because they had little opportunity to express themselves once they had reached the supreme office, few indeed are the figures who stand out as creatures of flesh and blood, worthy of our reverence, hatred or even contempt, and who were nonetheless permitted to influence the turn of events. Paolo Sapi was such a man, but, However grateful we may feel to him for giving a little human warmth to these pages, our debt is as nothing compared to that of Venice, whose course he guided through the last and gravest religious crisis in her history. At the time of his summons, Sapi was 53, and had been a Skvite friar since the age of 14. After a period in his youth as court theologian to the Duke of Mantua, he had returned to Venice in 1575 and four years later was appointed provincial of his order. Already he was renowned for his learning, which extended far beyond the field of the spirit, indeed, the whole cast of his mind seems to have been scientific rather than philosophical. As an anatomist, he has been credited with the discovery of the circulation of the blood, a quarter of a century or more before Harvey, he certainly discovered the valves in the veins. As an optician, he earned the gratitude of Galileo himself, who was teaching in the University of Padua between 1592 and 1610 and who acknowledges the help of Mio Padre e Maestro Sapi in the construction of his telescope. One possibly because of the austerity of his eating habits, he suffered terribly from the cold, Sir Henry Watton, who knew him well, has left an unforgettable picture of him in his cell, 
fenced with a castle of paper about his chair and over his head when he was either reading or writing alone, for he was of our Lord of St. Alban's opinion that all air is predatory, and especially hurtful when the spirits are most employed. Though he was one of the humblest things that could be seen within the bounds of humanity, Sir Henry's admiration for him was boundless excellent in positive, excellent in scholastical and polemical divinity, a rare mathematician even in the most abstruse parts thereof, and yet withal so expert in the history of plants as if he had never perused any book but nature. Lastly a great canonist, which was the title of his ordinary service with the state, and certainly in the time of the Pope's interdict they had their principal light from him. It was Sapi, now appointed official counsellor to the Senate, who drafted the Republic's reply to the Pope's first brief, that which related to church property. The tone was respectful but utterly unyielding, the style concise and unadorned, with every word pulling its weight. Princes, it ran, by divine law which no human power can abrogate, have authority to legislate on matters temporal within their jurisdictions, there is no occasion for the admonitions of your holiness, for the matters under discussion are not spiritual but temporal. The second papal brief, concerning the two miscreant clerics, arrived at the end of February, to this two Sapi produced a similarly reasoned and measured reply. But the Pope had no patience with arguments which, as he put it, reeked of heresy. On the 16th of April he announced at a consistory that unless Venice made full submission within 24 days, the sentence of excommunication and interdict would come into force, on the 17th, a monitory to this effect was published to the world. Venice, however, did not bother to wait until her time expired. On the 6th of May Leonardo Donia set his seal on an edict addressed to all patriarchs, archbishops, bishops, vicars, abbots and priors throughout the territory of the Republic. He, Doge of Venice, who in temporal affairs recognized no superior power except the Divine Majesty itself and whose duty it was to ensure the peace and tranquility of the state, made solemn protest before Almighty God and all the world that he had striven by every means possible to bring His Holiness the Pope to an understanding of the Republic's most legitimate rights. Since, however, his Holiness had closed his ears and had instead issued a public monetary against all reason and against the teachings of the Holy Scriptures, the Fathers of the Church and the Sacred Canons, with prejudice to the secular authority conferred by God and to the liberty of the state, and to the detriment of that undisturbed possession of their life and goods enjoyed, with God's blessing, by his loyal subjects, that monetary was formally declared to be worthless. The clergy were therefore adjured to continue as before with the cure of the souls of the faithful and the celebration of the Mass, since it was the Republic's most firm intention to continue in the Holy Catholic and Apostolic faith and the observance of the Holy Roman Church. The protest ended with the prayer that God would lead the Pope to the knowledge of the vanity of his action, the wrong he had done to the Republic and the justice of the Venetian cause. Next. The Doge on Sapi's advice banished all Jesuits, whose Spanish orientation had led them to take a strongly populist line from the outset, Thetines and Capuchins from the territory of the Republic and dismissed the Papal Nuncio with the words Monsignor. You must know that we are, every one of us, resolute and ardent to the last degree, not merely the government but the whole nobility and people of our state. We ignore your excommunication, it is nothing to us. Think now where this resolution would lead, if our example were to be followed by others. This was no empty bravado. In their unshakable conviction that they were in the right, the Venetians were not unduly overawed. Nor were most of their clergy. The story is told of one parish priest who had declined to save Vespers awaking in the morning to find a gibbet erected outside his church, he took the hint. Another, better documented case is that of the Capitular Vicar in Padua who, on being ordered to surrender certain letters from Rome, replied that he would act as the Holy Spirit moved him. The Venetian governor replied that the Council of Ten had already been moved by the Holy Spirit to hang all who disobeyed, and the letters were duly handed over. This was not, after all, the first interdict that the Republic had suffered, there had been one in 1284 one in 1309 and yet another in 1483. 
What distinguished the present issue from the rest was that Venice was specifically restricting her defiance to the temporal sphere. In the spiritual, she wished only to remain a loyal daughter of the Church. If the Pope insisted on expelling her from the fold, it would not be her fault, the loss, moreover, would be his. Here was something new, the old problem of what things are Caesar's and what are God's, now presented in a new form to the eyes of post-Reformation Europe. Thus, whereas the three previous interdicts had aroused little enough interest in the outside world, the present controversy was taken up in all the states of the Christian West. In books and pamphlets, from pulpits and public squares, Venice was enthusiastically defended or venomously reviled. As the dispute grew in strength and ferocity, Paolo Sapi remained at the center of the stage, writing countless letters and polemics, preaching, disputing, debating, striving ever more clearly to define the boundary between the celestial paths of the church and the terrestrial paths of temporal princes. To some he was an archangel, to others, antichrist. In Venice, people prostrated themselves to kiss his feet, in Rome and Madrid, his writings were publicly burned. Inevitably, he was cited before the Inquisition, predictably, he refused to appear. Meanwhile he achieved a fame, or notoriety, far beyond anything that his scientific, historical or earlier theological works had ever earned him, or that he himself had ever desired or dreamed. It soon became obvious that so vital an issue could not remain on the theoretical plane. Nations, as well as polemicists, were taking sides. Spain, naturally, was hostile, England and Holland offered their active support. In France, Henry IV was already treading a dangerous tightrope, he could not declare himself as openly as he would have wished. Nevertheless he left Venice in no doubt where his sympathies lay, and offered his services as a mediator. But Venice, by now, was in no particular mood to make concessions. Thanks to Sarpi's brilliant advocacy, her stand had been endorsed far more widely than she had expected. Her religious life was continuing as it always had, her churches were if anything fuller than before. Her cause was just, her conscience clear. As the weeks and months went by, she began to feel a growing pride and exhilaration, this was a great moral battle, and she was winning it. A single anxiety remained, that the Pope might try to impose his authority by force of arms, with Spain as his willing ally. For that reason only, she might consider coming to an agreement, but it would have to be on her terms. For Pope Paul on his curia, there was a terrible truth to be faced. The interdict had failed. The most dreaded weapon in the papal armory, that same weapon the very threat of which, in the Middle Ages, had been enough to bring kings and emperors to their knees, had lost its power. Worse, its failure had been revealed to the world. The effect on papal prestige, already incalculable, was growing with every day that this farcical sentence continued in operation. It must be lifted, and quickly. To do so would not be easy, but somehow a formula would have to be found. Thus the Curio argued. For some time Paul was unable even to contemplate so crushing a blow to his pride. But at last even he was obliged to agree. The French offer of mediation was accepted and negotiations began. Venice advised as always by Sapi, drove a hard bargain. She refused outright, for example, to petition for the removal of the ban. Any such request must come from the King of France, in which case she would allow her name to be associated with his, further than that she would not go. As for the two prisoners, once the ban was lifted, she would consign them to the French ambassador as a token of her regard for the King, but without prejudice to her right to judge and punish them. On no account would she readmit the Jesuits. The other banished orders, save for certain individuals, might be permitted to return, but she declined to put this in writing. Finally, a carefully drafted decree was prepared stating that in view of the Pope's change of heart and the lifting of the sentence, Venice in return rescinded her solemn protest. It contained, However, no word to suggest that she had at any time been in the wrong or regretted her actions. And so, 
in April 1607, after almost exactly a year during which it had succeeded only in bringing discredit on its instigators, the interdict was lifted. It was the last in the history of the Church, with the example set by Venice as an eternal warning before him, no Pope ever dared risk another, and papal authority over Catholic Europe was never quite the same again. But the end of the interdict did not mean reconciliation in any but the most formal sense. Paul V had been publicly humiliated, there were, moreover, several issues which remained unsettled church property, the examination of bishops and patriarchs, the future of senator, and which he had no intention of allowing to be forgotten. Foremost in his mind, however, was a determination to be revenged on those clergy who had defied his edict and above all on the architect of his defeat, Paolo Sarpi. Sarpi did not immediately give up his office on the resumption of normal relations with Rome. There was still work for him to do, and he continued to make the daily journey on foot from the Servite monastery to the Doge's palace, waving aside all suggestions that his life might be in danger. Returning to the monastery in the late afternoon of the 25th of October 1607, he was descending the steps of the S. Fosca Bridge when he was set upon by assassins who stabbed him three times before making their escape, twice in the neck and once in the side of the head, where the knife, entering the right ear, was left deeply embedded in the cheekbone. Miraculously, he recovered, later, on being shown the weapon, he tested its point smiled painfully and was able to pun that he recognized the style of the Roman curia. Naturally, there is no proof that he was right, but the fact that the would-be assassins, who had by this time been identified, fled at once to Rome, where they flaunted themselves, fully armed, in the streets and where no charges were ever preferred against them, suggests that the attack, if it were not actually instigated by the papal authorities, at least did not incur their disapproval. After this incident, Sapi refused the Republic's offer of a house on the piazza, but agreed to make his daily journey by gondola and to allow the construction of a covered way through which he could pass in safety from the door of his monastery to the landing stage. Despite these precautions, he was to suffer two more attempts on his life, one from within his own cloister. These two he survived finally dying in his bed in the early hours of the 15th of January 1623. His last words were Esto perpetua dash may she endure forever dash which his hearers took to apply to the republic he had served so well. But papal rancor followed him beyond the grave, when the senate proposed a monument in his honor the nuncio raised violent objection, threatening that if anything of the sort occurred the holy office would declare the friar an impenitent heretic. This time Venice gave in, and it was only in 1892 that the present bronze statue was erected in the middle of the Campo S. Fosca, a few yards from the spot where he so narrowly escaped martyrdom. 140 treason and plot 1607 1622 mix with hood slaves, bravos, and common stabbers, nose slitters, alley lurking villains. Join with such a crew and take a ruffian's wages to cut the throats of wretches as they sleep. Thomas Sotway, Venice preserved great victories, whether military, diplomatic or moral, almost invariably have a tonic effect on the popularity of the leader of the victorious side. To this rule, however, Leonardo Donia was an exception. The leadership of Venice during the interdict had passed, in fact if not in theory, to Paolo Sapi and though Donia was to reign over Venice for another five years, he was never loved by his people. The reason is all too clear. Again and again, especially at this period of Venetian history, the same melancholy fact is demonstrated, the Venetians judged their doges by a single standard, their generosity. It is recorded that Donia scattered scarcely any of the expected largess on his inaugural tour of the piazza, and that the three nephews who accompanied him were still more parsimonious, to the point where the indignant populace began to pelt them with snowballs. The same austerity characterized his whole reign. Processions were shortened, public spending ruthlessly cut, state banquets, which were traditionally attended with so much pomp and parade that they often gave more pleasure to the uninvited masses than to the guests themselves were reduced both in number and in magnificence. 
just at the time it was most needed, much of the color went out of Venetian life. The citizens looked wistfully back to the days of their previous doge, open-handed old Marina Grimani, and were sad. Dot in all other respects, Donia was an excellent ruler. He was outstandingly intelligent, a close friend, incidentally, of Galileo, hardworking and deeply conscientious, it is said that he never missed a meeting of the Great Council, the Senate or the Council of Ten except on those rare occasions when illness prevented him, and that no detail was too small for his attention. The strange thing is that this tall, severe, unsmiling man with the curiously brilliant, penetrating eyes seems to have desperately minded his unpopularity. In February 1612, during the annual Purification Day visit to the Church of S. Maria Formosa, he was actually greeted by the crowd with jeers and shouts of Viva il Doge Grimani. Dash an experience which shook him so severely that he refused to make any more public processions. And he never did. Five months later, on the 16th of July, after an unusually heated debate in the Collegio, he suddenly collapsed. He was dead within the hour. One Donia's three successors, Mark Antonio Memo, Giovanni Bimbo, and his own distant kinsman Nicolò Donia, made little impact on history, though Bimbo had fought with distinction at Lepanto, where he had accounted for three Turkish galleys and sustained two serious wounds whose scars he bore to the end of his life. Their reigns were short, the first two occupying the throne for three years each the last dying of apoplexy after only thirty-four days, and, perhaps for that reason alone, undistinguished, but the republic over whose fortunes they presided was passing through one of the most strangely unreal periods of its history. It was a period in which all Italy was overshadowed by the looming spectre of Spain. For a century or more, Spanish ambitions had been held in check by France but France had renounced her last Italian possession in the peninsula at the beginning of the century, comma, two and the assassination of Henry IV in 1610, leaving the throne to his nine-year-old son, Louis XIII, and the regency to his determinedly pro-Spanish widow, Marie de Medici, had ensured that the most Catholic king would encounter no further opposition in that quarter. Spain was now supreme in Milan and Naples, in Florence, Marie's cousin, Grand Duke Cosimo II, was largely under Spanish control, so too, thanks to the joint influence of the Spanish cardinals in the Curia and of the Jesuits, was the Pope in Rome. Only two Italian states were determined to resist the growing threat. One was the Duchy of Savoy, where Duke Charles Emmanuel II had amassed an army of over 20,000 and, with the help of the French Marshal Lestiguiers, who had joined him on his own initiative, was perfectly ready to take on any force that the Spanish governor of Milan might send against him. The other was Venice. While Milan made trouble for Savoy, Venice, whence Charles Emmanuel was by now drawing considerable financial subsidies, was facing even greater difficulties from the other, eastern, arm of the Spanish pincers, the Habsburg Archduke Ferdinand of Austria. The underlying cause, as usual, was the Uscock pirates whose continuing depredations had culminated in 1613 with the beheading of a Venetian admiral, Christopher Avenia. Again and again Venice had protested to Ferdinand, demanding that he take effective measures to keep his intolerable subjects in order, but as Venetian-Spanish relations grew worse the Archduke began to view the Uscooks with a steadily more sympathetic eye and, while feigning a few gentle remonstrations, gave them secret encouragement in every way he could. Venice, not for the first time, took the law into her own hands and launched a punitive expedition, Ferdinand in his turn protested, and the resulting war, while it remained on a fairly desultory level, grumbled on in Istria and the Free Eli until the autumn of 1617, when Venice, Savoy and Spain came to an uneasy peace by which, though it achieved little else, the fate of the Uscooks was settled once and for all. Their harbors and fortresses were destroyed, their ships were burned, and all those who escaped a more disagreeable fate were transported with their families to the Croatian interior, where, gradually over the years, they intermarried with the local populations and lost their separate identity. Spain, however, 
was not looking primarily either to armed force or to peaceful diplomacy to advance her interests. There were other, darker methods at her disposal. The late 16th and early 17th centuries were above all the age of intrigue. Intrigue in itself, of course, was nothing new, in the Florence of the Medici, in the Milan of the Visconti, above all, if the legends are to be believed, in the Rome of the Borgias, there were instances a plenty of plots and poisonings, of spies and counter spies, of the secret meeting in the stiletto beneath the cloak. Nor was it peculiar to Italy, in France, within the memory of men barely approaching Middle Age, there had been the massacre of Saint Bartholomew, the assassinations of Cliny and of Henry for himself, in Scotland, the numberless conspiracies that twined themselves through the sad, violent life of Mary Queen of Scots, in England, the gunpowder plot. Only Venice, until the attempted murder of Paolo Sapi, had remained relatively free of the contagion. But by then Venice too was changing fast. As always, her streets were full of footloose adventurers, Italian and foreign. But whereas in days gone by most of these would have found employment as mercenaries or seamen, now they were more likely to join the little groups of bravi who could be seen loitering around the piazza or the rialto, supporting themselves as best they could while they sought to attach themselves to any potential patron for whom there was dirty work to be done. Usually, they would not have long to wait. In the past few decades, a new sort of visitor had begun to make his appearance in Venice the foreign gentleman of quality. Though the grand tour as such was still unknown, by 1600 the whole of Western Europe had become thoroughly permeated with Renaissance ideas, one of the most central of which was the value of foreign travel, and above all travel to Italy, as part of a cultivated gentleman's education. In the Middle Ages few such men would have ventured abroad unless for war or pilgrimage or the occasional diplomatic mission. Traveling for pleasure was a new conception, and Venice, with her beauty, her splendor, her cosmopolitanism, her pageantry, and her rapidly growing reputation as the known world's foremost purveyor of delights, both innocent and corrupt, was the favorite destination. Venice welcomed these early tourists, accommodated them in every way possible, and took pains to see that no unfair advantage was taken of them, nevertheless, what could be more natural for the new arrival than to accept the smooth blandishments of one or more of these bravi, who knew their way around, spoke the language, understood the money and the local customs and could provide entertainment, protection and any other more specialized services of which their clients might feel the need. But there were other, more sinister employments. Venice's superb communications and the almost legendary stability of her government had made her Europe's principal centre of espionage, an international clearinghouse for secrets of state. By now all the principal nations of the world were represented there, by embassies, agencies, banks, trading centres or other more clandestine associations, and for many of them the gathering of intelligence was a primary function. For such purposes extra pairs of eyes and ears were always useful, nor did a skillful hand with a knife or a none too sensitive conscience invariably come amiss. It would have been odd if Venice, with an intelligence system of her own far more highly developed than that of any foreign power, had not maintained a close eye on all these covet activities and, where possible, used them for her own ends. Every embassy, every foreign household even, was thoroughly penetrated by Venetian agents, reporting directly back to the ten details of comings and goings, of letters received and conversations overheard. A special watch was kept on the leading courtesans, several of whom were paid by the state to pass on any information that might prove useful, for blackmail or otherwise. There was also an active network of double agents whose task was to feed false or misleading information into the foreign systems. Yet even the ten, with all its expertise and its unseen army of informers, to say nothing of the notorious Spoch de Leon one, could not be everywhere at once, and the very geography of Venice, the labyrinth of narrow Cali, the dark Sotoportisi, even the proximity of the lagoon for the ready disposal of bodies, made their task a hard one. The greatest of their triumphs culminated on the 18th of May 1618. Venice was even more crowded than usual, 
not only because the greatest of the Republic's annual celebrations, the Ascension Day Wedding of the Sea, had been held four days previously, but because on the 17th, following the untimely death of Nicolodonia, a new doge, Antonio Priuli, had been elected and would shortly arrive from Dalmatia, where he had been serving on a commission to regulate the Venetian-Austrian frontier. Priuli was a rich man with a reputation for generosity, and great things were expected from his tour of the piazza. to Venice, however, was still technically without a doge on the 18th, when early risers passing across the piazzetta were astonished to see the bodies of two men, each dangling by a single leg from a hastily erected gallows between the two columns. Though this had always been the traditional place of execution in past centuries, in more recent years the ten had been accustomed to perform its more distasteful duties in secret, such a departure from its usual practice could only mean that it wished to issue a public warning. And yet, as the days passed, although another corpse appeared in the same place, no proclamation was made, no pronouncement of any kind to identify the unfortunates or to explain the reason for their fate. Inevitably, rumors spread, and were encouraged by the numbers of Bravi making hasty departures from the city. Inevitably, too, these rumors presupposed a major conspiracy against the Republic, of which there could only be one instigator, Spain. Hostile demonstrations were held outside the Spanish embassy, to the point where the ambassador, the Marquis of Bedma, was obliged to ask the authorities for official police protection. The name of the most Catholic king, he reported to his government, and that of the Spanish nation, is in Venice the most odious that can be pronounced. Among the people, the very word Spanish is an insult. They seem to thirst for our blood. It is all the fault of their rulers, who have always taught them to hate us. This was not strictly true. For years the Spanish embassy had been the busiest center of intrigue in the whole of Venice, its basements, anterooms and corridors teeming with sinister, slouch-hatted figures whispering together in groups while they awaited audiences with the ambassador. And when, the following October, the Council of Ten finally disclosed in a full report to the Senate the details of what had taken place. The Marquis of Bedma was revealed, as everyone had known he would be, as one of the leading figures in what has gone down in history as the Spanish Conspiracy. It is entirely appropriate that the Spanish Conspiracy should have indirectly furnished Thomas Otway with the plot for his best and most celebrated play, Venice Preserved. One, although it did not actually end in tragedy, except for those who met their deserts, and although sadly deficient in sex, an element which Otway was well able to supply from his own imagination, the story has all the elements of 17th century melodrama. Here is the arch-villain Don Pedro, Duke of Osuna, Spanish Viceroy of Naples. Determined to destroy the power of Venice in the Mediterranean but also to betray his own country by assuming the crown of an independent Neapolitan kingdom. Here is the Marquis of Bedma, Spanish ambassador, cultivated and charming in society but in reality one of the most potent and dangerous spirits Spain ever produced, filled with an implacable hostility towards Venice and the Venetians and fully approving of the first of Osuna's objectives, though unaware of the second. Here is Gasparo Spinelli, Venetian resident in Naples, a loyal servant of the Republic but innocent, gullible and none too bright certainly no match for the diabolical wits of those who are plotting its overthrow. And here are the two chief instruments of the conspirators, the men who execute the orders and take the pay, Jacques Pierre, Norman adventurer and Corsor, practically illiterate but one of the most brilliant seamen of his day, and his inseparable antithesis Nicholas Rignault, educated, plausible but equally unscrupulous, with his mellifluous Italian and exquisite handwriting. Finally the hero, Balthazar Juven, a young Frenchman, nephew of Marshal Lestiguiers, who has come to Venice in order to enter the service of the Republic. Like all of its kind, the plot was complicated and convoluted in the extreme, both in its conception and its attempted execution. A full account of it would be long and insufferably tedious, and has no place in this book. To the general scheme, however, was ambitious enough to satisfy the most demanding dramatist. 
For some weeks before the appointed day, Spanish soldiers in civilian clothes would be infiltrated in twos and threes into Venice, where they would be secretly armed by Bedma. Then, when all was in readiness, Osuna's ships, flying his own personal standard, would advance up the Adriatic and land an expeditionary force on the Lido, together with a fleet of flat-bottomed barges in which that force would be rowed across the lagoon to the city. The piazza and Rialto would be seized and barricaded, and special groups would take possession of the arsenal and the doge's palace, forcing a way into their respective armories and distributing the contents to the conspirators and to those citizens who were prepared to give them support. At the same time a force of Dutch mercenaries who had recently been hired by the Republic in case of need and were at present being lodged, together with the crews of the eleven ships that had brought them, at the Lazaretto would be persuaded to mutiny and join in the attack. The leading Venetian nobles would be killed or held to ransom. As a separate operation, the Venetian garrison at Kramer would be betrayed from within and the town handed over to the Spanish governor of Milan. Venice itself would pass into the possession of Osuna, the loot and the ransom money would go to the other conspirators to share among themselves. Whether so wild an enterprise could ever have succeeded seems, to say the least, highly improbable. Fortunately, its originators never had a chance to put it to the test. The discovery of the plot was due to Juven, who was approached in his hostelry, the Trombetta, by a compatriot, Gabriel Munkassin informed of what was afoot and invited to participate. What Munkassen had foolishly failed to find out in advance was that Juven was a Huguenot, who shared all his famous uncle's hatred of Spain. Introduced to Pierre and Regnault, he agreed to join them and gradually elicited the full details, with the names of all those principally implicated. A day or two later, on some innocent pretext, he went to the palace, taking Munkassin with him, and made his way straight to the doge's antechamber. Suddenly, so the story goes, Munkassin began to feel alarmed. But what do you want with the doge? He asked. Nothing, really, replied Juven. I am merely going to ask him for permission to blow up the arsenal and the mint, and to hand over Kramer to the Spaniards. You'll ruin us all, cried Munkassin, turning pale. Not you, said Juven and leaving his friend in charge of a Venetian nobleman, Marco Bologna, whom he had already taken into his confidence, entered the audience chamber. Having explained the matter in outline to the doge, he then brought in Munkassin, who immediately made a full confession, thereby almost certainly saving his own life. Once in possession of the facts, the Council of Ten acted, as usual, swiftly and in secret. Jacques Pierre who was with the Venetian fleet, was summarily dispatched, sewn into a sack and dropped overboard. Rignault, together with two minor conspirators, the brothers Disbulks, were seized, tortured and then, after confession, hung upside down from the gibbet in the piazzetta. As many as three hundred minor participants were discreetly liquidated. Osuna and Bedma, foiled again and inwardly fuming, were too powerful to be touched and continued their villainies from behind the walls of their respective palaces. But their grand opportunity had been missed. Venice was preserved. The Venetian Republic has often been described as a police state, and so in a way it was. There are, however, certain points that its accusers tend to forget. The first is that so was virtually every other state in 16th and 17th century Europe the principal difference being that Venice was considerably more efficient. Moreover, although like the rest she often used methods which would nowadays be considered reprehensible, at the time they were accepted as quite normal, against those who overstepped the permitted limits, such limits were usually drawn a good deal more generously than elsewhere. This was especially true where freedom of speech was concerned, a department in which modern police states are notoriously sensitive and also on the at that time more important question of religion. Finally it is worth remembering that Venice was an exception in another way, she was never a despotism. Every one of her rulers owed his position to free election, and with the possible exception of the Swiss cantons no state in contemporary Europe governed itself more democratically. On occasion, however, 
and particularly when she allowed her justifiable suspicions of Spain to warp her better judgment, Venice was capable of tragic mistakes, and of these perhaps the most celebrated is that which concerned Antonio Foscarini and Ella there, Countess of Arundel. Foscarini's career had started well. He had served with distinction as Venetian ambassador to France in the days of Henry IV, and subsequently in the same capacity in London, where he had favorably impressed King James I and made many friends. While there, however, he had aroused the enmity of one of his secretaries, who made several more or less hysterical accusations against him, principally concerning the sale of state secrets finally denouncing him to the Council of Ten. Summoned back to Venice to answer the charges, Foscarini was immediately clapped into prison, remaining there throughout a three-year inquiry, during which, it is only fair to say, much apparently convincing evidence was given on both sides, until at last, on 30 July 1618, he was found not guilty and released without a stain on his character. By 1620 he had been made a senator and the whole unfortunate incident seemed well on the way to being forgotten. In the summer of 1621 the Countess of Arundel arrived in Italy. Granddaughter of Bess of Hardwick, goddaughter of Queen Elizabeth herself, she was now about 35, the wife of Thomas Howard, 2nd Earl of Arundel, one of the leading figures at the court of King James. Like her husband she was a passionate lover of art, and was using her boundless wealth to amass one of the first great private collections in England. This was one reason for her journey, the other was the education of her two young sons, to whom she was determined, in a manner well in advance of her time, to give an Italian humanist education. These, however, she had left to spend the summer in a villa at Dolo, on the Brenta while she herself continued to the city and settled with her extensive suite in the Palazzo Mocenigo on the Grand Canal. She was still there the following spring when a second blow fell on Antonio Foscarini, on the evening of the 8th of April, on leaving the Senate, he was arrested and charged with having secretly and frequently been in the company of ministers of foreign powers, by day and by night, in their houses and elsewhere, in this city and outside it in disguise and in normal dress, and having divulged to them, both orally and in writing, the most intimate secrets of the Republic, and having received money from them in return. This time the machinery of the law moved fast. Less than a fortnight later, on the 20th of April, the ten unanimously found him guilty. The sentence of death by strangulation was carried out the same night. By now, the Venetians were all too accustomed to the sight of the exposed corpses of malefactors swinging by a leg from the Piazzetta gibbet, but this time was different. Here was no anonymous cutthroat but a senator of Venice, a man well known to all, of noble and distinguished family, one who had received general sympathy from all sections of the population for the gross slanders that had been leveled against him in the past and for the physical and mental sufferings he had endured during his long and undeserved imprisonment. Could it be, men wondered, that there was truth in those first allegations after all? As usual, the rumors began to spread, and it gradually came to be believed that the majority of Foscarini's secret meetings had taken place in the Palazzo Mocenigo, under the auspices of the Nobilissimo Inglese herself, who must logically be the arch villainess, the huge mother spider at the center of the web. It was not long before word of all this reached the English ambassador, Sir Henry Watson, and Sir Henry, uncharacteristically, lost his head. Had he sought an immediate audience with the Doge to discuss the affair, all would have been well. Instead, he sent Lady Arundel an urgent letter informing her that sentence of banishment was in preparation and would be served within three days. He accordingly advised her to leave the territory of the Republic with all possible speed. In doing so, however, he gravely underestimated her spirit. Lady Arundel was not Bess of Hardwick's granddaughter for nothing. Going straight to Watton, she denied that Foscarini had ever met the papal nuncio or the secretary of Emperor Ferdinand I, the two foreign diplomats whom the ambassador had specifically mentioned, in her house, moreover, she added, as this concerned the reputation of England as well as her own, 
she herself would seek a ducal audience the following morning. She naturally hoped he would accompany her. If not, she would go alone. This was not at all what Watton had expected. He was now deeply embarrassed, for the fact was that he had had no official notification of any banishment, he had merely heard the rumours and had probably seen no reason to disbelieve them. There may too have been in his conduct more than an element of wishful thinking. Lady Arundel was rich and powerful, he himself had no money of his own, and his meagre salary and allowances scarcely enabled him to keep up the minimum dignity his position required. That he managed to do so at all was largely due to the commissions he received from the Duke of Buckingham, for whose art collection he was trying to buy pictures, but Lady Arundel was now snatching all the best ones away, even though she was paying grotesquely inflated prices for them. The fact that her husband was Buckingham's chief rival at court was a further complication. Finally there was the matter of religion. The Countess, unlike her lord, had remained firm in her Catholic faith. Watton was an equally staunch Protestant, who had worked hard for years to secure for his religion those rights in Venice that it now enjoyed. For all these reasons she was a thorn in his flesh, and he would have been glad to see the last of her dot at the audience. The next morning the doge welcomed Lady Arundel warmly and paid her the unusual honour of bidding her sit by his side. He listened in silence to her case and then assured her categorically that there had never been the slightest question of her banishment, or even of her implication in the recent distressing affair. On the contrary, she was more than welcome in Venice and always would be. She graciously accepted his assurances and thanked him, she had, however, one further request, that she should receive a public exoneration in writing, the terms of which should be made known in Venice and London. Here. Too, she received full satisfaction, a few days later, when she and Sir Henry returned to the Collegio, a formal declaration by the Senate was read aloud to her, together with the relevant dispatch to the Venetian ambassador in London, instructing him to give the most unequivocal assurances of her innocence first to Lord Arundel and then to any other persons at the court who might express interest. As a further tokens of the Republic's esteem, the doge extended to her a special invitation to attend the forthcoming wedding of the sea in a special state barge, escorted by two of the Saviagli Ordini, and dispatched to her house fifteen bowls of wax and confections to the value of a hundred ducats. One Lady Arundel had good reason to be pleased with the outcome of events, though she made it abundantly clear to poor Sir Henry that she held him entirely to blame to the point where he began to fear that she might be planning his dismissal. But he was still in Venice six months later when his formidable compatriot finally took her leave and, followed by a train of thirty-four horses and seventy sealed bales of goods, all specifically exempted from customs duty by personal order of the doge, trundled off northwards with her little sons. By then, it is pleasant to record, another restitution had been made, however tragically belated. Precisely what information came to light to suggest that Antonio Foscarini had been for the second time falsely accused is unknown, but on the 22nd of August 1622 those who had laid the charges against him were arraigned before the three, two found guilty and in their turn put to death. The ten then made a full, public confession of its error, copies of which were handed to his family and distributed to all Venetian embassies abroad. Others were passed about the streets of the city. Foscarini's coffin was exhumed and he was given a state funeral at public expense. In the Church of S. Stay, the Foscarini Chapel contains a bust of him and an inscription Antonio Foscarno in his legation I buzad angli, galli ecreges functo falsic majestatis damnato columnio indicii dejecta on a sepulchre et for me in a senchax virum decreto restitutum cxci 41 zen against the 10 1623 to 1631 pronto di lingua, di popolare eloquenza, di benzillo, generoso e di conosciu to integrita, mardi pensieri torbidi, Facile ad intraprendere la controversia e to assostnil con la baronza del legge del publico bene, fat ho vigo digli applausi della piazza aspire voalia gloria di rendersi autori deliberazioni cospicu dot ready of tongue, a good popular speaker, zealous, 
generous and of well-known integrity, but troubled in his thoughts, ready to enter controversy and adept at supporting his arguments with reference to law and the public wheel, ever desirous of the applause of the marketplace, he always longed to foment some public debate in which to shine. Michel Foscarini on Renias and the death of Antonio Priuli caused his subjects few tears. He had promised well, but had proved something of a disappointment. Admittedly, his reign had not been easy, beginning as it had in the middle of the Spanish conspiracy and ending with the exoneration of Foscarini, one of whose judges he had been, but there was more to it than that. While not actually dissolute, indeed it is hard to see how he could have been, given the circumstances in which a doge was obliged to live, he somehow gave the impression of never taking his duties quite seriously enough of failing to maintain that last ounce of ducal dignity, and when he died at the age of 75 on the 12th of August 1623, shortly after returning from his villa on the Brenta, it was murmured that he might have lasted several years longer if he had led a more regular life. He was buried in S. Lorenzo, but there is no memorial, or even an inscription, to mark the spot. Francesco Cantarini, his successor, reigned for fifteen months, which were largely, if not, perhaps, very deeply, overshadowed by another of those minor wars which, though frequently reflecting far grander conflagrations elsewhere, could usually be contained within fairly narrow limits and made little impact on the European scene. Such a war was that of the Vault Aline, the name given to the long mountain valley which follows the course of the river Adder from its source in the southwest Tyrol to where it debouches into Lake Como, and which at the time marked, for some seventy miles of its length, the northwestern frontier of the Republic. With the outbreak of the Thirty Years' War in 1618 the valley, which formed part of the predominantly Protestant Swiss canton of Grissons, had become of vital importance to Spain as the only direct means of communication between Spanish-occupied Milan and Habsburg Austria, two years later it had been occupied by Spanish troops. This development had been viewed with understandable alarm by France, Savoy and Venice, who had concluded an alliance in 1623 with the object of driving out the invaders and restoring the status quo but before they could do so the Spaniards transferred all the strong places in the valley to the hands of the Pope. It was, or should have been, a brilliant move, based on the supposition that Cardinal Richelieu, who had just assumed power in France, would defer to the papal authority, but they had misjudged their man. In November 1624, 3,000 French and 4,000 Swiss infantry, with 500 horse, marched into the Volta line with strong Venetian support, and by the end of the year had driven out the papal garrisons, whose captured standards were promptly returned, with every show of respect, to Rome. This short and completely successful campaign was followed early in 1626 by a Franco-Spanish treaty, signed at Monzen in Aragon, by which it was agreed that the Volta line should be made a self-governing, Roman Catholic state whose independence would be jointly guaranteed by both France and Spain, all its fortresses being permanently demolished. Venice and Savoy were furious. What right had Richelieu to make a separate peace without even consulting them, taking it upon himself to agree with their former enemy on the disposition of an area of primary strategic importance? Venice, in particular, complained bitterly over the destruction of the fortresses which she considered essential for the continuance of free communications. The cardinal was profuse in his apologies, it was all the fault of the French ambassador in Madrid, who had exceeded his instructions, King Louis himself was displeased with certain aspects of the treaty. But the damage was done and he felt sure that the Republic would not wish to risk a possibly long and expensive war by reopening the whole affair. The Venetians shrugged sulkily, and accepted the inevitable. By this time, Doge Cantarini was dead. He had been succeeded in January 1625 by Giovanni Corna, a member of the senior branch of that vast clan and a direct descendant of Doge Marco Corna, who had occupied the same throne nearly three centuries before. The news of his election was received with general surprise in Venice, by no one more than himself, since his career had not been especially distinguished. As the papal nuncio reported to Rome, 
he was more given to his devotions than to affairs of business or of state, and though he had always lived in the considerable style that befitted his rank and station, dispensing alms with a free and pious hand from his splendid palace next to the church of S. Polo, comma, 1 he had never shown the faintest ambition for high office. Paradoxically, therefore, it may have been a sort of naive unworldliness rather than the reverse that led him to attract the fire of a certain Renia Zen, perhaps the most zealous reformer that Venice has ever produced and certainly the most uncomfortable. Zen had already caused the Republic some embarrassment when, as ambassador to the Pope in 1621, he had openly accused the Venetian Cardinal Dolphin, with whom he was sharing the Palazzo di S. Marco, of being in the pay of France. On his return he had been given a senior government post, but his arrogance and inflexibility on what he, sometimes alone, considered to be matters of principle had led to his dismissal and even to a brief period of exile on a charge of contempt. There were, however, many people in Venice who were worried by a general decline in moral standards and who believed that, insufferable as he was, Zen might be just what the Republic needed. He was therefore pardoned and recalled in 1627, and almost immediately found himself elected to the Council of Ten. Now at last his reforming zeal could be given free rein, and its first object was the doge himself. Giovanni Corno was in a distinctly vulnerable position, a position which, even if it were not entirely of his own making, he should at least have been able to avoid. First, his son Federico, Bishop of Bergamo, had been appointed a cardinal by Pope Urban VIII. There was a long established Venetian law by which the sons and nephews of reigning doges were forbidden to accept ecclesiastical benefices. But Federico was unwilling to refuse his elevation and, rather than order him to do so, the doge had chosen to uphold the appointment, arguing that the cardinalate was a rank rather than a benefice. This argument failed to impress the Senate, it was, however, eventually agreed that, in view of the exceptional distinction of the Corner family and the danger that, if Federico declined, the Pope might be offended and refuse to appoint any more Venetian cardinals, the law might on this one occasion be overlooked. Unfortunately the matter did not end here. Within a short time the new cardinal had been offered, and had unhesitatingly accepted, a new bishopric, that of Vicenza, and soon after that, in the summer of 1627, two of the doges other sons had somehow managed to get themselves elected, by an extremely irregular ballot, to a senatorial zonta, once again in flagrant contravention of existing law. It was at this precise moment that Trinio Zen returned to Venice and took up his duties with the ten. By October he was one of the three carpi. One immediately he sent for the Avogadere di Common, the state prosecutors showed them the relevant laws and demanded that the Zonto elections be declared null and void. Weakly, the Evogadri agreed, they could hardly do anything else, but before they had time to act they were preempted by the Doge himself, who made a similar demand, claiming that neither he nor his councillors had fully understood the scope of the law, had they done so, they would never have permitted the election in the first place. On the 27th of October the elections were annulled. At this point most other men might have been content to let the matter rest, not Renia Zen. That same afternoon, shortly before the Senate was to convene, he sent word to the Doge requesting, in his capacity as a capo of the Ten, some minutes with him in private. Corner agreed, but very properly insisted on the presence of the Signoria. Zen then, with every show of courtesy and deference, pointed out that as a capo he had a particular duty to ensure the correct observance of the ducal promission, and went on to read a formal admonition in which he set out full details of the relevant laws and of the precise manner in which they had been contravened, adding for good measure particulars of one or two other minor infractions which had come to light during his investigations. Giovanni Corner was a patient man. He listened in silence, made a short but equally courteous reply and passed on to the Senate chamber, where two new members were to be elected in place of his sons. But Zen, still unsatisfied, now demanded before the Senate that his admonition be formally entered in the records of the Ducal Chancery, 
a step which would have been effectively tantamount to its publication. The demand was angrily refused. Doge Corner might have acted unwisely in the past, but he was nearly 77 and universally respected, and he himself had rectified what was, after all, a very minor transgression. Not only would the demand put an ineradicable and undeserved stain on his reputation, it would have a serious, even dangerous effect on the ducal prestige. But by this time Zen had mounted the rostrum, from which he launched into a determined defense of his proposal. In no other way, he claimed, could similar abuses be prevented in future. No longer could Venice be exposed to these nefarious intrigues on the part of Rome, which sought to suborn even her most influential citizens with dignities and benefices. The law existed to protect the state, why else had ecclesiastics been made the subjects of special legislation? Why, similarly, should there be checks on the activities of a doge's kinsman? It was because of their potential exposure to foreign influences that they were excluded from the Senate, just as, he paused, just as it was because of their special opportunities of gain that they were excluded from commercial pursuits. For a moment there was silence. All present knew that several members of the Corner family were accustomed to making protracted visits to Rome, and that at least one, the Doge's son Giorgio, had amassed a considerable fortune in the past two years by importing cattle from Dalmatia. Family friends were also fully aware that the palace in S. Polo was stuffed with Florentine luxuries whose importation was forbidden. A hundred years before, such flagrant, if relatively minor, abuses of the law and of a doge's promission would never have been tolerated and Renia's end's diatribe, in the unlikely event of its having been necessary at all, would have met with quiet nods of approval. Now, there was uproar. If certain members of the Corner family were quietly feathering their nests, that was no doubt reprehensible, but it was no excuse for allowing the Doge of Venice to be insulted before the whole Senate by a self-righteous prig who had been serving a richly deserved sentence of exile only three months before. Zen's two fellow Carpi called on him to descend from the rostrum, announcing to the Senate that they had annulled his admonition altogether. He refused to leave, and claimed that they had no power to do any such thing. Finally the ten were summoned and formally upheld the annulment. Still Zen fought on. At the next meeting of the Great Council he obtained a ruling that the two other Carpi had indeed acted unconstitutionally and were liable to a fine of 2,000 ducats each, but this too was overruled by the Ten, and it was only when the end of his term of office made it impossible for him to continue his campaign that he let the matter drop. Even then he continued to speak out against virtually every proposal made by the Doge and Signoria. At about five o'clock in the evening of the 30th of December 1627, Renio Zen was set upon by a party of masked assassins outside the Porta della Carta. Though badly wounded, he managed to stagger to his feet and raise the alarm. The day being a Sunday, the Council of Ten were not in the palace, but they were hastily summoned from their homes to an extraordinary session, at which three special inquisitors were appointed to investigate the case and a reward of 10,000 ducats proclaimed for information leading to the arrest of the would-be assassins. Anyone found guilty of harboring them or assisting in their escape would be put to death. Soon it was established that the assailants had been seen to take refuge in the palace itself, and all the available evidence pointed to the doge's son Giorgio as the principal culprit. When it was discovered that he and two close kinsmen had fled to Ferrara, together with their private gondoliers, the suspicion became a certainty. On the 7th of January 1628 the three were formally sentenced to exile from Venice, deprivation of their nobility, and confiscation of their goods, and the traditional nota d'infamiae was inscribed at the scene of the crime. The general populace, however, was still unsatisfied. Self-appointed scourges of the rich and powerful are always popular, and they had taken Renia's end to their hearts. They had not failed to notice that the confiscation order against Giorgio Corner had not come into force until his family had had plenty of time to spirit a good deal of his property away, nor that several other members of that same family who were suspected of complicity had not even been interrogated, 
but was still strutting about the city as arrogantly as ever. Finally there was the evidence of recent arrivals from Ferrara, who reported that the three suspects were living there quite openly and with every appearance of comfort. Why was the Republic taking no action to bring them personally to justice? Obviously because the Ten had been corrupted, and was unwilling, or afraid, to act against the interests of the Doge Dotrinia Zen, meanwhile, was rapidly regaining strength, and in the following July found himself again elected one of the Carpi of the Ten. Arriving on his first day of office with a substantial bodyguard, he was coldly informed that the latter could on no account be admitted, he discovered also that steps had been taken to reduce his powers to a minimum. A newly drafted memorandum informed him that, according to recent decisions of the Ten, no question that had already been fully discussed by them could be brought up for reconsideration, nor could any accusations be leveled against holders of public office. For some days he held his peace, then, early on the 23rd of July, he gave notice that at the meeting that morning of the Great Council he intended to raise the question of the Ducal Promission, this advance notification, he emphasized, was given in order that the Doge and his family might be requested to stay away from the chamber in accordance with the law. But no such request was made, and it was consequently in the presence of Giovanni Corner and several of his kinsmen that Rini Zen once more mounted the rostrum. He believed, he said, that his recovery had been granted him solely in order that he might continue his long fight against the corruption of the state. In the past month the Council of Ten had done its best to muzzle him, in defiance of the law which permitted every citizen freedom of speech in what he considered the Republic's good. Now another law was being broken, that which demanded the absence of all members of the Ducal family when that family's affairs were under discussion. At this point an old councillor, Paolo Bassadonna, interrupted him, accusing him of trying to overthrow the government to rush the assembly into hasty decisions, and to set himself up as a Caesar. On the contrary, Zen retorted, Caesar had wanted power for himself, whereas he, as a loyal Venetian, sought only to persuade the legitimate organs of the state to accept their responsibilities. Before he could continue further, the doge himself rose and launched into an impassioned protestation of his innocence. These accusations were, he had no doubt, simply a form of revenge for an attack in which he himself had played no part. Those responsible had been punished as they deserved, the remainder of his family was blameless. He had never broken the terms of his promission, the Signoria had agreed to his son's election, his son the Cardinal had received the Bishopric of Bergamo in the days of a previous doge, when there was consequently no reason to refuse it, while as for that of Vicenza. He had merely accepted it in substitution for the first. He had attended the present session of the Consiglio as usual, because the Signoria had told him he could, if it was the Assembly's will, he would immediately withdraw. These final words were almost lost, since Zen, unable to contain himself any longer, was loudly calling on the Avogadri di Command to do their duty and see that the laws were obeyed. What now? shouted the Doge. Ah, we no longer to be allowed to speak. Pandemonium followed, with shouting on all sides and much banging of benches as some sought to silence Zen, others to encourage him, others to applaud the doge while he vainly tried to make himself heard above the hubbub. Finally he gave up, Zen tried to table the document without success, and the session ended in anger and confusion. That afternoon the ten, in a specially called meeting in the doge's private apartments to which Zen was not invited, decided on his arrest. An officer dispatched to his house having failed to find him, a proclamation was issued ordering him to present himself at the palace within three days. Zen made no effort to obey the summons. He was forthwith sentenced to ten years exile with a fine of two thousand lira, and left Venice the next day. But the Council of Ten had not solved its problems, rather had it aggravated them, for to many people the sentence against Zen merely confirmed what he had always said, that the Ten were in reality just so many puppets, and that the Corner family pulled the strings. His supporters grew more and more numerous, and not just among the disenfranchised populace, among the nobility too, particularly its lower echelons, 
a party of reform began to take shape, though precisely what reforms were required was a more difficult question. Should the Ten's range of authority be restricted? Should the Doge be excluded from it, and perhaps his kinsmen also? Should it be forbidden to delegate its powers to powerful subcommittees like the Three? Should it draw its members from a broader section of society? And what about its servants, those secretaries who were appointed for an indefinite period, often for life, and who gradually managed to arrogate to themselves immense power, should they not have limited terms of office, just as their superiors did? These and similar questions became the major issues of the day, but it took one further incident to spur the government to action. This occurred on the 4th of August, less than a week after Zen's banishment, when yet another close relative of the doge, Angelo Corner, fired an arquebus at a respectable citizen, Benedetto Serenzo, the ten showed itself unwilling to take any action against him and only did so, nearly a month later, in response to continued protests. Now at last the party of reform had its way, and on the 3rd of September a committee of five correctors was appointed to report on the terms of reference of the ten and on the members and staffs of all the various councils of state. Two weeks later, while they were still preparing their report, one of the avogadori, Batasai Cantarini, addressed the Great Council for two hours on the Zen affair, during which he showed that the memorandum addressed to Zen on 8 July, from which, he maintained, their warrant for the arrest and the exile had both directly resulted, was illegal. On the conclusion of his speech a vote was taken, by a majority of 848 to 298, the memorandum warrant and sentence were all declared null and void, as if they had never occurred. Thus, on the 19th of September, Renia Zen returned to Venice from his second exile, and was welcomed at his house at S. Marcola by a cheering crowd, but disappointments were to follow. At the next meeting of the Great Council, by delivering yet another harangue, he antagonized everyone by his complacency and self-righteousness, Finally he was called to order and warned that he must content himself with the victory he had won, for he could expect no more. A few days later the correctors published their report. On the working of the Council of Ten they had a few reforms to suggest, Zonti would be discontinued, secretaries would serve in future for a specified term only, and there would be one or two other minor administrative changes. In the really important section, however, Concerning the overall powers of the Ten, its authority was confirmed in virtually every respect, except that it lost the right to revise decisions of the Great Council. Otherwise its terms of reference remained as wide as ever they had been. This was a sad day for Venice, since the Ten was encouraged to behave in ever more dictatorial fashion, to consider itself ever more immune from outside control and, not least important to make itself even more unpopular both with the citizens as a whole and with other organs of government, on whose territory it trespassed and whose jealousies and animosities it could not fail to arouse. Renia Zen, it seemed, had achieved little after all. He had not even succeeded in bringing the corner family to book, old Giovanni, who had been much grieved by the harsh accusations made against him and had begged that he might be allowed to abdicate and retire to a monastery had been wisely discouraged from such a course, which would certainly have been taken by his enemies as an admission of guilt, and still occupied the ducal throne, from which his family continued to derive considerable surreptitious profit. Meanwhile his accuser gradually withdrew from political life, enjoying the respect of many but the friendship of none, a perfect example of that most unpleasant of breeds, the reformer who, beginning with a worthy cause sincerely pursued, gains such fame and universal admiration that he allows it to go to his head and finally sees his once sacred cause as little more than a means of his own self-glorification. He had, however, one last moment of satisfaction, when news came from Ferrara that Giorgio Corner had died at the hand of an unknown assassin. Whether Zen was implicated has never been established, it seems unlikely. Corner was a villain who must have had many enemies, it is hard to imagine Zen, insufferable as he was, descending to murder. On the other hand he was a fanatical lover of justice, which he frequently interpreted in his own idiosyncratic fashion. We can imagine him, guilty or not, 
smiling a thin, triumphant smile. Four days before Enya Zen was struck down outside the Doge's palace, Duke Vincenzo Gonzaga died in Mantua. Death came to him peacefully, in his bed, but it led to a short and bitter war that must have caused the rulers of Venice far more ill anxiety than any of Zen's accusations. The Casus Spilly, as so often when a prince dies leaving no issue, was the succession. Vincenzo had designated as his heir his first cousin, Charles, Duke of Nevers, but Spain, already deeply embroiled with France in the Thirty Years' War, and determined not to allow a French prince to take possession of an important Italian duchy, was backing, on far shakier genealogical grounds, a rival claimant in the person of the Duke of Guastella. Here already were the makings of a nasty confrontation, but the position was further complicated by the fact that Duke Vincenzo possessed a second, equally strategic dominion, the Marquisate of Montferrat, a large if somewhat formless area covering the upper Po Valley to the east and south of Turin. This had long been coveted by Charles Emmanuel of Savoy, but in order to keep the two territories under one ruler Vincenzo had taken the precaution of marrying the heiress of Montferrat, his niece Maria, to the Duke of Nevers's son, Charles, Count of Rethel. Venice's foreign policy was at this time based on two principles, the preservation of peace in Italy and the curbing, whenever possible, of the power of Spain and the Empire. Her frontier marched with that of Mantua, the last thing she wanted was a Spanish or imperial puppet on her doorstep. Unhesitatingly she gave her support to Nevers and accordingly, on the 8th of April 1629, joined with France, Manchu and the Pope in a six-year treaty of mutual defense, undertaking to put 12,000 infantry and 1,200 horse into the field should the need rise. By this time, in fact, the war had already begun. The Spanish governor of Milan and the Duke of Savoy had jointly occupied Montferrat, in answer to which the French had also crossed the frontier in support of Nevers and taken the town of Sisa. But it was only in August that the appearance of imperial troops in the vault airline made it clear that Manchu itself was in danger and that active Venetian participation could no longer be delayed. As these troops advanced southward, so Venetian money, men, arms and equipment poured into the threatened town, by March 1630 it was calculated that Venice had spent 658,000 ducats to help the new duke maintain his position. But it was not enough. On the 25th of May 1630 a badly organized and poorly led army of Venetians, Mansions and a few French were routed at Valgio with serious losses, the Venetian prove editor general, Zaccaria Segredo, being subsequently impeached and sentenced to ten years imprisonment for dereliction of duty, and on the 18th of July, after nearly ten months siege, Mantua finally surrendered to the imperialists and was put to the sack. And yet, surprisingly, even as the conquerors entered the starving, plague-ridden city, some two hundred miles away to the west the French were winning the war. At the end of March a new French army had entered Savoy under the command of Richelieu himself. His cardinal's hat discarded in favor of a helmet and plume. His pectoral cross covered by a cuirass. The army of Savoy was destroyed at Vegliana, and on the 6th of April 1631 a treaty of peace was signed at Trisco in Piedmont. By its terms the emperor referred in and agreed to invest Nevers with Manchu and Montferrat. Nevers ceding in return part of the latter to the Duke of Savoy. So Mantua was saved after all, or what was left of it, for when Nevers returned on the 20th of September to resume possession he entered a ghost city, its treasures and works of art looted, its beauty destroyed, its population reduced by three quarters in less than a year. For the survivors, there was only one consolation, that the plague, having done its worst within the city, had spread to the German invaders, relatively few of whom returned to their homeland alive. But it did not, alas, stop the sweeping across Lombardy, leaving behind it a trail of devastation far wider and more calamitous than any barbarian army could have achieved. It reached Venice in the month that Mancha fell, and sixteen months later it had accounted for 46,490 deaths in the city alone, 
among a population that had not yet recovered its numbers since the previous visitation. In 1633 the population, according to official registers, was down to 102,243, smaller than at any time since the 15th century. By then, work had begun on what was to become one of the city's best-known landmarks. Just as after the plague of 1575 the Venetians had built the Church of the Redentor, so in 1630 they decided to raise, this time more as a prayer for deliverance than as a thank-offering, a still grander edifice, on the site of the old Ospizio della Trinita at the entrance to the Grand Canal. It was to be dedicated to the Virgin, S. Maria della Salute. One a competition was opened, and of the eleven projects thought worthy of serious consideration the winner was that submitted by a young Venetian architect of thirty-two, Baldas Erlongina. The foundation stone was due to be laid by Doge Niccolo Contrini, who had succeeded Giovanni Corner in January 1630, on Ascension Day, 1631, but was postponed a week in the hopes that he might recover from an indisposition, not the plague though this was still claiming several victims a day, from which he had been suffering for some time. On the 1st of April he was no better, but dragged himself from his sick bed to perform the ceremony, at 7 o'clock on the following morning he died. It is an ironical fact indeed that the very first result of the building of the salute, as the church is generally called, should have been the death of a doge, but even long in himself, though he was forty-five years younger than Contarini and lived to be eighty-four, never saw it completed. Only in November 1687 was the scaffolding removed and the Venetians given their first unimpeded view of that splendid, extrovert proclamation of self-confidence and strength, sentiments that they were far from feeling when that first stone was laid, with such fatal results. Over half a century before. 42 The Cretan War 1631 to 1670 Il Regno di Candia e anti Mural dell'Italia, e porta per dove insidiosa forza Turch scapuo spingersi all oppression della magia parti di apostrophe Europe. The dominion of Crete is Italy's outer defense, the gate whereby the insidious force of the Turk may penetrate, to the great hurt of the major part of Europe. The Venetian ambassador, Giovanni Segredo, to Oliver Cromwell when the 41 electors met on 10 April 1631 to choose a successor to Niccolo Contarini the result was, most unusually, a foregone conclusion. Francesco Arezzo, at 65, was young for a doge, but as prove editor general of the army, a post he had taken over after the disaster of Valgio from the disgraced Zaccaria Segredo. He had deeply impressed his superiors by the way in which, in the space of a few months, he had managed to breathe new life and spirit into the shattered and demoralized troops. So sure, indeed, were the Signoria that he would be elected that they actually summoned him from Vicenza, where he was supervising the construction of new fortifications, before the election took place, and in the event their confidence proved fully justified. Only one other, somewhat controversial, candidate was even considered, but in the very first ballot the electors made their preference clear. The result was, Francesco Arezzo, 40, Renia Zen, 1. The new doge was delayed on his journey to Venice by abnormally high water on the Brenta, one of the bridges had to be dismantled to allow his barge to pass, and arrived in the city only on the 11th of April, but he could not have timed it better. Two hours after his arrival there arrived the news from Trusco that his subjects had long been awaiting. The treaty had been signed, and Italy was once again at peace. Being a man of comparatively modest means, he must have been almost as relieved to learn that all unnecessary public assemblies had been banned by reason of the plague, and that he was therefore excused the traditional tour of the piazza which, for him, would have been as embarrassing as it was expensive. His good luck continued to hold. As the weather grew warmer, the plague figures increased just as everyone knew they would, but the summer had not even reached its height when, quite suddenly, they began to fall. Soon it was clear, even to the most pessimistic, that the epidemic was dying out, 
and on the 28th of November the Doge was authorized by the Magistrato della Sanita to issue the long-awaited proclamation that Venice was once again free of contagion. For the first time since the disease had struck, the piazza was thronged, then all the citizens followed the ducal procession as it wound slowly past Hess. Moyes to a bridge of boats, leading across the Grand Canal to where Longina's great church was just beginning to rise on the opposite bank. A service of thanksgiving was held in a temporary wooden structure erected for the occasion, and the whole ceremony became yet another of those annual events of which the Venetian calendar was, and indeed is still today, so agreeably full. Moreover, for the next twelve years there was peace. This was the more remarkable in that the Thirty Years' War was still raging and Venice was under relentless pressure from several sides to involve herself. Her diplomats were busier than they had ever been, and in the city itself the Senate, the Collegio and the Ten seemed to be in almost permanent session. Somehow, nevertheless, they managed to steer a middle course, and while the rest of the continent continued to tear itself apart around her, Venice remained at the still center of the hurricane. In 1642 there was a brief flurry when, as a result of a purely local quarrel which need not concern us here, the Pope sent an army of occupation into the Duchy of Parma and Venice was forced into a defensive alliance with Tuscany and Modena. In the following year the three allies were actually forced into war, during which they inflicted considerable damage on the land forces of the papacy as well as on its commercial shipping. But the hostilities lasted less than a year, and in March 1644 a peace treaty was signed at Ferrara, based on a compromise that gave reasonable satisfaction to all parties. From Venice's point of view, however, the peace came only just in time. In October of that same year there occurred an incident which, though she bore no part of the responsibility for it, was to involve her in a quarter of a century of war and to result in the loss of her most valuable colony, the island of Crete. Sooner or later, as she must have known, that war was inevitable. Crete was too tempting a prize, the Turks too covetous an adversary, for her possession of it to go much longer uncontested. It seems ironical, all the same, that the initial Turkish attack should have been the result of a piece of deliberate provocation on the part of a minor power which, after Venice itself, stood to lose more than any other from the surrender of the last important Christian outpost in the eastern Mediterranean. Although the Knights of St. John possessed a church and a priory in Venice, inherited from Templars after their dissolution in 1312, they and the Venetians had for centuries cordially disliked one another. It was hardly surprising. Since their order was immensely rich in property held all over Christian Europe, the Knights despised trade and commerce. As men of God, bound by the monkish vows of personal poverty, chastity and obedience, they disapproved of Venetian worldliness and love of pleasure. Finally, as men of the sword and children of the Crusades, their avowed object, apart from the cure of the sick, was to fight the infidel wherever they found him, and they deplored Venice's reiterated desire for peace with the Sultan an attitude which they considered a shameless betrayal of the Christian cause. By the middle of the 17th century the knights were but a frail and feeble reflection of what they had been in those heroic days only 80 years before when they had successfully defended their island against Suleiman the Magnificent. They continued to run their famous hospital, where they still maintained standards of nursing and hygiene far in advance of any to be found elsewhere, but their crusading spirit was beginning to evaporate and their naval operations tended all too often to save a less of honorable warfare than of common piracy. Nor, even, did they invariably confine their depredations to Muslim shipping, unprovoked attacks, launched on the flimsiest of pretexts, against Venetian and other Christian merchantmen were becoming increasingly frequent. To the Venetians, in short, the Knights of Malta had become a nuisance only slightly less appalling than the use cooks had been in former days. Worst of all, they had adopted the old use cook habit of harassing Turkish vessels in the Adriatic, a practice for which the Sultan invariably held Venice responsible, with much consequent damage to the all-important friendly relations between the Rialto and the Sublime Porti. More than once, 
the Doge had been obliged to send for the local representative of the order to make a vehement protest, never more forcefully than in September 1644, when he went so far as to threaten the sequestration of all the knights' property on the territory of the Republic if they did not improve their behavior. But the knights as usual took no notice. Instead, barely a month later, they thoughtlessly provoked that final incident that put a spark to the fuse and ended in the greatest Venetian military disaster of the century. Cruising in the Aegean at the beginning of October, a squadron of six ships of the order fell upon and captured a rich Turkish galleon laden with distinguished pilgrims bound for Mecca, among them the chief of the black eunuchs at the Sultan's court, the caddy of Mecca, some thirty ladies of the harem, and about fifty Greek slaves. They then sailed on with their prize to Crete, where, landing at some unguarded point on the southern coast, they took on water and disembarked the slaves, together with a number of horses. Soon the local Venetian governor arrived and, not wishing to be implicated even after the event in what was, after all, an act of sheer piracy, ordered them away. Having made several attempts to put in at various ports of the island, where on each occasion they met with the same point-blank refusal, they finally abandoned the Turkish vessel, which was no longer seaworthy, to its fate and returned to Malta. Occupying the Ottoman throne at this time was the half-mad Sultan Ibrahim, who until his accession in 1640 had spent his entire life a virtual prisoner in the Seraglio and who, after a brief reign marked only by cruelty, frivolity and vice was destined to be executed in 1648 by his own exasperated subjects. When the news was brought to him he exploded with rage, and ordered the immediate massacre of all Christians in his empire. This order, fortunately, he was later persuaded to countermand, but it soon became clear that punitive action on an alarming scale was being contemplated, as Venetian agents brought news of an immense war fleet being prepared in the Bosphorus. At first it was automatically assumed that this fleet was to be directed against Malta, an assumption that was confirmed by an official proclamation in March 1645, but dispatches received in Venice from the Venetian Bialo in Constantinople contained increasingly urgent warnings that this was a feint. The Sultan, he reported, was convinced that the Venetians had been behind the whole incident, why otherwise would the raiders have made straight for Crete? Venice not the knights, was his true enemy, Crete, not Malta. His immediate objective. It was not long before the Bayalo was proved right. On the 30th of April a Turkish fleet of 400 sail, carrying an estimated 50,000 fighting men, passed through the Dardanelles. At first it headed towards Malta as announced, sailing straight past Crete and putting in at Naverino, the modern Bayalos, in the southwest corner of the Peloponnes for reinforcements and supplies. Only on its departure from there on the 21st of June was it seen to have changed course. Three days later it was sighted off Cape Spatha, and on the 25 th the invading army landed a little to the west of Kenya and advanced on the town. The first round of the battle had begun. Crete, or, as the Venetians called it after its capital city, Candia had been Venice's first properly constituted overseas colony, dating from the year 1211 and the sharing out of the Byzantine Empire after the Frankish capture of Constantinople. Its government was based on that of the mother city, with a governor who bore the title of Doge, serving, however, only a two-year term, a signoria and a great council, but it had never worked as easily or as well. The most fertile parts of the island had been largely swallowed up in vast feudal estates owned by prominent Venetian families, whose limitless wealth and overbearing ways did little to endear them to the indigenous Greek population. These families in turn grumbled over their lack of any real political power, all the principal officials being sent out from Venice, where all major decisions were taken. Defense was in normal times entrusted to feudal levies raised and maintained at the expense of the great landowners, and to local militias of townsfolk and peasants, but both sides tended to shrug off their obligations, and discipline varied between the poor and the non-existent. Bribery and venality were endemic, and the colony, its own treasury always empty, was a constant drain on Venetian resources. 
In 1574 things had reached the point where a certain Giacomo Foscarini was sent out with special powers to institute reforms. He achieved considerable temporary success, introducing more accurate accounting systems and fairer methods of taxation, stamping out corruption, reanimating the levies and militias and repairing the crumbling fortifications, but after his departure the Cretans soon began to slip back into their old ways. Now, faced with the imminent danger of Turkish attack, the Venetian government ordered a new and vigorous defensive program, sending out to their prove editor general, Andrea Corner, an army of 2,500 men, including military architects and engineers, and a fleet of 30 galleys and two galleases, to supplement those already in the island. A further fleet was in preparation and would sail as soon as possible. All this was followed on the 10th of February 1645 with a special additional remittance of 100,000 ducats and orders to corner to take whatever further measures might seem necessary to meet the expected onslaught. Corner, like Foscarini before him, worked conscientiously and efficiently, but his resources were still inadequate for the magnitude of his task, and the time allowed him far too short. Already as he hurried to the beachhead on that fateful June day, he must have known that the colony's chances of survival were slim. Much depended on the speed of the promised Venetian fleet, if it could only arrive within a week or two, Kenya might yet be saved. But it did not arrive. Corner would have been horrified to learn that it had orders to wait at Zante until it should be joined by a further combined fleet of 25 sail, comprising ships from Tuscany, Naples, the Order of Malta, and the Pope. Time was what counted now not numerical strength. The Turks were entrenching themselves more deeply with every day that passed. The island fortress of St. Theodore fell to them, though only after its commander, by A. Giuliani, seeing that further resistance was hopeless, waited until it was overrun and then set light to the powder magazine, blowing up himself, his men, the attacking Turks and the building itself in a single epic explosion which must have been clearly audible in Kenya. The town was weakening fast, its ammunition and supplies running out, its defenses steadily undermined by Turkish sappers. On the 22nd of August it surrendered. The Turks, doubtless helping by a well-timed show of magnanimity to encourage further surrenders as they advanced, promised to respect the lives, honor and property of the local population. Then they allowed the garrison to leave the town with its colors flying and to embark unmolested for Suda. Now more than ever, fortune seemed to favor the invaders. At Suda the Venetian admiral, Antonio Capello, suddenly lost his head and abandoned the town. The combined fleet, at last arrived in Cretan waters, made two attempts to recapture Cania by surprise attack but was each time driven back by equinoctial storms. Then, in mid-October, its non-Venetian element, under the command of the papal admiral Niccolo Ludovisi, Prince of Piombino, who from the start had shown extreme distaste for the whole expedition, announced its intention of returning home. Not for the first time, Venice's allies had done her nothing but harm. As her own proveditor del Mar, Girolamo Marasini, was not slow to point out, she would have been better off alone. Her government, meanwhile, was on full war footing. Having no reason to believe that Ibrahim intended to confine himself to a single theatre of operations, it sent additional garrisons to Dalmatia and Corfu and even began strengthening the lagoon defences along the Lido and at Malamago. But the top priority was naturally given to Crete. Galleys and transports were now sailing for the island almost daily, laden with munitions and supplies of every kind. One need, however, remained unfulfilled. What was now required was a supreme commander, a man whose seniority and reputation would set him above the petty jealousies and rivalries which, particularly where Venetian Cretans were involved, were an ever present danger. The appointment was long debated in the Senate, and in the ensuing vote the name that emerged with an overwhelming majority was that of the Doge himself, Francesco Arezzo. One voice only was raised against the proposal. Giovanni Pissarro, later to assume the ducal throne on his own account, 
very reasonably argued that the doge was now only two months short of his 80th birthday, that the cost of sending him out, with the Signoria and inadequate staff and secretariat, was quite unjustifiable at a moment when the Republic needed every penny to pursue the war, and that such a step would probably encourage the Sultan similarly to take the field in person, and thus greatly intensify the Turkish war effort. But no one listened, all attention was fixed on the old doge who, in a speech which brought tears to the eyes of all who heard it, declared himself ready to assume the formidable task that had been laid upon him. Fortunately, perhaps, for Venice, he never did so. The preparations alone proved too much for him, and just three weeks later, on 3 January 1646, he died. He was buried in the church of S. Martino, where stands the tomb which he had ordered during his lifetime, but his heart, in recognition of his unhesitating acceptance of his last commission, was interred beneath the pavement of St. Mark's itself. One he was succeeded by Francesco Molin, another veteran of many campaigns who, however, having recently been prevented by severe gout from taking up an appointment as Prove Editor General, was not called upon to assume command of Cretan operations. There being no one else available in Venice of sufficient stature, the whole idea of the Supreme Generalissimo was shelved, and is heard of no more. The other pressing need was money. In the spring of 1646, all heads of households in Venice were assembled in their respective parish churches and implored to save the Republic in this moment of crisis by contributing all they could spare, but by then the government had already resorted to methods which, though in the short term they may have been more successful, were ultimately a good deal more dangerous. Three more procuratorships of St. Mark were instituted and sold at 20,000 ducats apiece, these proved so popular that their total number was later increased to 40 and the price to 80,000 ducats. Even then they were quickly snapped up. Young nobles, on payment of a mere 200 ducats, were permitted to take their seats in the Great Council at the age of 18 instead of the statutory 25, and finally, in February, it was proposed to put the patriciate itself up for sale. Any citizen offering to support 1,000 soldiers on campaign for a year, a cost assessed at not less than 60,000 ducats, would be immediately admitted among the ranks of the nobility, with all its honors and privileges for himself and his descendants forever. This proposal, though approved by the Senate, was, not surprisingly, rejected by a large majority in the Great Council, who had no wish to open their doors to a crowd of upstart nouveau riches, but in the years following, a large number of individual applicants were nevertheless admitted by special decree, subject to suitability as well as to a substantial payment. At the same time the new doge addressed another round of appeals to Christian Europe, not only in the predictable directions of England, France and Spain, but to Sweden and Denmark, Poland and Muscovy. She even appealed to safe Afid Persia, which, though firmly Islamic, was equally threatened by Ottoman expansion. But nowhere was there any response. France, in fact, where Cardinal Mazarin had succeeded Richelieu in 1642, continued to pursue her traditional policy of friendship towards the Porti, she merely advised the Republic, through her ambassador to the Sultan, Lava N, passing through Venice on his return from Constantinople, to come to terms as quickly as she could if she wished to avoid total destruction. The Doge retorted that he would do nothing of the kind, nevertheless, as the new campaigning season opened, it was more than ever plain that Venice would have to carry her burden alone. Everything depended on containing the Turks in Cania, still the only Cretan port they held. If they could be blockaded the while Venice built up her military strength in all the other strong points along the coast, it should not be impossible eventually to dislodge them. To this end, Girolamo Moresini, captain of the relief fleet, now applied all his energy and skill. The fact that he failed was not his fault. His kinsman Thomas Amorosini, sent with a fleet of 23 sail in an attempt to close off the Dardanelles and thus to pen up the Turkish fleet in the Marmara, managed at least to delay it considerably. This delay so enraged the Sultan that he ordered his admiral to be beheaded forthwith. But the admiral's successor, 
doubtless impelled as much by the fear of a similar fate as by a favorable wind behind him, finally smashed his way through the Venetian line and swept down through the archipelago to Cania, where the Captain General, the 75-year-old Giovanni Capello, was too slow and indecisive to stop him entering the harbor. It was a bad beginning, and as the summer came and then the autumn, the situation grew steadily worse. Though Venice somehow retained Suda, whose superb natural position and recently renewed fortifications made it almost impregnable by sea, her ships were effectively driven from the bay, and fell back on Retimo, the modern Rethimnon, which, after a prolonged struggle, was driven to surrender on the 13th of November. The fall of Retimo had one beneficial effect, in that it brought about the dismissal of Giovanni Capello, sentenced on his return to a year's imprisonment, and his replacement as Captain General by Gian Battista Grimani, a respected and popular commander whose arrival instilled new life into the fleet. Early in 1647, too, Young Thomas Amoresini was given an opportunity to take his revenge for his failure the previous year when, while pursuing some Barbary pirates, he suddenly found himself surrounded by no fewer than 45 Turkish ships. In the unequal battle that followed he and his crew fought heroically, holding their fire till the enemy was almost upon them and then blasting out at point-blank range. Before long the Venetians were grappled by three of the Turkish vessels simultaneously and the fighting was hand to hand, Morosini himself continuing in the thick of it until a Turkish arquebusier managed to steal up behind him and blew his head off, at just about the same time the Turkish admiral also fell mortally wounded, but still the battle continued. Suddenly the exhausted Venetians saw three more ships approaching in close order the banner of St. Mark fluttering at their mastheads, Grimani, hearing the firing, had come to investigate. They too now plunged into the melee, forcing the Turks to disengage. Four Ottoman vessels had gone to the bottom, the rest fled. Of the Turkish sailors who had boarded the galley, the few survivors quickly gave themselves up. Battered but still afloat, Morosini's ship was towed back to Candia whence the remains of its courageous young captain were returned to Venice for a hero's funeral. Great, once again, was the Sultan's rage when the news was brought to him. He could not execute his admiral this time. The unfortunate man being dead already, he merely confiscated all his worldly goods, and gave orders that more men, more ships and more arms should be sent against Crete and that these should be followed by more, and yet more still until Venice were taught the lesson she deserved. Meanwhile among the Venetians in Crete it was recognized that the heroism of Thomas Amorosini, inspiring as it had undoubtedly been, had in no way improved their basic position. Of the four principal strongholds ranged along the northern coast of the island, the fifth, Sisha, was so far away to the east that it could be for the moment ignored, two were already in enemy hands, of the other two, Suda had been blockaded from the sea for well over a year and was desperately short of food, and both it and the town of Candia itself had now been struck by the plague, which not only destroyed morale but made adequate garrisoning impossible. The Turks, however, outside the walls, remained free of disease, and it was in the summer of 1647 that they first laid serious siege to Candia, on which, as the capital, the whole future of the colony depended. The siege of Candia lasted for 22 years, during which Venice, virtually single handed, defended the small town, its civilian population numbering only some 10 or 12,000, against the combined military and naval force of the Ottoman Empire. In former times, so long a resistance would have been inconceivable, if only because the interdependence of Turks and Venetians in commercial matters demanded that all hostilities between them should be short and sharp. But now that most of the carrying trade was in English or Dutch hands, such considerations no longer applied, the Sultan could afford to take his time. That Venice was able to hold out for so long was due less to the determination of the defenders within the walls though that was considerable, than to her fleet, which by maintaining an almost continuous patrol of the eastern Mediterranean not only frustrated every Turkish effort to blockade Candia from the sea, 
it actually increased its control over the Aegean to the point where, for the last ten years of the siege, the Turks were doing everything they could to avoid any direct naval confrontation. This is not to say that such confrontation never occurred, the story of the war is a national epic in every sense of the word, a story of countless battles, large and small, deliberate and unsought, ranging from the mouth of the Dardanelles, where the Venetian fleet gathered every spring in the hope of blockading the enemy within the narrows, right through the archipelago to the roadstead of Candia itself. It is rich, too, in tales of heroism, of Giacomo River in 1649 pursuing a Turkish fleet into a small harbour on the Ionian coast and smashing it to pieces, of Lazaro Mokenigo in 1651 off Aparos, sailing in defiance of his admiral's orders to attack a whole enemy squadron and, though severely wounded by several arrows and a musket shot through the arm, putting it to flight, of Lorenzo Marcello leading his ships right into the Dardanelles in 1656 but not surviving to witness one of the most complete and overwhelming victories of the entire war, and in 1657, of Lazaro Mokenigo again, now Captain General, his squadron of twelve vessels driving thirty-three of the enemy still further up the narrow straits and pressing on through the Marmara towards the walls of Constantinople itself. He might well have reached the city had not one of the shore batteries scored a direct hit on his powder magazine, the ensuing explosion brought down the mast and a falling yard struck him on the head, killing him instantly, and yet, however glorious the victories, however superb the seamanship and the courage, one feels, as one works through their long, grim record of the war, that somehow there was always lacking an overall plan, that a more organized defense of the immediate approaches to the besieged town might have been more successful in cutting off the assailants from their supplies and reinforcements. For, despite all Venetian efforts, these continued to get through, and even in their most triumphant moments, the defenders must have known in their hearts that the fall of Candia could only be a question of time. One thing only could have saved it the unstinting and enthusiastic support of the European powers. But this was not given. It is arguable that the whole history of Ottoman expansion in Europe can be attributed to the perennial inability of the Christian princes to unite in the defense of their continent and their faith. They had not done so, in all the fullness of heart and soul, since the Third Crusade nearly five hundred years before, and they did not do so now. Again and again Venice appealed to them emphasizing always that it was not the future of an obscure Venetian colony, but the security of Christendom itself, that hung in the balance, that if Crete were lost, so too was half the Mediterranean. Again and again they refused to listen, just as they always had. From Germany the emperor pointed out that he had recently signed a twenty-year truce with the Porti, from Spain, to the astonishment of all. His Most Catholic Majesty was actually sending an ambassador to infidel Constantinople, France, true to her double game, passed occasional small and secret subsidies to Venice with one hand but continued to extend the other in friendship to the Sultan. England whence little was expected, since she was not yet a power in the Mediterranean, was prodigal with promises, but with little else. Successive Popes seeing Venice's plight as a useful means of gaining some advantage for themselves, offered assistance only in return for concessions, innocent texts, for the control of Venetian bishoprics, his successor Alexander VII for the readmission of the Jesuits, banned from the territory of the Republic since the days of the interdict. Admittedly, as the years went by, and the continuing resistance of Candia became the talk of Europe, foreign aid in the form of men money or ships was a little more forthcoming, but such aid was invariably too little and too late. A typical example was the force of 4,000, under Prince Amerigo of Ist, sent out from France in 1660. It arrived not in the spring, when it would have been most useful, but at the end of August, its first sortie against the enemy, over terrain which it had not troubled to reconnoiter, ended in panic and flight. A week or two later, laid low by dysentery, it had to be sent en masse to other more restful islands to recover its strength, after which the survivors, whose numbers did not, regrettably, 
include the Prince One, returned to their homes having achieved nothing. With 2,000 Germans, dispatched at about the same time by the Emperor, it was a similar story. They in their turn arrived far too late to be of any use, and left without anything to show for their involvement except a further depletion of the Russians in the besieged town. So many, and so memorable, were the exploits of the Venetian commanders at sea that one all too easily forgets the still more heroic defense of Candia by the garrison itself doomed to face twenty-two years of attrition, of all forms of warfare the most helplessly discouraging, and to suffer constant disappointment when promised reinforcements from their so-called allies proved time and again to be worthless. Such forces as did appear always seemed intent either on saving their skins or, what was almost as bad, gaining personal glory for themselves, thus risking not only their own lives but also many others that, with the chronic shortage of manpower, could ill be afforded. This latter phenomenon became more and more frequent in the last stages of the siege. By now the name of Candia was famous across Europe, and among the French in particular the young scions of noble families flocked to the island, determined to make proof of their valour on so glorious a field of battle. The most remarkable influx came in 1668 when Louis XIV was at last persuaded to take an interest in the siege. Even now he did not enter the war, or even break off diplomatic relations with the Sultan, French merchants in the Levant had taken full advantage of the sudden departure of their Venetian rivals, and were doing far too well for Louis to dream of any open rupture. He did, however, compromise his principles to the point of allowing Venice to raise troops from within his dominions, under the overall command of the lieutenant general of his armies, the Marquis de saint andre Montbrun, and the result of this was a 500-strong volunteer force, the list of which sounds less like a serious professional army than the roll call at the field of the cloth of gold. Foremost under Montbrun was the Duc de la Filade, who, though by no means a rich man, had insisted on personally bearing the lion's share of the cost, then there were two more dukes, of Chateau-Thierry and of Caderous, the Marquis of Orbusson, the Counts of Villemur and Tavannes, the Prince of Nucatel, who was barely seventeen, and a quantity of other young noblemen bearing names which numbered them among the proudest families of France. The party arrived at the beginning of December, to find the Venetians in a situation more disparate than ever before. The Sultan was losing patience and his Grand Vizier, Ahmed Korprulu understandably anxious to keep his head on his shoulders, had poured new troops into the island and assumed personal command, telling them that they would have no rest until Candia was theirs. Heavy rain was fortunately delaying their siege operations, filling up the trenches almost as fast as they could be dug but they had now begun to build a long mole only just beyond the harbour mouth which threatened to cut the Venetian's principal lifeline. Francesco Morosini, the new captain general, had during the summer's campaign lost 600 officers and 7,000 men, while the auxiliaries from the Allies had been even more useless than in previous years, the few vessels sent by the Pope and various other states of Italy had sailed away at the first sign of autumn, and on their journey home had chanced to meet a small Spanish squadron which, promised for the summer, had not even left its home port until September. Hearing from the Italians, who were anxious to justify their early departure, that the campaign was over for the year, it was in fact nothing of the kind, they had immediately and with much relief turned about and headed back to Spain. On their arrival in Crete the young French nobles were entrusted by Morosini with the defence of one of the outer ramparts on the landward side. They refused. They had not, they pointed out, made the long and uncomfortable journey to Crete only to be told to crawl through the mud to some advanced outpost, but to wait, patiently and in silence, until the Turks should decide to launch their next attack. Instead, they demanded a general sortie which would, in the words of one of their number, oblige the enemy to raise the siege. Morosini very sensibly forbade any such thing. He had already made dozens of sorties, none of which had produced lasting results. His remaining men, there were by now fewer than five thousand, would be barely enough to defend the breaches in the walls that the Turkish sappers were regularly opening up. But his arguments went unheard. 
As one of France's own historians one was to put it Monsieur de la Filade sought only vigorous action and glory for himself, he would have concerned himself little over the loss of seven or eight hundred of the Republic's men so long as he could enjoy, on his return to France, the honour of having made a valiant sortie in Crete. Once out of the place, its subsequent loss through want of men to defend it would have occasioned him little distress. When he saw that the Captain General would not be moved, Lafilade, complaining loudly of Venetian timidity, announced his intention of making an unsupported attack on his own, and this he did on the 16th of December, symbolically armed with a whip, at the head of a force whose numbers, we are told, had already been reduced from the original 500 to 280. The Turks resisted fiercely, but the Frenchmen, for all their foolhardiness, showed an almost superhuman courage and drove them back a full two hundred yards, holding the conquered territory for two hours and accounting for some eight hundred of the enemy before the arrival of a fresh battalion of Janissaries finally forced them to retire. The Counts of Villemur and Tavans and some forty others were killed and over sixty badly injured, including the Marquis of Orbusson. Lafilade himself, streaming with blood from three separate wounds, was the last to return to safety. It was magnificent, but it was no help to Venice or to Crete. When it was over, the young heroes could not get out quickly enough. They were gone within a week, though many of them, even those who had somehow escaped unscathed, never saw France again. They had taken the plague bacillus with them. Soon after the survivors landed at Toulon, another force far larger, more professional and better equipped, set off from France for Candia. At last, Louis XIV had been persuaded by the Venetian ambassador, Giovanni Morosini, a kinsman of the captain-general, to take his most Christian responsibilities seriously, and in the spring of 1669 his first important contribution was ready, 6,000 men. 300 horses and 15 cannon, all carried in a fleet of 27 transports, with 15 warships as an escort. But even now Louis tried to conceal his breach of faith from his Turkish friends, the fleet sailed under the banner, not of the fleur de lis, but of the crossed keys of the papacy. The bulk of the army, some 4,000 strong and commanded jointly by the Dukes de Beaufort and de Noailles, arrived on the 19th of June. They were appalled at what they saw. One of the officers one wrote, The state of the town was terrible to behold, the streets were covered with bullets and cannon balls, and shrapnel from mines and grenades. There was not a church, not a building even, whose walls were not whole and almost reduced to rubble by the enemy cannon. The houses were no longer anything more than miserable hovels. Everywhere the stench was nauseating, at every turn one came upon the dead the wounded or the maimed dot at once, the story of La Filade began to repeat itself, so eager were the new arrivals for the fray that, refusing even to wait for the remainder of the army, they launched their own attack at dawn on the 25th of June. It began badly, the first body of troops on whom they opened fire proved to be a recently arrived detachment of Germans, marching up to give them support. Once order had been re-established, they charged the Turkish emplacements, with considerable initial success. Then, suddenly, a stray shot ignited the powder barrels in one of the hastily abandoned batteries. The prowess of the Turkish sappers was renowned, indeed, their mining operations had been a feature of the siege, and much of the damage to the defences of the town had been the result of subterranean explosions. The word now suddenly spread through the ranks of the French that the whole terrain on which they stood was mined, that the battery was a concealed blast hole and that the detonation they had just heard was the first of a chain of similar explosions that would blow them all to smithereens. With the rumour went panic. The soldiers fled in terror, tripping over each other as they ran. Seeing this sudden and to the utterly unaccountable flight, the Turks regrouped themselves and counter-attacked. 500 Frenchmen lost their lives, and within minutes their heads, impaled on pikes, were being paraded in triumph before the Grand Vizier. They included those of the Duke de Beaufort, the Comte de Rosne, nephew of the great Turenne, 
and a Capuchin monk who had accompanied the army as Amina. 500 men out of 6,000 is not an intolerable loss. Four days later the rest of King Louis's army arrived and Morosini started planning a fresh attack on Kenya. But the spirit of his new allies was already broken. On the 24th of July a French man of war of 70 guns approached too near a Turkish shore battery and was blown out of the water, and a few days later de Noyes coldly informed the Captain General that he was re-embarking the army and returning home. Protestations, entreaties and threats appeals from the surviving civilian population, even thunderings from pulpits were of no avail, on the 21st of August the French fleet weighed anchor. In the general despair that followed, the few auxiliaries from the papacy, the empire and the knights of Malta likewise set their sails for the west. Morosini and his garrison were left alone, and the Grand Vizier Ahmed ordered a general attack. Somehow, it was repelled but the captain general knew that he was beaten at last. His garrison was reduced to a mere 3,600 men. No more reinforcements could be expected that year. The defences were in ruins and he knew that he could not hope to hold Candia for another winter. By surrendering now, on the other hand, rather than waiting for the inevitable taking of the town by storm, he might be able to secure favourable, even honourable, terms. Admittedly, he had no powers to parley on behalf of the Republic, but he was aware that on at least three occasions in the past, the first as early as 1647, and then again in 1657 and 1662, the question of a negotiated peace had been hotly debated in the Senate and on every occasion had found a measure of support. In any case, he had little real choice. The treaty was agreed on the 6th of September 1669. The Grand Vizier, who had much personal admiration for Morosini, proved generous. The Venetians would leave the town, freely and without molestation, within twelve days, though this term could be prolonged in the event of bad weather. All the artillery that had already been there before the beginning of the siege must be left in place, the remainder they could take with them. The Turks would be left as masters, but Venice could retain the Grabousa Islands at the northwestern extremity, Suda, which had never surrendered, and their island fortress of Spinalunga, off the modern village of Elounda. And so, on the 26th of September, after 465 years of occupation and 22 of siege, the banner of St. Mark was finally lowered from what was left of the citadel of Candia and the last official representatives of the Republic including the colony's last doge, Zakaria Mokenigo, who appears to have played little if any part in the negotiations, returned to their mother city. With them went virtually all the civilian population of the town, none of whom had any desire to remain under their new masters. For Venice it was the end of an epoch. She had retained her three outposts, and there were still one or two pinpoints on the map of the Aegean archipelago where the winged lion still ruled, though his roar was gone and even his growl was barely audible, but Crete had been her last major possession outside the Adriatic, and with its loss not only her power but even her effective presence in the eastern Mediterranean was dead forever. It had at least died magnificently. Never had Venetians fought longer or more heroically on land and sea, never had they faced more determined adversaries. The financial cost had been enormous, 4,392,000 ducats in 1668 alone, and that in lives greater still. Moreover, for nearly a quarter of a century, they had fought virtually alone. The assistance of their allies, on the comparatively rare occasions when it was given at all, was grudging, half-hearted, inadequate or self-seeking, occasionally, as for example when it caused long and inactive delays, or when it was suddenly withdrawn without warning, it was positively detrimental to the interests of the Republic. Even in those last two or three years, when the former policy of attrition gave way to a frenzy of destruction and bloodletting, foreign interventions served only to demoralize and to discourage. Yet it was neither demoralization nor discouragement that drove Francesco Morosini to his surrender. It was the cold realization that the loss of Candia was inevitable, that no amount of help from Venice or anywhere else could do anything but prolong the agony of the town and its inhabitants.
and that the only choice was between departure on honorable terms now or wholesale massacre and pillage a very little later. Few accusations in Venetian history have been more unfair than those which were flung against him by the Avogador di Com and Antonio Curra on his return. The charges were not only those of having exceeded his legitimate powers by treating with the enemy in the Republic's name, for those he was ready with his reply. There were others, however, as unexpected as they were undeserved, cowardice, treason, even peculation and corruption. Fortunately Morosini had no lack of champions who were quick to defend him, and when, after impassioned speeches on both sides, the question was finally put to the great council, the vote was overwhelmingly in his favor. He emerged from the affair without a stain on his honor and, as we shall see, was to avenge himself many times over on his old enemies when the moment came. This account of the long struggle for Crete has of necessity been short and episodic. Out of consideration for the average reader, to whom one battle, military or naval, seems very like another, there are many incidents and engagements, many acts of courage and heroism, to which, even if they have been mentioned at all, less than justice has been done. For the same reason, a period of forty years has been covered in what must be accounted, even by the standards of this avidly superficial survey, a very few pages. Before passing on to the next chapter, therefore, we must briefly retrace our steps in time and turn our eyes back to Venice. The Cretan War covers the reigns of no fewer than seven doges. Francesco Milan died in 1655, his successor, Carlo Contrini, barely fourteen months later, and the next, Francesco Corna, enjoyed the shortest reign of record, from 17 May to the 5th of June 1656. These three had all been in their seventies, and when Batassi Valia, Venice's hundredth doge comma one was elected on the 15th of June at the age of only 59, it was hoped that with the energy of his comparative youth he might be able to resolve what appeared to be a stalemate in Crete. Alas for Venice, he proved a spiritless invalid, and in March 1658 the 41 electors found themselves at work again. Giovanni Pissarro was ten years older than Valia, but still possessed plenty of inward fire, indeed, he probably owed his election to the vigor with which he had attacked his predecessor some months before over the question of whether to accept Turkish peace offers. Valia had been in favor, and several others in the Collegio had shared his opinion, but Pissarro's indignant oratory had carried the day. He, perhaps, might have given Venice the leadership she so badly needed but in the mere seventeen months of life that were left to him he too achieved little. He was succeeded in September 1659 by Domenico Cantarini, in whose reign Candia fell at last and peace with the Turk was finally restored. During these short and undistinguished reigns the attention of the Venetian government was fixed principally on Crete, but not exclusively so. Venice had always accepted the possibility of an extension of the war to other fronts and, as we have seen, had taken defensive measures as and where these seemed necessary, by the same token, once hostilities had begun in earnest, she had never hesitated to attack if there seemed an opportunity for a quick and easy victory, even at the risk of opening up new theatres of operations. Whether this policy was wise for a state whose forces were overwhelmingly outnumbered by those of the enemy is, to say the least, questionable, but it cannot be denied that it worked. Between 1645 and 1648 a Venetian fleet under Leonardo Foscolo executed a series of raids up and down the coast of Dalmatia, beating off several land-based attacks by the Turks on Venetian-held towns. This campaign culminated in 1648 with Venice's capture of Clissa, a Turkish fortress a few miles southeast of Spalato. One similarly in 1659 Francesco Morosini, during his first period as captain general in Crete, after repeated unsuccessful attempts to bring the Turkish fleet to battle, had relieved his frustration with a sudden attack on Kalamata in the southern Peloponnese. Both the town and citadel surrendered at once, the first step in Morosini's reconquest of the Morea a quarter of a century later. Throughout the period of the Cretan War, however, Venice enjoyed one inestimable blessing. The rest of Europe left her alone. 
The Peace of Westphalia had brought the Thirty Years' War to an end in 1648, Spanish Catholic zeal and Venetian civic spirit had alike burnt themselves out, and though various other relatively minor outbreaks of hostilities among the princes of Europe continued to mark the years that followed, none of these had much political impact on the Republic or on any of the other secular states of Italy. Indeed, if one reads a general European history of the time, one cannot fail to be struck by the way the spotlight has shifted northward, leaving the peninsula in dark and quiet shadow. Only the Turk threatened it now, and, as the next twenty years were to show, even he was past his prime. 43 Morosini and the Morea 1670 1700 Il ne se branle chimais por quoi casefoot, il avait two jewers un visagery in Tetagol. Qui temoignait ni moins pta coup d'assurance et de fighty. Poor conclusion, ski se put dia dt lu avec verite, essel, caguet et un gallant homme, et gale a republic non ijamais e unin an or a putty true an orchard de sa force. Filibut de Jarian Francesco Morosini. The fifteen years that followed the fall of Candia were years of peace for Venice years during which she could put her house once again in order and do her best to restore her shattered finances. It was no easy task. French and German, and even a few English, merchants had largely supplanted her in the Levant, Venetian goods, meanwhile, had suffered disastrous rises in price, since the war at sea had obliged her either to hire foreign ships to transport them or, if she could spare any of her own to have them escorted by armed convoys. She was also heavily in debt, with interest rates soaring in some instances as high as 14%. Slowly, however, through carefully contrived combinations of taxes, incentives, tariffs, new protection laws and a major program for the reanimation of old river traffic on the Adige, she worked her way back towards recovery and by the time old Domenico Cantarini died in January 1675, he was 94 and had been virtually bedridden for 18 months after a stroke one, her treasury was once again beginning to fill. Cantarini's successor, Nicolo Segredo, reigned over an economically renaissance Venice for a year and a half, during which, appropriately enough, the Merceria was paved in stone for the first time, and on his death the 41 ducal electors were chosen as usual by the same almost unbelievably convoluted system that had been in force since 1268.2 clumsy as it was, it had worked well enough for over 400 years, on this occasion, however, it became known that at least 28 of the electors favoured Giovanni Segredo, the former ambassador to Oliver Cromwell and a distant cousin of the dead Doge Niccolo. Indeed, so certain was the outcome of their deliberations that the Sagrado Palace had already begun to fill with the family and friends arriving to celebrate, when one of the arrivals brought disturbing news, some sixty gondoliers had gathered beneath the windows of the Doge's palace and were expressing vehement disapproval of Sagrado, even threatening to stone him on his gyro di piazza. The gondoliers do not seem to have leveled any precise accusations and it is virtually certain that they had been paid to demonstrate in this way by one or more of Segredo's rivals for the doge ship. However that may be, the council members were not prepared to ignore the danger signals. They refused to confirm the 41 electors and called upon the 11 who had elected them to vote again. The upshot of all this was that Giovanni Segredo did not, after all, assume the corno, which went instead to Alvise Contarini, a former diplomat and member of the Collegio, under whom Venice continued on her peaceful path towards prosperity. But peace was not always easily preserved. When in 1683 the Emperor Leopold's Hungarian subjects rose in revolt and, inviting the Sultan to support them, brought a vast Turkish army to the gates of Vienna, Venice's diplomats must have needed all their skill to explain why she declined to take any active part in the defense of one of the foremost capitals of Christendom. It is doubtful whether they reminded the emperor of how little, and how useless, had been the support that he had offered to her during the Cretan struggle, but this was a land war, the republic had no military might at her disposal that could have made a useful contribution. Leopold in any case had plenty of allies among them the electors of Saxony and Bavaria and, 
more valuable than either, the Polish King John Sobieski. Her confidence in the Emperor's success proved amply justified. The Turks were badly led, and without heavy artillery, caught in murderous crossfire between the superbly defended city and Sobieski's relief force, they fled in panic, leaving 10,000 dead behind them on the field. Their prestige was shattered, their legend was destroyed, their decline now patent for all to see. Never again would they constitute a serious threat to Christendom. But the war was not over, and as the Christian armies continued to advance on all fronts, the Emperor, supported by the Pope and Sobieski, sent renewed and still more urgent appeals to Venice. The momentum of victory, they argued, must be maintained, with a new offensive league, in which Venice's sea power would be combined with their own on land, the Sultan could be swept from Europe forever an expulsion from which no nation would derive more benefits than the Republic itself. To this invitation Venice sent no immediate reply. She had taken well over a decade to recover from the effects of the Cretan War. Her recovery had been achieved only after much sacrifice and suffering, and even now she had barely begun to enjoy the fruits of peace. Was she really to stake everything, yet again, on the fortunes of another confrontation? On the other hand, since the Turkish defeat at the walls of Vienna the situation had undoubtedly changed. The next phase of the war might well be fought at least partially at sea, did not both Venice's interests and her good name require that she should now adopt a more active policy? Even in the past few years, she had suffered in silence countless minor irritations and humiliations from the Porti, which had cost her dearly in honor and, sometimes, in good Venetian ducats. Was she not paying too high a price for what was really little more than an uneasy truce which the Sultan might break from one moment to the next? Besides, what if he were to make some accommodation with the Emperor and his friends, would he not then turn against the Republic in all the fury of his wounded pride? And if he did, what support could she hope to receive from a quarter to which she had just refused her own? The Turks were weak and demoralized, their Grand Vizier and Commander-in-Chief, the abominable Karim Mustafa, had been executed on the Sultan's orders, their army was in shreds. Venice, by contrast, was restored to comparative strength, was this not the time to take the offensive, not only to avenge the loss of Candia but to recapture it and perhaps her other former colonies as well? The question was long debated. At last on the 19th of January 1684, the Emperor's ambassador was summoned before the Collegio. Venice, he was informed, would join the League. So historic a decision would normally have been announced by the Doge himself. On this occasion, however, the ducal throne stood empty. Doge Alvise Contarini had died four days before and his successor had not yet been elected. Francesco Omarosini, now once again Captain General, had already put his name forward as a candidate and was known to be longing for the opportunity to sail, as the head of his nation as well as of his fleet, against his old enemy, much to his disappointment, however, it was decided that his military responsibilities would be better left uninhibited by the cares of state, and he was passed over by the electors in favor of one Mark Antonio Justinian, an elderly scholar who had been an outstandingly successful ambassador to Louis XIV and was rumored throughout Venice to be not only a bachelor but a virgin to boot. It was, therefore, under these vaguely incongruous auspices that Venice embarked on what was to be her most successful military campaign for two hundred years. Preparations for a summer expedition were immediately put in hand, while in Constantinople Giovanni Capello, the secretary to the hastily departed Bailo, delivered, a formal declaration of war to the Sultan, wisely fleeing the capital, disguised as a sailor, the same evening. Francesco Morosini was now 64. Though deprived of the hoped for Corno, he assumed command of his 68 fighting ships, including six galleases, with enthusiasm and determination. So considerable a fleet had taken some time to make ready and he had been unable to sail before July, but the delay had at least enabled a few auxiliary vessels from the Pope, the Grand Duke of Tuscany and the Knights of Malta to join him before his departure. Once out of harbour he headed straight for his first objective, the island of Santa Mora, 
the modern Lucas, and captured it, after a sixteen-day siege, on the 6th of August. Few quick conquests could have had a more strategic value, from its situation between Corfu and Cephalonia, Santa Mora commanded the entrances into both the Adriatic and the Gulf of Corinth, it also provided a bridgehead from which, a month or so later, a small land force crossed to the mainland and forced the surrender of the castle of Preveza. Meanwhile, further north along the coast, the Christian Vlachs of Bosnia and Herzegovina rose in simultaneous revolt against their Turkish overlords and drove south into Albania and Epirus. Further north again, the armies of the Emperor and John Sobiski continued their advance through Hungary. By the time winter set in to put an end to the first campaigning season, Venice and her allies had good reason to be proud of their success. With the coming of the spring, 1685, Morosini sailed against the old Venetian port of Corone, lost to the Turks in 1500, landing some 9,500 men, including, as well as 3,000 Venetians, German, Papal and Tuscan troops and 120 knights of St. John. This time the Ottoman garrison put up a desperate defence, it was not until August that the white flag was raised on the citadel. Then, while the terms of surrender were being discussed, a Turkish cannon opened fire, killing several of the Venetians. Negotiations were broken off immediately, the allied troops burst into the town in fury and gave it over to massacre. A whole series of other fortresses followed, within another two or three months much of the south of the Morea was under allied control, and a Swedish general, Count Otto William von Koenigsmark, had arrived, hired by the Republic at a salary of 18,000 ducats, to take over all command of the land forces. Early in 1686, Morosini and Koenigsmark met on Santa Mora for a council of war. There were four main objectives from which to choose, Chios, Negropont, Crete or the rest of the Morea, and, largely, it seems, on the pressing insistence of Koenigsmark, the last of these targets was selected. It was not, ultimately, to prove a wise choice, but it certainly gave the attackers no trouble. In the next two summers campaigning the League forces accepted the submissions of Modan and Neverino. Argos and Norplia, Lepanto, Patras and Corinth. It was on the morning of the 11th of August 1687 that the news of these last three victories was brought to Venice. The whole city went wild with joy. Candia was avenged at last. The Great Council at once suspended its session to enable its members to attend a spontaneous service of thanksgiving in the Basilica and the Senate ordered a bronze bust of Morosini to be placed in the armory of the Council of Ten in the Doge's palace bearing the inscription Francisco Moro Seno Peloponnesico ad huc viventis natus. One meanwhile the conquest of the Morea was proceeding apace. Koenigsmark was now mopping up such pockets of resistance as remained in the interior, notably in the region of Mistra and Sparta. Morosini and his fleet, on the other hand, had sailed around to Attica and had begun to lay siege to Athens. The now occurred the second of the two great tragedies of history, the blame for which must, alas, be laid at Venice's door. The miserable story of the Fourth Crusade has already been told. Semicolon two. We now have sadly to record that on Monday, the 26th of September 1687, at about seven o'clock in the evening. A mortar placed by Morosini on the Mausian hill opposite the Acropolis was fired by a German lieutenant at the Parthenon, which, by a further curse of fate, the Turks were using as a powder magazine. He scored a direct hit. The consequent explosion almost completely demolished the cellar and its frieze, eight columns on the north side and six on the south, with their interblutches. Nor was this the end of the destruction. After the capture of the city, Morosini, doubtless remembering the carrying off of the four bronze horses from the Hippodrome of Constantinople in 1205, tried to remove the horses and chariot of Athena that formed part of the west pediment of the temple. In the process the whole group fell to the ground and was smashed to pieces. The determined conqueror had to content himself with lesser souvenirs. 
the two flanking lions of the four now standing in front of the arsenal. One, it is doubtful that many tears were shed in Venice over the fate of the Parthenon. The Venetians were too busy celebrating. They had forgotten what major victories felt like. Their last, Lepanto, had been well over a hundred years before, while a series of actual territorial conquests like those which Morosini was now making was unparalleled since the 15th century. More important still, they seemed to point towards a final lifting of that black Ottoman cloud that had overshadowed the Republic for so long, and perhaps even a return to those far off days of commercial imperialism. No wonder they rejoiced, no wonder that their victorious admiral was acclaimed as the greatest military hero in Venetian history, and no wonder that when Marc Antonio Justinian died in March 1688, Francesco Morosini was elected unanimously and at the first ballot, as his successor. To his highest ambition realized at last, Morosini had no intention of giving up his command. On 8 July 1688 he led his fleet of some 200 sail out of the Gulf of Athens and headed for his next objective, the island of Negropont. Like Crete, Negropont had first come into Venetian hands as a result of the partition of the Byzantine Empire after the Fourth Crusade, and although Venice had forfeited it to the Turks two centuries before, in 1470, its loss had never ceased to rankle. It was known to be heavily fortified, and the Turkish garrison of 6,000, even if it were to receive no reinforcements, was expected to put up a spirited resistance. But the League forces numbered more than twice that many, and neither the Admiral Doge nor Count Konigsmark had any serious doubts that the island would soon be theirs. They had reckoned, unfortunately, without acts of God. Suddenly their luck changed and no sooner had the siege begun than an appalling epidemic struck the Christian camp. What it was we do not know, dysentery, or possibly malaria, seems the most likely suggestion. Within a few weeks, the army had lost a third of its men, including Koenigsmark himself. In mid-August the arrival of a 4,000 strong relief force from Venice encouraged Morosini to continue but almost immediately he found a mutiny on his hands. The imperial troops from Brunswick Hanover flatly refused to fight any longer. With disaffection spreading almost as fast as disease, he had no choice but to order a general re-embarkation. Yet even now he could not reconcile himself to the humiliation of a direct return to Venice. One more victory, however modest, would be enough to redeem his honor and enable his subjects to greet him as a hero after all. The fortress of Malvasia, Monemvasia, in the southeastern corner of the Peloponnese, one of the few mainland strongholds left to the Turks, would serve the purpose admirably. Alas, the good fortune that had smiled upon the admiral frowned upon the doge. The castle, set high on its virtually impregnable rock, could be approached only by a narrow path measuring for the most part less than a yard across, useless for a besieging army. Bombardment was the only hope, and Morosini ordered the construction of two gun emplacements, but even before they were completed he himself was struck down by illness. Leaving the command to his prove editor general, Girolamo Cornaro, he sailed home in January 1690, sick and disconsolate, to a stirring welcome which he was scarcely able to enjoy and an extended period of convalescence in his villa on the mainland. Cornaro proved a worthy successor, and a luckier one. He took Malvasia, where the standard of St. Mark was hoisted on the battlements for the first time for 150 years, then, hearing that an Ottoman fleet was heading through the archipelago, sailed north again to meet it and scattered it off Mytilene inflicting considerable damage in the process. Returning once more to the Adriatic, he launched a surprise attack on Valona, seized it and dismantled its defenses. He was still there when the fever struck him, a day or two later he was dead. Here was a loss indeed, a loss all the greater in that Domenico Mocanigo, who now assumed the supreme command, soon showed himself to be a broken reed attempting the recapture of Cania in 1692 and then, on hearing the mere rumor, unfounded, of the arrival of a Turkish relief fleet off the Morea, 
abandoning the entire enterprise. With the prospect of the Turkish war, which had begun so magnificently, now grinding to an ignominious halt, the Venetians looked once again to their doge for active leadership. Morosini, now 74, had never properly recovered his health, nonetheless, when he was invited to resume command he did not hesitate. The day before he was due to embark, Wednesday, the 24th of May 1693, he marched in solemn procession to the Basilica, splendidly robed in the gold-embroidered mantle of Captain General, baton in hand. Many of his subjects, we are told, objected to the baton as too manifest a sign of authority in a free and republican city, even so, it did not prevent them from cheering him to the echo from every window when he emerged after mass to make a ceremonial tour of the piazza, passing through a number of triumphal arches specially erected for the occasion. On the following day, escorted as before by his carabineers and halberdiers, his standard bearers, military band and trumpeters, the patriarch and clergy, the signoria, the procurators of St. Mark, the papal nuncio and foreign ambassadors, the senate and finally his family and friends, he proceeded in state from the Zecca at the corner of the Piazzetta, along the river to the furthest extremity of Castello, where the buse center awaited to carry him across the lagoon, through a dense throng of exuberantly decorated gondolas, first to S. Niccolo on the Lido for a last prayer before departure and thence to his galley. Scarcely was he on board when the anchor was weighed and the ship, with her sails set and the Lion of St. Mark at her prow, headed out through the Lido port towards Malvasia, where the main body of the fleet was already gathered. One after so glorious an embarkation, this last campaign of Francesco Morosini proved something of an anticlimax. The Turks had taken advantage of the winter and spring to strengthen the defences of both Cania and Negropont. Contrary winds persuaded him against another attempt on the Dardanelles, the Turkish fleet, meanwhile, kept well out of the way. He reinforced the garrison in Corinth and one or two other strong points in the Morea, chased a few Algerian pirates, finally, in order not to return entirely empty-handed, he occupied Salamis, Hydra and Spetai before putting into Norplia for the winter. But by then it was clear that his exertions had taken their toll. Throughout December he was in constant pain from gallstones, and on the 6th of January 1694 he died. He received, as might have been expected, a tremendous funeral, first at Norplia, where his heart and viscera were consigned to the Venetian church of S. Antonio, and later in Venice at SS. Giovanni e Paolo, whence the body was taken to S. Stefano for burial. Here a carved ledger slab marks its final resting place, but Morosini's greatest memorial is not there but in the Doge's palace itself where, at the far end of the Sola dello Scrutinio, there rises a huge marble triumphal arch, reaching almost to the roof and adorned with six symbolic paintings by Gregorio Lazzarini. Neither architecturally nor artistically is it particularly distinguished, comma one, and it looks moreover curiously out of place in its unexpected setting. But few memorials could better illustrate the respect in which Venice held the last of her great warrior doges, or the gratitude which she felt to him for having restored, at least for a few years, some of her old self-confidence. The unenviable task of following Francesco Morosini on the ducal throne fell to one Silvestro Valier, son of that Batassi Valier who had briefly occupied it forty odd years before. From the moment of his election it was made clear that he was not expected to assume his predecessor's military command, many Venetians of sternly republican sentiments, however great their personal admiration for Morosini, had been troubled by what they considered the potentially dangerous concentration of civil and military power in one man and were anxious lest it should start a precedent. In the new doge's promission it was accordingly laid down that the separate election of a captain general could in future be suspended only with the consent of four of the six ducal councillors or two of the three heads of the quarantia, even then it must be approved by the senate and two-thirds of the great council, for which the quorum would be not less than eight hundred. These precautions were to prove more than adequate. Never again in the Republic's history was a doge to go to war. Meanwhile, the supreme command was entrusted to Antonio Zen, 
who sailed out the following summer and on the 7th of September 1694 landed some 9,000 men on the island of Chios. The island already boasted a large Christian population, both Catholic and Orthodox, each community had its own bishop, both of whom hastened to greet the Venetians and to assure them of their support against the Turkish garrison, which consisted of only 2,000 soldiers, concentrated in the citadel above the town. The bombardment began at once, the harbour, including three Turkish vessels that chanced to be lying at anchor, was captured without a fight and the garrison surrendered on the 15th in return for a guarantee of safe conduct to the mainland. So far all had gone well, and when reports now reached Chios of the approach of a Turkish fleet of some 50 sail, Venetian spirits rose higher still. For years now the Turks had done their utmost to avoid naval engagements, and Zen's captains had little admiration for their seamanship or indeed their courage. Unfortunately, just as the captain general was about to emerge from the narrow straits that separate Chios from the mainland and to make for the open sea, the wind dropped, in the flat calm that followed, no confrontation was possible, and when on the 20th a very faint breeze sprang up, it favoured the Turks, who, seeing their danger, quickly made for home and reached the harbour of Smyrna before the Venetians could catch up with them. Zen, still ready to fight, anchored in the roadstead outside the harbour, but no sooner had he done so than he was visited on board his flagship by the local consuls representing the three European powers outside the League, England, France and the Netherlands, who implored him not to risk Christian lives and property in the city by any unprovoked attack backing up their entreaties, we are told, with a considerable sum of money. He agreed, probably as much because of his own shortage of supplies as for any other reason, and returned to Chios.1 but the great sea battle that most of the Venetian captains so eagerly awaited was not to be much longer delayed. The Sultan, furious at the loss of one of his most valuable offshore islands, had given orders for its immediate recapture at all costs and early in February 1695 a new Ottoman fleet was signalled, consisting of twenty of their heaviest capital ships, sultanas, as they were called, supported by twenty-four galleys and a few galliots. Antonio Zen once again sailed out to meet it with a roughly comparable fleet, which included a sizable squadron from the Knights of Malta, and at about ten o'clock on the morning of the ninth. Battle was finally joined off the Spalmatory Islands at the north end of the Straits. It was long and violent, marked by several deeds of outstanding courage among the Venetians, and probably among the Turks too, though they are not recorded in the Venetian reports, but when the two fleets separated at nightfall, despite heavy casualties on both sides, for the Venetians, 465 dead and 603 wounded, the result was inconclusive. This proved, however, to be only the first phase. The fleet sank just out of range from each other's guns and waited for ten full days, watching. Then, on the 19th of February, with a strong north wind behind them, the Turks once again bore down upon their adversaries. As they fought, the wind rose to gale force, the sea grew rougher, until close maneuvering became impossible. The Venetians fought desperately to get to windward, but gradually they were forced down the narrow channel to the harbour walls. In such weather, entry into port, at least for the heavy galleases, was impossible, they could only lie to in the roadstead, where they were egged again and again by the pursuing Turks. It was a disaster, the Venetian losses were immense, the Turkish comparatively slight. The captain general called a council of war, but the outcome seems to have been a virtually foregone conclusion. There were no longer enough men available for the adequate manning of the fortress. The defences were in deplorable condition, the treasury was empty and supplies were running low. Long before any help could be expected, the Turks were bound to attack again, if they did, the consequences could not be anything but catastrophic. Only the commander of the land forces, Baron von Stino, believed that Chios could still be held, but he was overruled. By this time, according to a letter written at the time, almost certainly by one of those present, comma, one the captain general was weeping like a child, his spirit was quite gone, 
and he could only repeat the words do as you like, it is in your hands. So it was that the island of Chios was won and, within less than six months, lost again. On the night of the 20th of February all the war material that could be carried away was loaded onto the ships, the defenses destroyed or dismantled, wherever, at least, it was worthwhile doing so. Then, on the morning of the 21st, the fleet sailed out of the harbour, with it, to escape the revenge of the Turks, went most of the leading Catholic families of the island, who were granted new estates in the Morea to compensate them for what they had left behind. Even on her departure, Venice's ill fortune went with her. Scarcely was the last ship round the mole when one of Zen's most important remaining vessels, the Abondanes a rich sir, laden with arms and ammunition, struck a hidden rock. All endeavours to free her failed, and she finally had to be abandoned, with most of her cargo still intact on board. To the Venetians, who has so recently been celebrating the capture of Chios, the news of its loss was a matter less for sorrow than for anger. There was no lack of ship's captains to testify to the shortcomings of the captain general, his indecision, his timidity, his improvidence, his lack of initiative or any qualities of leadership. The Senate demanded an immediate inquiry, pending which the unfortunate Zen, together with his two prove editors and several other senior officers, were brought back to Venice in chains. He himself died in prison on the 6th of July 1697 while the inquiry was still in progress, though not before he had defended himself with a long written apologia, this was subsequently published by the Venetian government, a gesture which was considered by informed opinion to be tantamount to an acquittal, but no formal results of the inquiry were ever made known. By this time, fortunately for Venetian morale, Zen's successor, Ailes and Romelin, seconded on land by the admirable Baron von Stenau, had scored several notable successes. A Turkish landing in the Argolid was repulsed, and another sea battle off Chios did much to wipe out the humiliation of the previous year. This was followed by a further naval victory for Venice near Andros in 1697 and yet another in September 1698 at the entry of the Dardanelles by which Venice regained effective, if temporary, control of the Aegean but the loss of Chios still rankled, and was to continue to do so for many years to come. While Venice had thus been fighting the League's battles in the Mediterranean, her allies to the north had been anything but idle. In 1686 Duke Charles of Lorraine had reconquered Buda, which thus returned to the Empire after 145 years of Turkish rule, and in 1688 the fall of Belgrade had restored much of Bosnia. Serbia and Wallach to Christian control. This all-important fortress had been recaptured in 1690, but its loss was to some extent mitigated by the conquest of Transylvania in the following year. The death of John Sobieski in 1696 had been a grievous blow, the League had, however, received a valuable new adherent in the person of Peter the Great of Russia, at whose request, in the same year, the Venetians had sent a team of thirteen shipwrights to Moscow. Finally, in 1697, Prince Eugene of Savoy had practically annihilated the Ottoman army at Zenta, leaving some 20,000 Turkish dead on the battlefield. The Turks were not beaten, but they were undeniably battered, and seemed likely to welcome the opportunity for a negotiated peace. The Emperor Leopold, for his part, was anxious that they should for he knew that a fresh crisis was approaching, not on his eastern border this time but in the west, where the half-mad and childless King Charles II of Spain obviously had not long to live. There were two principal contenders for his throne, the Emperor himself and Louis XIV of France, both grandsons of Philip III and sons-in-law of Philip IV, and Leopold understandably wished to have his hands free to deal with the struggle ahead. England and Holland, horrified at the prospect of seeing France and Spain united under Louis, offer their mediation with the Sultan, Poland and Venice, on the assumption that they would retain the territories they had conquered, were only too pleased to lay down their arms after fifteen years of war, while Peter the Great had more than enough to do to drag his country out of the Middle Ages. The arrangements were quickly made, and on the 13th of November 1698 the various powers concerned met at Karlowitz in Hungary, 
now the Yugoslav town of Sremski Karlovci. The negotiations did not run as smoothly as had been expected, the representatives of the Sultan pointing out that their master, not having surrendered, saw no reason why he should be required to abandon all the territories now in Christian hands. In particular he had in mind certain of his Mediterranean possessions. Venice could have the Morea, he would make no difficulty about that. She could also retain Santa Mora on one side and Egina on the other, and a number of fortresses on the Dalmatian coast. He himself, however, was determined to keep Athens, Attica and all Greek territory north of the Gulf of Corinth. The Venetian representative, Carlo Rini, objected vehemently, but he received little support. The emperor, once he had been assured of Hungary and Transylvania, was anxious to get home as quickly as possible and let it be known to the Venetians that if they insisted on making difficulties, he would have no hesitation in concluding a separate peace. For a time the Republic continued to argue, and when the treaty was signed on 26 January 1699, she was not among the signatories. But at last wisdom triumphed over pride and on the 7th of February Doge Valier appended his seal. It was as well that he did so, for the Treaty of Karlowitz is the one diplomatic instrument above all others that marks the decline of Ottoman power, and Venice, which had directly confronted that power for longer than any other Christian state, had more right than any to be a party to it. On the other hand, her forced renunciation of an important part of her conquests was not just a blow to her self-respect, it made it considerably more difficult for her adequately to defend that part which remained. The Turks, it was true, had undertaken to demolish the fortifications of Lepanto and Preveza, but there was nothing to prevent them invading the Morea from Attica, or indeed anywhere along the northern shore of the Gulf of Corinth a point which they were to prove all too soon. Less than a year later, on the morning of Saturday, the 7th of July 1700, Dode Silvestro Valier died of a sudden apoplexy following an argument with his wife, and it was perhaps a feeling of partial responsibility for his death that led her to commission from the architect Andrea Tyrelli the immense Baroque tomb which occupies the entire fourth bay on the south side of SS. Giovanni e Paolo and in which he she and his father, Doge Butasai, are now enshrined. It is somehow fitting that this, the last and perhaps the most sumptuous of the great ducal tombs in all Venice, should have been reserved for the last Doge of the 17th century, for with Silvestro Valia's successor, Alvise Mokenigo II, the begins a new age, of elegance and restraint rather than grandiloquence and pomposity, a new age to match the opening of the new century before whose close the Republic itself was to pass into history. 44 Passeroids and Peace 1700-1780 Neil near Plus de Pyrenees. Louis XIV, on hearing of his grandson's inheritance of the Spanish crown the year 1700 saw the deaths of two reigning princes of Europe. That of the immensely able and intelligent Doge Silvestro Valia passed virtually unnoticed outside Italy that of the half with Charles II of Spain, on the other hand, flung the whole continent into chaos. Charles had first bequeathed his kingdom to the illustrious House of Austria, then, a month before his death, he had suddenly changed his will, leaving it instead to Philip of Anjou, grandson of Louis XIV. Louis lost no time in packing the young claimant off to Madrid to assume his throne without delay, he was right to do so for he was well aware that the Emperor Leopold would not accept this new dispensation without protest. What he could not have known was how long and how desperate the ensuing war would be, and what a price he would have to pay for his grandson's throne. The Emperor had two valuable allies, England and the Netherlands, where memories of Spanish oppression were still fresh. France for the moment had none, so King Louis hastily sent one of his most trusted advisers, Cardinal Caesar Distries, to Venice. Already, the Cardinal pointed out, imperial troops were marching through the Tyrol into Italy, bent on seizing the Milanese from Spain. If they were allowed to continue unchecked, all North Italy would be overrun, the territory of the Republic included. The only solution was an immediate Franco-Spanish-Venetian League. 
Venice could then block the passage of the Emperor, while France and Spain in return would protect Venetian interests wherever they were threatened, in the east, Dalmatia, Friuli or the archipelago, or in the west, where 30,000 men were already drawn up in the Dauphine, ready to march. Meanwhile an ambassador from Leopold, Count Lamberg, was describing in similarly horrific terms the consequences of allowing the French and Spanish crowns to be united in all but name, and painting an equally rosy picture of the blessings that could not but ensue from an imperial alliance. In the Senate, the Council of Ten, the Collegio, even in the Great Council, the Republic's proper line of action at so critical a moment was long and hotly debated. The final consensus of opinion was that neither of the two giants who were so assiduously cultivating her friendship could be trusted an inch. One a plague, Venice decided, on both their houses, she would opt for a position of armed neutrality. And so she did, somehow managing to maintain it, in the face of immense pressure from both sides, throughout the war which now broke out in all its fury. Whether she was right to do so is another of those questions that still divide historians today. The disadvantages were plain enough. She could not prevent the belligerents entering her mainland dominions or her home waters, indeed, for the next few years the whole of the Venetian mainland was one huge battlefield. Through the Vicentino, the Veronese and the Bressano, along the Adige, the Adda and the Mincio, the imperial armies of Prince Eugene of Savoy and the French forces under the Marshal de Catinator, later, the Dukes of Villarreal too and Vendome marched and counter-marched. In vain Venice addressed protests, admonitions and claims for compensation to Paris and Vienna, while herself facing continuous accusations from each side that she was favouring the other. In vain she sought to prevent the Austrians from shipping war material across from Therese and other imperial ports to the Bow Delta, or the French from sailing in strength up the Gulf, to attack and destroy the offending vessels at Kyogia and Malamaco and the gates of the lagoon itself, or the Anglo-Dutch fleet from presuming to police those waters which she still claimed as her own but was plainly unable to control. All these trials and humiliations were the inevitable consequences of the policy that Venice had freely chosen for herself, and several commentators, Venetian and foreign, have suggested that she would have done better to take a more positive line from the outset, not, perhaps, to declare categorically for one side or the other for in the event of an out-and-out victory of either of the two protagonists she could only have been the loser, but rather to have followed the example of Duke Victor Amadeus of Savoy, who fought for himself, supporting first the French, to avoid expulsion. And subsequently the Empire, changing sides when he felt like it and ending the war with his dominions actually increased. The French Napoleonic historian Darrow goes even further, maintaining that the Republic should have taken a more dominant attitude, inspiring all the princes of Italy with a noble resolution, placing itself at their head in such a way as to prevent the ravaging of that beautiful land by foreign intruders. But this, surely, is to misread the character of the time. Most of the peninsula was under foreign occupation. The Risorgimento, or anything remotely like it, was still far away. Even had it not been, Venice was the last quarter from which the necessary impetus would have come. She had never felt herself to be altogether a part of Italy. Although her feeling of Italianita had naturally been strengthened by the acquisition of an empire on terra firma, it was still by no means fully consolidated. Perhaps, indeed, it never would be, and in any case, the sort of man required to focus Italian ambitions, colourful, magnetic, fiery, a born orator and leader, was hardly likely to spring from the cautious and committee-ridden bosom of the most serene republic. As it happened, Venice was to emerge from the war of the Spanish succession remarkably unscathed. A series of French defeats, together with the shift of the epicenter of the war towards the north, where Marlborough was rapidly creating his own legend, meant that after the first four or five years the Veneto was left in comparative peace. Venice was consequently able in March 1709, in a way that no other European state could have considered at such a time, to give a characteristically lavish welcome to King Frederick IV of Denmark, 
despite being in the grip of the most savage winter in her history, when the whole lagoon froze over and people walked to Mester and Fusina over the ice. The excitement, or perhaps the winter, seems to have been too much for the doge, who died two months later. One, one of his last official acts was to inform the French ambassador that the Republic would be happy to accept King Louis's invitation to mediate between France and her enemies, and one of the first decisions of his successor. Giovanni Corner II, was to send a shrewd and experienced diplomatist, Sebastiano Foscarini, to the Hague, where he did his best to negotiate a peace. But the coalition, with a succession of splendid victories behind it, offered terms so humiliating that Louis rejected them out of hand and resolved to continue the struggle, only after another three years, years which saw the bitterest fighting of the entire war and, at Malplaquet, the bloodiest battle. Did the exhausted combatants, together with Venice and Savoy, finally assemble at Utrecht, where the map of Europe was redrawn? The territory of Venice, as a neutral power, was preserved intact, without gains or losses, but her ambassador, Carlo Reni, was much impressed by the honours accorded him, not least by the other Italian powers, who, though they had no seat at the conference table, had all sent observers and, he proudly reported, Unanimously recognized Venice as la principale potenza e protectrice d'Italia dash the principal power and protectress of Italy. When that whole series of international agreements collectively known as the Treaty of Utrecht was signed during the first four months of 1713, Venice had been in possession of the Morea for just over a quarter of a century. Her new experiment in empire had not been a success. The years of Turkish occupation that had preceded the reconquest had reduced a once prosperous land to a place of poverty and desolation, all too soon the Venetians had realized that the task of administration would be not only expensive but largely thankless. The downtrodden local populations, their patriotism nurtured and sanctified as always by the orthodox clergy dreamed of a nationhood of their own and saw little advantage in having their infidel overlords replaced by Christian schismatics who showed no greater sympathy with their aspirations. The establishment of Latin bishoprics aroused still further resentment. Finally, there was the question of defence. In former days, when the Venetian presence was confined to a few important commercial colonies and garrison towns, this presented few problems. But how could nearly a thousand miles of serrated coastline be made safe from invaders? Even such new defences as were deemed indispensable, like the lowering fortress of Acrocorinth, still today one of the most impressive examples of Venetian military architecture, served only to antagonise still further the local inhabitants, by whose taxes it was paid for and by whose conscript labour it was built. No wonder that when Turkish troops appeared once again on the soil of the Peloponnese, they were welcomed as liberators. The fact remained that, to every Venetian, the Morea stood as a monument to the Republic's last great burst of military glory, and there was consternation on the Rialto when, in December 1714, the Ottoman Grand Vizier summoned the Venetian Bailo at Constantinople, Andrea Memo, to inform him that, in consequence of certain recent incidents in Montenegro and the interception of a Turkish ship in the Adriatic, his master had decided to declare war. The transparency of the excuse served only to confirm suspicions that the real object of the Sultan, or, more accurately, of the Grand Vizier himself, whose belligerent disposition appeared in marked contrast to that of the peace-loving Ahmed III, was to regain the Morea. Once again Venice appealed to the states of Europe for assistance, once again she obtained the usual dusty answer, apart from the offer of a galley or two from the Pope and the Knights of Malta. The visa, Damod Ali, had planned a combined operation in which a land force would march down through Thessaly while a fleet would sail simultaneously southwest through the Aegean, and in the course of the summer of 1715 both prongs of the attack scored success after success. By the time the fleet reached its destination it had already forced the surrender of Tainos, whose grave and commander, Bernardo Balbi, was condemned to life imprisonment when he returned to Venice, and of Aegina, while the army captured Corinth after a five-day siege. Norplia followed, then Modun and Corone, then Malvasia, 
then the island of Scythera. Meanwhile the Turks in Crete, encouraged by reports of their compatriots' success, had attacked and seized the last remaining Venetian outposts at Suda and Spinalunga, comma one whose inhabitants, relying as they did on Turkish treaty obligations for their survival, had no alternative to surrender. By the end of 1715, with Crete and the Morea both lost and all the great victories of Francesco Morosini set at naught after a few disastrous months, the Turks were once again at the gates of the Adriatic. For Venice, only one bulwark remained, Corfu. The Turkish army which, early in 1716, the Grand Vizier flung against the citadel of Corfu consisted of 30,000 infantry and some 3,000 horse. For the Venetians, estimates stiffer, they were certainly outnumbered. But in siege warfare comparative strengths are less important, what counts is the sophistication of offensive and defensive techniques. And here Venice could count on the knowledge and skill of one of the leading soldiers of his day, Marshal Matthias Johann von der Schulenberg. He had fought under Marlborough at Audenard and Malplaquet. then after the peace had sought service with the Republic. He had spent much of the winter improving the fortifications of Corfu, and though he was unable to prevent the Turkish army from disembarking, he was now able to confront it with a defensive system far superior to anything it had previously encountered. All through the heat of the summer the siege continued. Early in August, however, there arrived reports that gave new encouragement to the defenders and must have struck gloom into Turkish hearts. Venice had concluded an alliance with the Empire, the latter had entered the war. The almost legendary Prince Eugene was once again on the march. He had routed a Turkish army, appropriately enough at Karlowitz, the very town where, eighteen years before, the Turks had signed that treaty which they had now so shamefully broken, and shortly afterwards had gained a still more crushing victory at Peterwood where he had killed 20,000 of the enemy and seized 200 of their guns at the expense of fewer than 3,000 of his own men. This unexpected necessity of fighting on two fronts at once probably suggested to the Turkish commander that if he could not take Corfu quickly he would be unlikely to take it at all. On the night of the 18th of August he ordered a general assault, to the accompaniment, as always, of an ear-splitting din of drums, trumpets rifle and cannon fire and hideous shrieks and war cries, psychological warfare of a primitive but by no means ineffectual kind. Schulenberg and his prove editor General Antonio Lorden were instantly at their posts, summoning every able-bodied corfiat, women and children, the old and infirm, priests and monks alike, to the defences. After six hours the fighting was still desperate, with neither side gaining an obvious advantage, and Schulenberg decided to stay call on a sudden sortie. At the head of 800 picked men, he slipped out of a small postern and fell on the Turkish flank from the rear. The success was immediate, and decisive. The Turks were taken utterly by surprise and fled, leaving rifles and ammunition behind them, while their colleagues along other sections of the wall, bewildered and mystified, saw that the assault had failed and also retired though in better order. The next night, as if to consolidate the Venetian triumph, a storm broke, a storm of such violence and fury that within hours the Turkish camp was reduced to a quagmire, the trenches turned to canals, the tents torn to ribbons or, their guy ropes snapped like thread, lifted bodily into the air and carried off by the gale. In the roadstead, many of the Turkish ships, similarly driven from their moorings, crashed into each other, splintering like matchwood. When dawn broke and the full extent of the damage was revealed, there were few indeed of the erstwhile besiegers who wished to remain another moment on an island where the very gods seemed to be against them, and indeed within a matter of days orders reached the Turkish camp to return at once. Corfu was saved, Schulenberg was awarded a jeweled sword, a life pension of 5,000 ducats and the honour of a statue erected in his lifetime in the old fortress semicolon one and the Turks withdrew, never again to seek to enlarge their empire at the expense of Christian Europe. It had been more than the raising of a siege, it had been a victory, and its effect on Venetian morale was enormous. 
That winter the Arsenal Otti worked night and day, and early the following spring a new fleet of 27 sail set out from Zante for the Dardanelles under the command of a brilliant young admiral, Ludovico Flangini. On 12 June 1717 it met the Turks head-on, and after a battle that lasted several days it won a splendid victory, marred only by the death of Flangini, who, mortally wounded by an arrow, insisted on being carried up onto his quarter-deck to watch, through glazing eyes, the last stages of the conflict. A month later, off Cape Matapan, the Ottoman fleet was again beaten and put to flight, this time by Andrea Pisani who, turning northward, was able to recapture both Prevezo and Vanitsa before the coming of winter. In Dalmatia, Alvise Mokenigo was reporting similar victories. By then, too, Prince Eugene had reoccupied the all-important river fortress of Belgrade and the Turks were retreating on all fronts. Had the war continued another season and the Venetians managed to sustain their momentum, the Morea might well have been theirs once more though whether this would have been in their long-term interest is open to doubt. But the Turks, predictably enough, decided to sue for peace, and it was now that Venice was to discover how ill-advised she had been to conclude her Austrian alliance. The empire, faced with new threats from Spain, was anxious to reach a quick settlement and paid little heed to Venice's territorial claims on the entirely spurious grounds that the victory of Corfu and the subsequent upsurge of Venetian fortunes were the direct results of Prince Eugene's victory at Peterwood. When, therefore, the parties met in May 1718 at Passaroitz, together with representatives of England and Holland as mediators, the Venetian envoy, Carlo Reini, despite his diplomatic experience at Karlowitz and Utrecht, found that he could make little impression on his colleagues. For six hours he pleaded, calling for the restitution to Venice of Suda and Spinalunga, of Tainos, Scythera and the Morea, or, in default of this last, an extension of Venetian territory in Albania as far south as Scutari and Dulcino, a pirate stronghold which she was eager to eliminate. Unfortunately, However, his speech coincided with the arrival of a report that 18,000 Spanish troops had just landed on the Austrian-held island of Sardinia, and he was overruled. Venice had to be content with Scythera, Butrinto, Preveso and Venitsa, together with a few additional frontier fortresses in Dalmatia, where, however, she was obliged to allow free Turkish communications with Ragusa. It was a meager reward indeed for the efforts and expense of the past four years, for the heroism of Schulenberg, Flangini and the rest. At Passaroitz the frontiers of the Venetian Empire, such as it was, were drawn for the last time. There would be no more gains, or losses, or exchanges. It may therefore be a good moment to outline those frontiers here. Apart from the historic city and the towns and islands of the lagoon, the empire included, on terra firma, the provinces of Bergamo, Brescia, Cremona, Verona, Vicenza, the pole scene of Rovigo and the March of Treviso, including Felta, Bono and Cador. Around the Gulf, it embraced Friuli, then Istria and Dalmatia with its dependent islands, then northern Albania, including Cataro, Cota, Butrinto, Parga, Preveso and Venitsa then the Ionian islands of Corfu, Paxos and Antipaxos, Santa Mora, Lucas, Cephalonia, Ithaca, Zante and the Strophades, and finally, south of the Morea, the island of Scythera. That was all. The treaty was signed on 21 July 1718. Two months later to the day, in another of those terrifying summer storms, a bolt of lightning struck the powder magazine in the old fortress of Corfu. The explosion ignited three other smaller ammunition stores, and the citadel was virtually destroyed. The governor's palace in particular was reduced to rubble, killing the captain general and several of his staff. Nature, in the space of a split second, had achieved more than the combined Turkish forces in several months, the futility of the recent war was more than ever underlined. And yet, amid all the lamentations when the news reached Venice, there could also be heard the still, small voice of the optimist. What if that other great tempest of two years before had had the same result? Perhaps, 
Despite outward appearances, the Almighty was on the side of Venice after all. Before long, moreover, the optimist had been joined by another, the political realist, who saw that the age of imperial greatness was past, that Morosini's conquests had given Venice nothing but trouble and that she was better off without them. The Treaty of Passeroitz, inglorious as it may have appeared, settled her differences with the Turks and proclaimed eternal friendship with Habsburg Austria, the only other power which might have posed a serious political threat. The result was peace, peace which was to last the best part of a century, until the coming of Napoleon brought the Republic itself to an end. 45 The 18th century 1718 to 1789 As for Venice and its people, merely born to bloom and drop, here on earth they bore their fruitage, mirth and folly were the crop what of soul was left, I wonder, when the kissing had to stop. Browning, at the Carter of Galapisisi Finitis to Ia de Venice, wrote Count Paul Daru, when he reached this point in his own monumental work on the subject, completed in 1821, and, despite the three massive volumes still to come, he was not very far wrong. She is reduced, he continued, to a passive existence. She has no more wars to sustain, pieces to conclude, or desires to express. A mere spectator of events, in her determination to take no part in events, she pretends to take no interest in them. Isolated amid her fellow nations, imperturbable in her indifference, blind to her own interests, insensible to insults, she sacrifices all to the single object of giving no offence to other states, and to preserve a lasting peace. Daru, an old companion in arms of Napoleon who had distinguished himself in the retreat from Moscow before becoming a pillar of the Académie Française, makes little effort to conceal his disgust at so craven a policy. Nowadays, one suspects, most of us would be inclined to take a more favorable view, and readers of this book finding no fewer than seventy years covered in a single chapter, will doubtless be swift to rejoice. Yet there is always something sad in the spectacle of departed greatness, and entrancing as we may find all the paintings of the Vedutisti and the descriptions that have come down to us of Venice in the Sitsento, it is impossible to close our eyes to the fact that a city that was once the unchallenged mistress of the Mediterranean, to say nothing of a quarter and half a quarter of the Roman Empire dash could now no longer control the approaches to her own lagoon or that a people famous for centuries as the most skillful seamen, the shrewdest and most courageous merchant adventurers of their time, were now better known for their prowess as cheapskates and intriguers, gamblers and pimps. The political history of the most serene republic after the peace of Passeroids can consequently be told in a very few pages. Doges come and go, but the salient features of their reigns tend to be less often things that they did than things that they managed not to do, the wars they avoided, the alliances they escaped, the responsibilities they ignored. The historian is thus constrained, in sheer self-defense, to alter his technique, to abandon, at least in part, the strictly chronological approach in favor of something more episodic, and to try to analyze Venice's political and moral decline by examining its symptoms rather than by recording any day-to-day -day progress of events. He also finds himself able, more than in any previous chapters, to confine his attention to the domestic front, since for Venice in the 18th century, just as for Switzerland throughout the ages, foreign affairs scarcely seem to exist. On the other hand, he can afford to stray a little more widely into fields other than the strictly political, and, as he does so, he comes upon a curious and unexpected phenomenon, that for the greater part of the century, so generally castigated as one of demoralization and decay on all fronts, Venice was enjoying a period of unusual commercial prosperity and economic growth. Suddenly, he pulls himself up short. Perhaps, after all, he has been over hasty in his judgment. How important is it to be a great power of Europe, or even a capital of empire? Is the pursuit of pleasure, which creates much that is beautiful and harms nobody, really more reprehensible than the pursuit of wealth, territory or military glory, which kills thousands and devastates and destroys wholesale? Eighty years of peace is, in itself, no small tribute to wise government and successful diplomacy. 
It was a period, moreover, when the average citizen seems to have been no less happy or contented than in former times, when, if the economy was not invariably booming, there were at least no wars to pay for, when the arts flourished, painting in particular having risen up from its say I sent Onadia to celebrate once again the age-old Venetian love of color and light, and a city of some 160,000 inhabitants could boast no fewer than seven full-time opera houses, to say nothing of the theatres, where the Commedia dell'arte was slowly giving place to the more sophisticated comedies of Venice's best-loved writer, Carlo Goldney. Throughout the century hundreds, perhaps thousands, of the most cultivated and civilized men and women of Europe poured into the city every year, they cannot all have been wrong. On Ascension Day, Thursday, the 3rd of May 1722, just as Doge Giovanni Corner was stepping aboard the Buse Center for the annual marriage of the sea, he stumbled and the Corno slipped from his head. The incident was made light of by those around him, but he himself was much distressed, it was, he said, a sign from heaven. He died on the 12th of August, and was buried in his family chapel in S. Niccolò di Tolentino, and on the 24th he was succeeded, confusingly enough, by yet another Alvise Mokenigo, the third of that name to rise to the supreme dignity. One Mokenigo had distinguished himself both as a soldier in Dalmatia and as a diplomat, in which capacity he had spent two years in those long, involved discussions on infinitesimal points of interpretation which were part and parcel of any peace treaty with the Turks. On his accession to the doge ship he made the city a charming present, the two porphyry lions that give their name to the Piazzetta di Lianzini just to the north of the Basilica, and have afforded endless pleasure to the children of Venice for over 250 years. By now Venice had acquired that aspect familiar to us through the paintings of the great vedutisti, Antonio Canal, called Canletto, his successor Francesco Gardi, his nephew Bernardo Bellotto and their followers, and the masters of genre like Pietro Longia and Domenico Tiepolo. It was the age of the Grand Tour, the age, indeed, when tourism might be said to have been invented, when not only young English noblemen but the whole aristocracy of Europe was, at some time or another, to be seen in the loveliest and most magical of all cities. It was the age, too, of the carnival still the most protracted and abandoned in Europe, the mandatory masks providing all the anonymity that could be desired. The Council of Ten, the Inquisitors of State and the secret police were no longer feared as they had been a century before. To give but one example, in 1718 the Inquisitors employed a staff of only three, half a century later that figure had been reduced to one. Meanwhile, the gambling was the most smoothly organized, the stakes the highest anywhere, the courtesans were the loveliest and the most elegant, catering for every taste, able to satisfy the most fastidious and exacting of clients. For those visitors of more intellectual proclivities, there were books, pictures and sculptures to be bought, churches and palaces to be wondered at and the music and opera for which Venice was famous throughout the civilized world. By the early 18th century the center of Venetian musical life had moved from St. Mark's, where both Giovanni Gabrielli and Claudio Monteverdi had been organists a hundred years before, to four orphanages for female foundlings, the Pietà, the Incurabili, the Mendicanti and the Ospedalito. At the first of these, from 1703 until shortly before his death in 1741, the maestro di cappella was Antonio Vivaldi. One at the second, orchestra and choir were under the direction of Baldas Air Galuppi, immortalized by Browning, even if his own music is nowadays largely forgotten. Two, but not all of the foremost Venetian musicians of the age were even full time professionals. Tommaso Albinoni was a rich paper merchant of the city, Benedetto Marcello was a lawyer a member of the Quarantia and a one-time prove editor in Pola. In all branches of the arts except music, the foremost collector and connoisseur was an Englishman, Joseph Smith. He had settled in Venice in 1700, and remained one of its most distinguished foreign residents until his death, at the age of 88, 70 years later. 
For the last thirty of those years he lived in the palace on the corner of the Grand Canal and the Rio de Santi Apostoli which he had had specially redesigned and rebuilt for him by the architect Antonio Vizentini semicolon 3 This rapidly became a treasure house, filled to overflowing with Smith's ever-increasing collections of paintings and sculptures, coins and medals, drawings and cameos, books and prints. Apart from these personal collections, there were always additional works by his principal protégés, Antonio Canaletto, the brothers Marco and Sebastiano Ricci, Francesco Zuccali and that superb portraitist in pastel, Rosalba Carriera, for all of whom he acted as chief agent and go-between with their patrons among the English nobility. Of these by far the most important was Canaletto, whom Smith probably first met through Vizentini in the early 1720s. Every rich English visitor longed for at least one picture of the city to remind him of one of the most remarkable experiences of his lifetime, no other painter was so well able to provide what he wanted, and Smith soon made himself indispensable to the artist and his patrons alike. It is largely thanks to him that virtually all the master's best work is in England, Venice possesses scarcely a single canvas and that Canaletto's ten-year stay in London should have been so conspicuously successful. No wonder that, when he himself briefly took up the art of engraving, he should have dedicated his only published collection of prints to Joseph Smith. But we are indebted to Consul Smith, he was appointed British Consul in the city in 1744, for a good deal more than Canaletto's. In 1762 he sold his complete collections to George III for £20,000 – the most spectacular acquisition by an English royal collector, writes Sir Oliver Miller, one since Charles I's agent had brought off his coup in Mancha in the 1620s. Three years later the king followed this tremendous purchase with another, that of Smith's entire library, bought N block for £10,000. It forms the nucleus of the King's Library, now in the British Museum. Even this did not, however, mark the end of Smith's collecting career, he immediately began amassing new treasures, and after his death in 1770 the sale of his new library alone occupied 13 days. Dojalvis Mokenigo III, he is sometimes called by his middle name of Sebastiano, to distinguish him from his innumerable namesakes was succeeded in 1732 by the 78-year-old veteran diplomat Carlo Rini, and his death three years later left the throne free for Alvise Pisani, a member of what was by now the richest family of Venice, owner not only of the immense and sumptuous Palazzo Pisani, now the Conservatory of Music, at S. Stefano but also of the still grander Villa Pisani at Stra on the Brenta. The new doge brother of the Dandria Pishani who had distinguished himself at Prevesu and elsewhere in the last phase of the Turkish war, had himself served as Venetian ambassador to the court of Queen Anne, where he had impressed all London by the splendour of his retinue, on his election as Doge on 17 January 1735 he and his family financed, despite the season, three days of celebrations on a scale which was generally held to be unprecedented, even in Venice. The Arsenalotti who by tradition carried him round the piazza were ordered to go especially slowly, to allow more time for the scattering of our Jess, during the three following nights. The entire square was illuminated all in Galise, with set pieces that changed every night, and on the last night of the three, on every column of the Procurati buildings along each side, outsize wax candles revealed huge representations of the Pisani coat of arms while at the ends the entire facades of the Basilica and the Church of S. Gemini Anno II were lit with thousands of flaming torches. And yet, however dazzling his outward magnificence, Alvise Pisani strove, just as his two immediate predecessors had striven before him, to maintain for the Republic the lowest possible profile on the international stage. Their task was far from easy, Europe was still a battleground. In Italy alone, the extinction of two ruling houses in quick succession, the Farnese in Parma and the Medici in Tuscany, brought about a new confrontation between Spain and Austria, and the tension was still further increased by the dispute over the claim of Louis XV's father-in-law, 
Stanislaus Leszczynski, to the throne of Poland. By 1733 most of the continent was again at war, and though an uneasy peace was re-established in 1735, it was only another six years before the succession of Maria Theresa to the throne of Austria, on the death of her father Charles Vi once again set the princes of Europe at each other's throats. That Venice somehow contrived to preserve her neutrality through all these upheavals, successfully withstanding the formidable pressures, diplomatic, economic and even military, which were brought to bear in efforts to persuade her to declare herself on one side or another, was an extraordinary achievement, every bit as remarkable as many more glorious aspects of her past on which she looked back with justifiable pride. Around her, the face of Italy was changing as quickly and as kaleidoscopically as ever it had, yet there she remained, the still centre of the whirlpool, seeming barely conscious of the turmoil. There was, inevitably, the occasional heavy price to be paid, warring armies are poor respecters of national frontiers, especially when they know that those frontiers will not be actively defended, and more than once the Republic had to suffer the indignity of invasion, with the consequent devastation of farms and villages unfortunate enough to stand along the line of advance of one army or another in the city itself, however, pleasure continued to reign supreme, and it took more than a European war to stop that ceaseless flow of visitors that had by now become Venice's lifeblood. This determined neutrality had another serious consequence, it encouraged Venice to neglect her war fleet. Perhaps, indeed, it might be more true to say that the state of this fleet was at least a contributory cause of her neutrality, for the appearance of ships from northern nations in the Adriatic during the War of the Spanish Succession had at last brought her face to face with the disagreeable fact that she had long been trying, with increasing lack of success, to ignore. In the art of shipbuilding, in which she had once led the world, she was by now hopelessly out of date. Already in the first half of the 15th century, Venice had abandoned the old Ord galley in her merchant fleet. The new, foreign built round, that is broader beamed, sailing ships were not only more economical, since they had far larger capacity and did not require huge crews of rowers, in those days always free men, who, in their turn, needed food, water, and regular periods of rest ashore. They were also more easily defended, since weight was a secondary consideration and they could mount heavy cannon on board. Unlike the northern and Atlantic nations, however, Venice continued to favor the galley as the basis of her war navy, confining her own shipbuilding activities entirely to the old models. On the face of it, there were good reasons for this decision, the galleys were more maneuverable, especially in shallow Adriatic waters, since they were not at the mercy of the weather their speed and performance could be more accurately predicted, as for their shortness of range, this was of little importance at a time when the Republic still possessed any number of supplely bases in the eastern Mediterranean. Round ships, on the other hand, were infinitely more expensive to build and to equip, particularly for Venice, suffering as she did from a chronic shortage of timber, both for the ships themselves and as fuel for the cannon foundries. Ship's cannon, she told herself, was anyway of less value in the narrow waters of the Mediterranean, inaccurate at the best of times, it was no match for stable shore batteries. If the supply of heavy firepower was limited, it was to these batteries that priority should be given. Fortunately for her, the Turks felt much the same way, and for as long as she had no other serious adversary to fight at sea, there was little incentive for her to revolutionize the arsenal to throw out all the old machinery and equipment, the old skills and techniques, to embark on new and prodigiously expensive programs fraught with problems and difficulties of which she had no clear understanding or certainty of solution. This explains how, as late as 1571, a battle on the scale of Lepanto could still be fought between oared galleys, a battle inconceivable at such a date in northern waters, relying as it did on vessels and tactics a good deal closer to those used at Salamis, two thousand years before, than to those of Drake and the Spanish Armada seventeen years later. Meanwhile, however, the shipwrights of England, France, Holland and Spain were moving rapidly ahead, 
developing new galleons whose improved systems of sails and rigging enabled them to beat against the wind and whose heavy cannon now sunk well below decks, increased their stability rather than the reverse. Equally well suited for military or commercial use, these were the ships that had dominated the Mediterranean from the beginning of the 17th century, capturing more and more of the carrying trade from Venice. Thus it was that the old-fashioned round merchantmen of the Republic, slower and far more vulnerable, became the preferred targets of the Barbary pirates and, obliged to sail only under escort and to pay hideous sums for insurance, effectively priced themselves out of the market. From about 1650 onwards Venice had done her best to catch up. At first she had tended to buy or hire English or Dutch ships as the need arose. Several galleons had been used in the later stages of the Cretan War, though they had still been treated, like the galleases that had succeeded so well at Lepanto, as little more than floating gun platforms, being towed into position by one or more galleys before letting off their broadsides. But it was only in 1667 that she began building her own ships of the line in the arsenal, using an imported English vessel as a model and as late as 1695, when a Venetian captain general suggested using one of the new type galleons as his flagship, he was refused permission. The fact of the matter was that although by the turn of the century Venice had amassed a small fleet of relatively modern warships of her own manufacture, she never felt really happy or confident with them. Even in the victories of Flangini and Andrea Pisciani of 1717, Ord galleys constituted at least half her fleet. And by then there was yet another unpalatable truth to be faced. Venice had lost her lordship of the Adriatic, a loss perfectly and poignantly symbolized in 1702 when the activities of the French around the borders of the lagoon caused the cancellation of the annual Ascension Day wedding of the sea. From that time on, English, French, Dutch, Austrian, and even Russian warships made free of the entire Gulf ignoring Venetian protests, which, indeed, grew fewer and fewer as the Republic gradually came to terms with reality. Where commercial shipping was concerned, the position was, if anything, more humiliating still. In the Middle Ages all foreign merchantmen entering the Adriatic had been obliged to bring their cargoes to Venice, where they would then be transshipped as necessary. Later these rules had been relaxed, instead, Venetian patrols had levied customs dues on all cargoes bound for other ports, and had ensured that other regulations concerning tariffs, quarantine and, most important, the traditional state monopoly on salt were properly observed. Now those merchantmen, faster and better equipped than the patrols, could afford to laugh at such attempts to control their activities, sailing unmolested to Imperial Trieste, to Papal Ancona or indeed to any other port they chose. It was only in 1756, under Alvise Pisani, that Venice took active steps to remedy the situation. By then the government's insistence that all Venetian merchantmen in the eastern Mediterranean should sail in convoys to protect themselves from the Barbary pirates had proved a failure. Ship owners often had to wait months before a convoy could be gathered together, when it did leave its speed was restricted to that of its slowest ship, and when it arrived the resultant sudden glut of goods had a disastrous effect on prices. Henceforth, any ship more than 70 feet in length with a minimum number of 40 men on board and 24 guns was permitted to sail unescorted. This proved reasonably successful, leading to an immediate shipbuilding boom at the arsenal in response to the demand for more vessels of the required design. In consequence, trade expanded to the east and, especially during those periods of European war when Venice could offer the advantage of a neutral flag, to the west also, but the Barbary pirates, themselves no sluggards where developments in ship design were concerned, remained a threat for another twenty years until the Republic swallowed still more of her pride and frankly bought them off. Even then, as we shall see, the problem was not entirely solved. The Republic nonetheless succeeded, in the last thirty years of its existence, 
in almost doubling its commercial tonnage, in 1794 there were no fewer than 309 Venetian merchantmen listed on the state register. Simultaneously with the increase in shipbuilding, there was a dramatic upsurge in the transit trade. In the early years of the century, this had declined sharply particularly after the emperor declared Trieste a free port in 1719 and the pope did the same for Ancona 13 years later. But as part of the reform of 1736 Venice abandoned her old protectionist policy and before long the Rialto was as popular with foreign merchants as it had ever been. True, the cargoes tended to be less exotic than in former days. The spice trade had been lost to the Dutch as early as 1600. With the founding of the Dutch East India Company, Venice now dealt mainly in domestic, or at least local Adriatic, commodities, wine, olive oil, sulphur, salt, raisins and currants from the Ionian Islands. But the money flowed in, in 1782 it was found necessary to broaden the river eastward from the prisons to allow more space for the unloading of merchandise semicolon 1 and according to the leading modern authority on the Venetian economy 2 it seems likely that the total tonnage moving through the port of Venice was larger in 1783 than ever before in the thousand years of the city's history. On the 17th of June 1741, a few months after the outbreak of the War of the Austrian Succession, Doge Alvis Pisani was being treated by his doctor for an infected sore on his leg when he suffered a sudden stroke and died almost at once. He was succeeded by Pietro Grimani, a man of wide learning and, incidentally, the only doge who was also a fellow of the Royal Society having been proposed for membership while ambassador to London in 1712 by the society's president, Sir Isaac Newton. Three like those of his three predecessors, his reign too was peaceful and politically uneventful, which is a good deal more than can be said of any of his contemporary rulers. It was, however, marked by the final disappearance of an institution that had been part of Venetian history longer even than the doge ship itself the Patriarchate of Aquileia. Although during recent centuries the Patriarch of Aquileia had no longer been the pest that he was in earlier times, he had remained something of a problem since his free ill and sea was more or less bisected by the Venetian, Austrian frontier. It had accordingly long ago been agreed that successive Patriarchs should be appointed by each state alternately, but Venice had chosen to ignore this ruling from the first. The Venetian patriarch at the time had named a coadjutor, who had automatically succeeded him on his death, and the practice had continued unchecked with the patriarchal throne passing smoothly and uninterruptedly from one Venetian to the next, despite occasional protests on the part of Austria. But now Maria Theresa put her foot down and appealed to Pope Benedict XIV who thereupon proposed that the old system be discontinued and that the sea should be divided, the Patriarch would have authority only over the part which lay within the frontiers of the Republic, which he would administer from a new residence at Udine, the rest, which fell within Austrian territory, would be placed under the jurisdiction of an apostolic vicar. It was a sensible enough suggestion, but Venice, reluctant to accept the loss of the ecclesiastical authority she had formerly enjoyed in Austrian territory, voiced strong objections. The Pope mildly replied that he had only been trying to satisfy both parties in the dispute, if the solution he had recommended was not acceptable, they had better argue one out for themselves. For a while the question threatened to have serious consequences for the relations between Empire and Republic, at last, however, both agreed to accept the mediation of the Court of Turin, and it was King Charles Emmanuel III of Sardinia I who decided the final dispensation the Patriarchate would be suppressed altogether and replaced by two separate bishoprics, one Venetian and one Austrian, Atudine and Gorizia respectively. Venice saw that she would have done better to accept Pope Benedict's proposal, but it was too late now. She could only bow to the inevitable, and the Patriarchate of Aquileia, after 1200 years, passed into history, a problem to the last dot the Pope had shown himself to be reasonably accommodating in the matter of Aquileia, he proved a good deal less so in 1754 when Francesco Lorden, who had succeeded Pietro Grimani as doge two years before, 
appended his seal to a strongly worded edict which condemned the ease and frequency with which Venetian citizens, through ignorance, without discernment and perhaps even for reasons of malice, were making application to Rome for indulgences, special dispensations and privileges, with prejudice to the interests of the state. In future, the edict continued, such documents would be considered null and void unless they were obtained in the approved manner and officially confirmed by the government of the Republic. To Pope Benedict, the tone of this proclamation was as objectionable as its content. He sent the Doge an indignant message of protest, refusing to accept the somewhat half-hearted attempts by the Senate in Venice and the Venetian ambassador in Rome to placate him. As relations grew steadily more tense, Maria Theresa and Louis XV both intervened on the papal side, and there is no telling how the dispute might have ended if Benedict had not died in 1758, to be succeeded, through a stroke of rare good fortune, by a Venetian, Carlo Rezzonico, who took the name of Clement XIII with the accession of this fifth, and last, citizen of the Republic to the throne of St. Peter I. The difficulties faded away as if by magic. The event was marked with characteristically splendid celebrations throughout the city, and no fewer than eight special ambassadors were nominated to carry official congratulations to the new pontiff, who immediately sat down and wrote a letter in his own hand, beseeching the Serenissima by its own sovereign authority to withdraw the offending edict. Anyone, he added, would be doing us a grave injustice were he to suppose that we should make any request of our motherland the granting of which would do it anything but honour. Such conciliatory terms as these offered the Senate a perfect opportunity to yield without loss of face, and the seal was set on the new friendship when, in 1759, Pope Clement sent Doge Lord in that most precious token of his special favour, the Golden Rose. If However, the Pope intended this coruscating award to be an encouragement to tread the paths of righteousness in future, he was due for a disappointment. In 1767 a special commission reported that the total revenue of the Church within the territory of the Republic, excluding casual contributions, amounted to over eight and a half million ducats. It had received in addition, over the previous ten years alone, bequests totaling nearly two and a half million. The government did not hesitate. On September of that same year it decreed the suppression of 127 monasteries and convents, and the sale of their property for the benefit of the state. Thus, at a single stroke, the exchequer was enriched by some three million ducats and the monastic population reduced from 5,798 to 3,270. It would have been pleasant to record, at this point, that the rose was returned to Rome, but such gestures are not the way of governments, and the Serenissima was, alas, no exception. The people of Venice, following their ruler's example, were now enjoying the most godless age in all their history. The Republic, to be sure, had never shown the degree of spiritual fervor, not to say fanaticism, manifested at one period or another by most of its neighbors, in Italy and beyond. Alone of all the states of Catholic Europe, it had never burned a heretic. We have seen how, even in the two previous centuries when much of Europe was torn to shreds by religious strife, Venice had alone maintained that moderate, humanist outlook which had sprung from the Renaissance and which must have seemed oddly out of place, even old-fashioned, in the world of the Counter-Reformation. She had allowed the Greek Orthodox community a church of their own, s. Giorgio de Grisi, consecrated in 1561, the Jews their synagogues in the ghetto, the Muslims their mosque in the Fondaco de Turchi. In 1707 the Armenians had established their monastery on the island of S. Lazaro. Thus she had acquired a reputation for tolerance which had in its turn made her a center both for enlightened liberal thought and, through her printing houses, for its dissemination, and giving her university at Padua, for there was none within the lagoon, a prestige unrivaled in Europe. Now the wheel had come full circle. The religious wars had burnt themselves out, Western civilization had returned once again to its senses, and most of those values for which the Republic had always stood were enthusiastically adopted by the Age of Reason. But by this time Venice had gone further still. 
If we examine the list of doges who reigned during the hundred years from 1675 to 1775, we cannot help noticing an extraordinary fact, out of a total of 14, only 4 were ever married. One, And there is something else, more extraordinary still, that if we then turn our attention not just to the doges but to the Venetian aristocracy as a whole, much the same pattern is revealed. There was nothing new in this strange tendency towards celibacy. It has been calculated that, as early as the 16th century, 51% of noble Venetians remained unmarried, in the 17th century this figure rose to 60%, in the 18th to 66%. Two, the underlying philosophy is clear. The family must continue, and it must continue rich. One son, often the youngest, was therefore acquired to marry, and to beget enough legitimate male heirs to ensure the first of these requirements, the other sons would remain single, or at least childless, thus, by preventing the dispersal of wealth, fulfilling the second. This enforced bachelorhood may well have accounted for the number of professional courtesans in Venice, as opposed to the regiments of whores that are part and parcel of any flourishing seaport long before its emergence as the pleasure capital of Europe. It certainly explains the quantity of orphanages dash and of convents, since it was on the upper class girlhood of the city that the blow fell hardest. To the two noble girls in every three who failed to find husbands, the proportion was actually rather higher, since impoverished aristocrats often took their wives from the wealthier bourgeoisie, no other way of life was open but to take the veil. It is small wonder that many of these convents enjoyed a reputation for licentiousness barely surpassed by that of the gambling houses and ridotti, though it is less often remembered that, like the orphanages, there were often centers of Venetian musical life as well. For a lady fortunate enough to marry, life was agreeable indeed. Before long she would have acquired for herself a Sisisbio, that specifically Venetian breed, a cavalier servanty but with more than a touch of the gigolo from whom she would appear practically inseparable, while her older and busier husband would make only comparatively rare appearances at her side. The Sisisbio might or might not be her lover, he would have plenty of opportunities to be, if so required, but this was by no means an invariable rule. Affairs in Venice did not always end up in bed. Casanova's memoirs give that impression, admittedly, but Casanova was an inveterate burster. Besides, he records a similar measure of success in Vienna, Paris and London. In any case, the Sisisbio possessed, from his lady's point of view, the great advantage of disposability, husbands might be in short supply. But with so many young bachelors to choose from, the alternative was cheap indeed. Yet husbands, and wives, were disposable too. One of the aspects of Venetian life that most shocked visitors to the city was the frequency with which marriages were annulled, and the apparent simplicity of the operation. The French charge d'affaires reported in shocked tones to his government in 1782 that the patriarch sometimes had as many as 900 applications before him at one time, and when in that same year it was decided that firm steps must be taken to check the practice, it was the Council of Ten who acted not the ecclesiastical establishment, who merely complained, yet again, of the encroachment on their authority. This reluctance to marry had two dangerous consequences. The first was that sometimes a carefully laid plan would go wrong, several old and distinguished families became extinct in this way. The second, more serious still, was that the Venetian nobility suffered from an ever-widening split between rich and poor. Already in the preceding century, an ominous feature of social life in the city was the growing class of impoverished nobles who, tending as they did to live in or near the parish of S. Barnaba, were popularly known as the Barnabotti. As official members of the Venetian aristocracy, they were required to dress in silk and continued to be entitled to their seats in the Great Council. Many, however, were too poor or too uneducated to occupy any but the lowest administrative positions, and since they were debarred by their rank from working as craftsmen or shopkeepers, increasing numbers drifted into corrupt practices such as the rigging of minor elections or the selling of votes. 
others simply gave up the struggle and lived on poor relief. Special arrangements, including free housing, had been made for them by the state, on the condition, however, that they remained single, bringing no more young Barnabotti, unwanted and unemployable, into the world. Meanwhile, even among the relatively rich, a number of families were beginning to feel the strain of keeping up the appearances expected of them, appearances indeed which were absolutely required of all aspirants to high office. Throughout the 18th century, and much of the 17th, the Republic was thus effectively run by only 42 families, from whom all holders of key governmental positions were drawn. It was in an effort to attract new blood, to instill new life into this shrinking aristocracy that seats on the Great Council were offered for sale to approved, and suitably affluent, outsiders even on occasions when funds were not urgently needed for the Turkish wars. By 1718, 127 Venetians had bought themselves and their descendants into the patriciate in this way, at a price of 100,000 ducats each, but though nearly two-thirds of these had previously been merchants, it is significant that all of them abandoned their former life immediately on being ennobled. Trade, despite the part it had played in the Republic's history, was no longer considered a fit occupation for a gentleman. Nowadays, like his counterparts across Europe, he would draw his wealth from his mainland estate, which he would visit at least twice a year on village Ichura, moving his entire household, family and servants, furniture, books and pictures to his Palladian or Baroque villa, that to escape the heat of the summer and the ennui of early autumn until the reopening of the Great Council and the new social season called him back to Venice. Commercial matters were, it was felt, far better left to foreigners, to Jews and Greeks and Dalmatians, who, it seemed, were good at that sort of thing and even actually liked it. It was perhaps inevitable, in so prolonged a period of peace as that which Venice was now enjoying that her more politically conscious citizens should have turned their attention towards matters affecting her constitution, and that they should not always have liked what they saw. As to the basic structure of the republic, few people, at least of the governing class, had any complaint. It had now lasted, largely unchanged, for over a thousand years, a record unmatched by any other state in Europe, perhaps in the whole world and a comparison of the condition of Venice with that of the rest of the continent, swept up in the Seven Years' War less than a decade after the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle had ended that of the Austrian succession, scarcely suggested that any major changes were necessary. But there remained one feature of the governmental machine which had never found universal favour, the Council of Ten with its still more sinister offshoot, the Three Inquisitors of State, whose very raison d'etre, to work swiftly and in secret, without the need for consultation outside their own number, became increasingly repugnant to 18th century liberal minds. We have seen how, in the 17th century, reformers like Renier Zen had attempted, unsuccessfully, to strip the council of its powers. Now, 140 years later, neither the ten nor the three were seen as the ogres that they had appeared during the dark and violent days of the Spanish conspiracy or the Arundel affair, among the general populace, to whom they seldom gave any reason for fear, they even enjoyed a large measure of support. Yet they were still hated by a large number of those nobles, and particularly the Barnabotti, who, though members of the great council, were not rich or influential enough to be themselves eligible for more exalted bodies and whose discontent made them liable to constant surveillance. The attack that was launched by a discontented and embittered Vogadordi Common named Angelo Quirini in 1761, and that was to be revived at regular intervals throughout the 1770s, followed a course so uncannily similar to that of Renia Zen, up to and including its completely negative result that there is no point in retracing the story here. Tempers, however, ran high, impassioned, and often immoderate, speeches were made on both sides, and when, in 1762, Francesco Lorden was succeeded on the ducal throne by the most outspoken champion of the Ten and the Inquisitors, there were many in Venice who viewed the new doge with profound misgiving. Marco Foscarini was indeed no radical. He was. However, a scholar and a man of letters, 
probably, with Andrea Dandolo, the most cultivated of all the doges of Venice. He was the author of a long poem, Il Corallo, written in an attempt to inspire a revival of the Venetian choral industry, and, more important, a major work of literary history, Letteratura Veneziana. Of this latter work, only the first volume was ever published, the second was still incomplete when he died, aged only 67, in March 1763, having reigned for only ten months. He was buried in his family chapel at S. Stay. His successor was yet another Alvise Mocenigo, the fourth, and mercifully the last, of that name to be elected to the supreme office. Himself a man of respectable, but in no way remarkable, attainments, he began his reign by concluding four treaties which, in earlier times, the Republic would have been ashamed even to consider. All had the same object, to put an end to the increasing harassment of Venetian shipping by the pirates of the Barbary coast, in return for a regular payment of protection money. Within six months of his accession, agreements had been reached with the rulers of Algiers and Tunis, similar ones followed with Tripoli in 1764 and Morocco in 1765, by which time Venice had committed herself to an annual expenditure of some 60,000 ducats for the right to sail unmolested through those seas that she had once commanded. For the former mistress of the Mediterranean, here was a humiliation indeed, but her shame must have been even greater when, within a very few years, it became evident that the money was being paid in vain. The rulers concerned, despite their assurances, were soon revealed to be either unable to control the course or captains who sailed under their flags, or else simply disposed to turn a blind eye to their operations. Acts of piracy, though slightly less frequent, still presented a problem that could not be ignored, and Venice was fortunate that in these last years of her life she still possessed one admiral of the old school capable of making a show of what little strength remained to her. Angelo Imo, from the time he reached manhood, had dedicated himself to a single ideal, the complete remodeling of the Venetian navy on Anglo-French lines. He had not been altogether successful, but his skill in seamanship and knowledge of modern naval tactics, qualities by then rare among the Venetian nobility, had marked him out among his fellows so that when in 1768 the government at last decided to take active measures against the pirates he was, though still under 40, the obvious choice for the command. In the years immediately following, he was to make frequent trades on their bases along the North African coast, and between 1784 and 1786, with a handful of ships which Venice now called a fleet but which in former days would scarcely have been accounted a squadron he waged an intermittent small-scale naval war against the Bay of Tunis, forcing him, after three seasons' bombardment, into submission on very favorable terms. Thus, although none of these campaigns was of such a nature as to lead to any pitched battle or decisive victory, this last of the great Venetian admirals was able to make the Mediterranean safer for European shipping than it had been for decades, while proving to the world that the Lion of St. Mark, though old now and enfeebled, could still occasionally make his presence felt. On the 22nd of July 1769 the young Emperor Joseph II arrived in Venice. He was traveling incognito and stayed, not in any of the great palaces that would have been willingly put at his disposal, but at the Leon Bianco at SS. Apostly, probably the best of the score of hotels and inns which now existed for the reception of the wealthier foreign visitors. One this did not, however, prevent the drawing up of a full and varied program of entertainments in his honor, it was only when he heard of the government's proposal to construct a representation of the gardens of the Hesperides, 300 yards across, on rafts between the mouth of the Giudecca Canal and S. Giorgio Maggiore, complete with flowers, trees of variously colored crystal and an artificial lake stocked with fish, in which he and his fellow guests were to take their pleasure before passing on to a banquet on the island of S. Giorgio itself, that he put his foot down. To any student of Venetian social history, any reader, perhaps, of this book, such a proposal, which was planned in far more elaborate detail than is suggested by the above comparatively stark description, should occasion no surprise. 
What is more remarkable, and perhaps more ominous, is the reaction it provoked among the Venetians. Perhaps, if the festivity had been allowed to materialize as planned, the sheer magnificence of it might have disarmed opposition, but it did not materialize, and the rumors of the hundreds, even thousands, of ducats that had already been spent to no purpose on its preparation triggered off a wave of anti-government feeling, particularly among the discontented Barnabotti and many of the younger intellectuals, inside and outside the nobility, on whom the new, revolutionary ideas gradually seeping in from France were beginning to have their effect. How, they demanded, could such sums be authorized on meaningless frivolities for the delectation of foreigners who did not even want them, at a time when the Republic was known to be in debt? How, for that matter, after more than half a century of peace, did it come to be in debt? Was it right that the potential rulers of Venice should be steadily decreasing in numbers, that the membership of the Great Council should be down to less than a thousand and that on some days it should have difficulty even in raising a quorum? That the highest offices of the state should now be the perquisite of a few immensely rich families? That many members of these families, both male and female, should gamble away their days and nights in the ridotti, masked and pomaded, while others, unmasked, sat at the head of the tables in their crimson state robes, impassively holding the banks and dealing out the cards. During the early years of the next decade this dissatisfaction became more and more vocal, finding its most effective spokesman in one Giorgio Pisani, a young and more than usually embittered Barnabotto who reanimated the long-existing, if intermittent, campaign against the Council of Ten and the State Inquisitors and soon made himself the unofficial leader of the Party of Reform. It was not, however, till 1774 that it scored its first major success, on the 27th of November of that year a new law was approved by the Great Council, whereby the Republic, determined to preserve the piety, sound discipline and moderate behavior so necessary for the well-being of society, and to restrain the spread of every vice tending to the corruption and dissolution of the social order, decreed that the casino of the Kidotto at S. Moise, comma, one the center of gambling in the city, shall be closed forever and turned over to some public purpose, and that all games of hazard shall be strictly prohibited in Venice as in her provinces, the inquisitors being charged to see that there be no infraction. The law, it is credibly reported, was received with jubilation by the populace, who ran through the streets spreading the news to everyone they met, but Venice's passion for gambling was stronger than her respect for the law, and though the S. Mois Ridotto remained closed there were plenty of other more discreet houses, where, within a few weeks, the tables were as crowded as ever. Two months later, in January 1775, it was proposed once again to offer seats in the Great Council for sale, this time to forty families from the mainland, provided that each could claim membership of its own local nobility for four or more generations and show a minimum annual income of 10,000 ducats. The proposal was hotly debated against strong opposition, position, and adopted by the most slender of majorities, its adherents, however, were in for a sad disappointment. A century before, there had been three times that number of families for whom 100,000 ducats was a small price to pay for a place among the patriciate, now, out of the forty approached, only ten were willing to accept, several, even of these, showing a marked lack of enthusiasm. When Doge Mokenega died on 31 December 1778 Venice's morale was at a frighteningly low ebb, nor was it appreciably raised by the election on the 14th of January following, of Paolo Regna. The new doge was a classical scholar, a translator of Homer, Pindar and Plato into the Venetian dialect, he had been a senator and a savio, ambassador in Vienna and Bailo in Constantinople. But he had a reputation for sharp practice and corruption, and even if he had not, as was widely rumored, bought the doge ship by bribing due members of the great council, the populace mistrusted him from the start. He also seems to have been sadly deficient in physical courage, his election address in St. Mark's was barely audible, 
and the consequent shouts from the congregation to speak up frightened him to such a degree that on leaving the basilica he could hardly climb into the postso for his tour of the piazza, and several times asked his entourage if he were not seriously in danger of his life. The most sympathetic thing we know about him is that he married, as his second wife, a Greek tightrope walker he had met in Constantinople, but even this did not endear him to his people's hearts. She was never recognized socially, and throughout his reign the offices of Dogeresse were performed by his niece. Whatever his personal shortcomings, Dodrenia seems to have worked hard and conscientiously to hold the Republic's decline, but it was clear that Venice was becoming less and less governable. The year after his accession, Giorgio Pisani was elected procurator of St. Mark, this was a major victory for the Barnabotti and the Radicals if only Buse had placed their champion on the same level as that occupied by the most powerful member of the reactionary opposition, Andrea Tron. For a decade and more, Tron, Il Peron, as he was generally called in the Venetian dialect one, had dominated the Venetian political scene, wielding, thanks more to the sheer force of his personality than to any actual offices he held, considerably more real power than the Doge himself. The son of one of Venice's few genuine industrialists, his father, Niccolo, had established highly profitable textile mills near Vicenza, he had been a vociferous upholder of the old Venetian values, and was forever calling upon his fellow nobles to leave their country estates and return to their old commercial ways, declining, however, to set any such example himself. He made no secret of his contempt for all those foreigners or new men who, he felt, had been allowed to take the Republic's economy into their own hands, and he had a particular detestation of the Jews, against whom he had managed to put through savage new legislation in 1777, forbidding them to employ Christians, barring them from manufacturing and ownership of property, and so reducing a once prosperous and useful community to the status of rag and bone merchants. Now, in Giorgio Pisani and his equally vehement colleague Carlo Cinturini, it seemed for a brief moment that Andrea Tron had found his match. Day after day they thundered against the government, its criminal mismanagement of the affairs of state, its irresponsible handling of the economy, its decadence and its corruption. And their oratory had its effect, before long they could command a majority in the Great Council. In vain Dodrini appealed for unity pointing out that the Republic could no longer defend itself in the event of foreign aggression, and that without internal solidarity it was as good as lost. The princes of Europe, he reminded his hearers, are watching us closely in our present turmoil and judging how best to turn it to their advantage. But Pisani and Contarini had no intention of moderating their language to oblige a political establishment for which they felt nothing but contempt. It would have been better for them if they had a quieter, more measured approach might have achieved at least some of their ends. As it was, their constant agitation, public speeches and secret meetings ultimately forced the authorities to move against them. On the night of the 31st of May Giorgio Pisani was arrested in his house at S. Moyes, the next ten years he was to pass in prison on the mainland. Cantarini, for his part, was consigned to the fortress of Cataro where he died soon afterwards. The Council of Ten and the Inquisitors had won again, just as they always did. But their long, traumatic debates in the Great Council, debates during which Venice seemed, as never before in all her history, to be tearing her very soul apart, were not forgotten, the bitterness of the Barnabotti continued to increase, and, for the seventeen years that the Republic had still to live, Certain words of Paolo Rini rang ominously in the ears of his more thoughtful compatriots If any state has need of unity, it is ours. We have no forces, neither on land nor at sea. We have no alliances. We live by good fortune, by accident, putting our trust solely in that reputation for prudence that the government of Venice has always enjoyed. Here, and here only, lies our strength. It was true, though. As the Doge had admitted earlier, Venice's reputation was no longer enough where the chanceries of Europe were concerned. However rapidly the Serenissima was declining, her diplomatic service was as alert as ever, 
Andrinian knew full well that Austria had already initiated discussions with other governments to consider a future in which Venice would have ceased to exist. Yet somehow, despite all her tribulations, she contrived to put on a brave, even a united, front to the world, to project the by now traditional image of a frivolous and brittle society with elegance and taste and money to burn but invisibly supported by a monolithic infrastructure composed of grave and experienced men whose wisdom was infinite and whose touch was sure. Nor was it only the mindless pleasure seekers whom she deceived. In January 1782 there arrived the hereditary Grand Duke of Russia, the future Tsar Paul I, and his wife, traveling under the romantic aliases of Count and Countess of the North. The usual magnificent festivities were held in their honor, in the course of which, at a touch from the Countess's hand, an outsize artificial dove sped round the piazza sparking off a hundred torches as it went, finally coming to rest on an eighty-foot-high replica of the Arch of Titus in Rome, but what really impressed her husband, we are told, was the quiet discipline shown by the crowds, who needed no soldiers to control them or any other authority but five ushers from the ten, led by their red-robed Capitan Grand. Voila! he exclaimed, left it to sage gouvernement de la republic. Spoupolist en famille. He could not, one suspects, have said anything that would have given his host more pleasure. One the Grand Duke was not an intelligent man, he was insane by the time he ascended the throne and was very properly assassinated in 1801, but there were many visitors far more perceptive than he who failed to discern any division or dissatisfaction in the city. They would not in any case, have found it among the populace. The average working-class Venetian was well content with his lot. Given a modicum of bread and plenty of circuses, and neither were in short supply, he had nothing to grumble about. Taxation was light, or non-existent. Being born outside the governing elite, it seldom occurred to him to have political ambitions. He gave no trouble to the ten or the three, on the contrary he believed them to be a useful, even a necessary, element in the state, and cheered lustily whenever they uncovered a conspiracy or moved against some discontented Barnabotto. They in their turn bothered him not a jot, allowing him far more freedom than they allowed the nobility, whose every movement was watched and who were forbidden to leave the city, let alone the republic, without special permission. Thus he had shed no tears for Pisani or Contarini they spoke only for their own disaffected class, they were not, and never pretended to be, men of the people. The sooner they were put away in a safe place, and the longer they stayed there, the better. The remaining seven years of Paolo Renia's doge ship were uneventful. In May 1782 he entertained Pope Pius VI on his way to Vienna, the first visit to Venice by a reigning pope since Alexander III's triumph over Frederick Barbarossa in 1177, in the following year he and the Senate rejected, for reasons not altogether clear, proposals from three plenipotentiaries, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, for a treaty of trade and friendship with the young United States of America. Meanwhile his venality was growing more and more shameless with advancing age, and most of his subjects cordially despised him. By far his greatest monument, for which he can take none of the credit, must unquestionably be the Murazzi, the gigantic sea walls of irregular blocks of stone, fourteen meters thick at the base, that stretch some four kilometers along the littoral of the island of Balestrina. This tremendous bulwark, started in 1744, had been 38 years a building and still stands in impressive, though, alas, increasingly ineffectual, testimony to the fact that even the sea, for so long Venice's refuge, was beginning to turn against her. And yet, among those who attended its inauguration, there must have been many who reflected sadly that she was now facing other, still greater dangers, both internal and external, against which she had no defence. All she could do was to keep up the charade, and it was in this cause that Paolo Renia, dying unlamented in February 1789, made his last unconscious sacrifice for the Republic. Instead of receiving the usual state obsequies, he was buried in the church of the Tolentini secretly and at night, 
so as not to interrupt the carnival. 46 The fall 1789 to 1797 La ration du plus fortist tujures la meliora semicolon nu i allens montra taute l apostrophe bura. La fontaine, la lupette l'agnia when Lodovica Menin, the 118th doge of Venice and the last, was elected by 28 votes to 13 on the 9th of May 1789. He and his subjects were still unaware that, only four days previously, the States General of France had met at Versailles, and that the chain of events had already begun that was to bring France to revolution. It is not likely, however, even if the news had reached the Rialto, that the Venetians would have paid it much heed. For over seventy years now, they had lived in an ivory tower secure in the belief that their by now traditional policy of neutrality would save them from all ills and that their determination to live at peace with their neighbors would be universally respected. Their mistake, the most tragic mistake in all their history, was to cling to this belief long after they should have seen it to be untenable, and for this disastrous piece of self-deception Lodovico Menon must bear much of the responsibility. He was, in many respects, a surprising choice. For one thing, unlike any other doges of the past few centuries, he was not a member of the old Venetian aristocracy. The Manins were a powerful family from the Free Eli who had bought their place in the Golden Book for 100,000 ducats in 1651, only 74 years before Lodovico's birth. To most of his senior colleagues, therefore, he was an upstart one of his defeated rivals for the dogeship, the procurator Pietro Gradenigo, was heard to murmur, during the post-electoral celebrations, with a free Ilana doge, the Republic is dead. Eight years later, his words were to be remembered all too well. Menin's career in public life had been distinguished enough, but not unusually impressive, he was principally remembered for the efficiency with which, when boats to a Verona, he had dealt with the catastrophic floods of 1757. In marked contrast to his predecessor, he was honest, even in the worst of the days that lay ahead, his integrity was never questioned. But in the years during which he was called upon to guide the Republic, there were other qualities more important even than honesty, strength, vision, courage, firmness of will, in a word, leadership. Of these qualities Lodovico Menin seems to have possessed scarcely a trace, indeed, as one reads through the last painful records of the dying Republic, one is tempted to wonder whether they had not disappeared altogether from Venice. One man only, Francesco Pissarro, saw the danger from the start and did his utmost to waken his colleagues to a realization of what lay ahead, but he failed and when the end came he revealed that he too had feet of clay. The French Third Estate, which on the 17th of June proclaimed itself the National Assembly, emphasized its peaceable intentions from the start, the attitude of the European monarchies, however, soon made it clear that peace was not to be. The philosophy of revolution was heady stuff. Already it had spread throughout Western Europe, if the contagion were allowed to continue unchecked, other thrones would totter as well as the French, and the thousand-year-old political foundations of the whole continent would be in jeopardy. By June 1790, the Venetian representative at Turin was writing to warn the Senate of a French secret organization that had sent agents the length and breadth of Italy with the express purpose of disseminating revolutionary propaganda and organizing disaffection, and three months later a long dispatch from Antonio Capello, the ambassador in Paris, confirmed that this was no alarmist rumor. The organization, he wrote, included some of the most prominent members of the assembly, men like Mirab, Lafayette and the Abbe Sies. Now Venice might be a republic, but she had never pretended to be radical or egalitarian. Indeed, her whole constitution was elitist through and through, and even though in recent years her nobility had occasionally been allowed limited transfusions of new blood, it remained considerably harder for the ordinary citizen to penetrate than the peerages of Britain or even of France, both of which were always open to those who, by their wealth, talent or qualities of person or character, gained the favor of the king. To her ruling families, the doctrines of the revolution were every bit as repugnant as they were to the most reactionary of feudal aristocrats in Austria, England or Prussia. 
the European monarchies, in short, saw no reason why the Serenissima should not prove an enthusiastic, even if a not very effectual, ally in the struggle against the godlessness and chaos that they saw ahead. They were soon to be disillusioned. It was not that the Republic underestimated the dangers of subversion. Giorgio Pisani and Carlo Quintarini might be safely out of the way, but there were plenty of others, among Barnabotti and Cittadini alike, who made little or no secret of their sympathy for the radical cause. The Ten and the Three tightened their grip. Censorship became stricter, political public meetings were forbidden, all foreigners and many Venetians were put under surveillance. But when, in November 1791, King Victor Emmanuel of Sardinia suggested that Venice should join in a league of Italian princes to resist the Jacobin threat, she replied that she did not consider such measures necessary, the threat had been greatly exaggerated, such precautions as might be considered advisable she was perfectly capable of taking on her own. Six months later, the war had begun, Austria was first to enter the lists, to be followed shortly afterwards by Prussia and Sardinia. Then, on 10 August 1792, the Paris mob invaded the Tuileries, massacring the Swiss Guard, seeking out the royal family, who took refuge, not a moment too soon, in the National Assembly building, and, incidentally, giving the Venetian ambassador, Alvise Pisani, a most unpleasant shock. He wrote to a friend never in my life shall I witness such a scene of horror, bloodshed and fear. The mob burst into the palace at noon, armed to the teeth, and dragging heavy cannon behind them, shouting we want the king, where is the king? They did not find him. There were many casualties among the hussars and the palace guards, the dead are estimated at between one and three thousand. Such was my confusion and terror that I simply cannot describe the picture that lay before my eyes, enough to daunt the strongest spirit. From the windows of my house, shaking as it was from the crashing of the guns, I could see the blood flowing in rivers. Just imagine my situation. A few wounded hussars were brought into the house, only to be followed by a hundred or more of the mob. I had the doors closed, when up came armed troops, shouting, Ambassador, you are sheltering the king in your house, we want him. I then showed unusual courage. First I sent my terrified children upstairs with the chaplain, then I myself opened the door, presented myself before the diabolical crowd, and swore that there was no one taking refuge in the house but a few wounded men. Come, friends, I cried to them, come, see for yourselves. At that moment the Lord himself protected me. They believed me. No one answered, but all turned away, still shouting we want the king. Now the tumult has a little subsided, but for how long? There are fears of still more terrible and tragic happenings, danger is everywhere. Only consider my position, and that of my trembling family. The shock had indeed proved too much for him. Leaving his secretary in charge of the embassy, he and his family fled to London and remained there for the next three years. In September 1792, the King of Sardinia made a further effort to enlist Venetian aid. This time the invitation was to join with himself and the Kingdom of Naples in a neutral defensive league, to which it was hoped that all the other states of Italy would ultimately adhere. Once again, however, the Republic refused point blank, the Collegio taking the decision themselves without even bothering to submit the question to the Senate. Venice, they pointed out, had formally declared herself neutral, how could she therefore join any alliance? even one specifically dedicated to the preservation of her neutrality. As an argument, it seemed distinctly thin, but the minds of the decision makers were made up. Even when, four months later, King Louis XVI met his death at the guillotine they refused to be shaken. In Venice, as in every other capital in Europe, including Paris, men were shocked and horrified by the news, but the demand that diplomatic relations with France should be broken off, a mild enough reaction, in the circumstances, was rejected by the Senate, and Alvise Pisani continued to enjoy his rank and title, and to draw his salary, from the safety of London. Meanwhile the French representative in Venice was authorized to fly the Republican flag from his palace. 
In February 1793 the monarchies made their last attempt, Great Britain, Austria, Prussia, Holland, Spain and Sardinia had formed a coalition to protect Europe from atheists and regicides. Would Venice not join them in this sacred mission? Venice would not. Neutrality is, or can be, a perfectly respectable policy, but, as Francesco Pissarro strove to impress upon his fellow countrymen, it must be backed by strength. Wars between France and Austria had almost invariably been fought out on Italian soil, it could not now be long before Lombardy and the Veneto were once again a battleground. When that moment came, Venice, however peaceably inclined, must show herself ready, and able, to fight. If she were not, what hope was there that her territorial integrity would be preserved? In her present condition, her very existence as an independent state was in danger. So, in debate after debate, Pissarro argued, but he argued in vain. Once again, the opposing arguments were thin, they could hardly have been anything else. Armed neutrality of the kind that he advocated would necessitate a major reorganization, even a reconstruction, of both the army and navy. How could the Republic possibly afford such a measure, except by a swinging and totally unacceptable levy on private wealth? The army of the revolution had already turned back the invading Prussians at Varmi and inflicted a crushing defeat on the Austrians at Gmaps. Was Pissarro seriously suggesting that Venice should measure herself against so formidable a fighting force? As for the idea of a Venetian army on her western frontier, what purpose could that possibly serve except to antagonize the French unnecessarily and encourage them to attack? These arguments may well have been advanced in all sincerity, but they bore no relation to the real reason for the Republic's inertia. The fact of the matter was that Venice was utterly demoralized. It was so long since she had been obliged to make a serious military effort that she had lost the will that makes such efforts possible. Peace, the pursuit of pleasure, the love of luxury, the whole spirit of Dolce Farnenti had sapped her strength. She was old and tired, she was also spoiled. Even her much vaunted constitution, once the envy of all her neighbors, seemed to be crumbling, votes were bought and sold. The effective oligarchy was shrinking steadily, the Senate was reduced to little more than a robust damp. In this last decade of her existence as a state, almost every political decision she made seemed calculated to hasten her end. Did she, one wonders, have a death wish? If so, it was to be granted sooner than she knew. For nearly two years after the execution of King Louis, relations between France and Venice remained correct at times almost cordial. No amount of pious professions of neutrality could conceal the fact that the Venetian oligarchy was pro-Austrian and monarchist at heart, and the new French minister, Lalmont, knew perfectly well that his every movement was watched and reported to the inquisitors, he had no reason, on the other hand, to believe that his fellow diplomats in the city fared any better, and even if he could not hope to gain the friendship of those in power he did at least succeed in winning a certain degree of grudging respect. France, after all, now possessed no friends in Europe, a strategically placed neutral was worth cultivating. Late in November 1795, however, a French army won its first victory over the Austrians on Italian soil, at Lono, a small seaside town about halfway between San Remo and Genoa. Almost at once, the French attitude to Venice hardened, and the first sign of that hardening was a peremptory demand to expel from her territory the Comte de Lille, the brother of the dead king. He had settled in Verona the previous year and, after the death of the young Dauphin in July, had issued a proclamation in which, under the name of Louis XVIII, he laid formal claim to the throne of France. Thus, in the past four months, he had made Verona the center of French émigré activity. Now Venice, as a neutral, had a perfect right to offer refuge to anyone she liked, and the French Republic never produced any concrete evidence that Louis, from the safety of Venetian soil, was actually plotting its overthrow. The Emperor, meanwhile, although he himself had refused to accept the pretender on Austrian territory, was putting heavy pressure on Venice to allow him to stay in Verona. 
but at last the French demands became so threatening that the Signoria dared resist them no longer, on 31 March 1796 Louis was politely requested to leave, and shortly afterwards did so, demanding, in an understandable show of beak, that the House of Bourbon be formally expunged from the Golden Book. The affair was not, perhaps, of primary importance, but it perfectly illustrated Francesco Pissarro's argument. If Venice had been strong, she could have afforded to ignore the French threats or, alternatively, to expel Louis and his followers in defiance of Austria, in either event, she would have retained the friendship of one of the parties. In her weakness, she had hesitated and have it, and succeeded only in antagonizing both. By now, too, a more serious dispute had arisen. The French had complained, quite justifiably, on this occasion, that Venice had allowed an Austrian army to cross her territory on its march from the Tyrol to Mantua. The Venetians replied lamely that the empire had been specifically authorized to use the road through Goita by an ancient treaty which could not be abrogated. They may well have believed this themselves up to a point, since the Austrians had certainly been passing backwards and forwards along the Goita road without let or hindrance since their acquisition of the Duchy of Mantua in 1708 but despite repeated French demands Venice was never able to produce a copy of the treaty concerned. So far as the French were concerned, therefore, this was a clear breach of her proclaimed neutrality, a point which Napoleon Bonaparte was to turn to good account in the months ahead. Bonaparte was now 26 years old. He had first distinguished himself when only 24, at the siege of Toulon, after which his general, Dugomia, had sent urgent advice to the Minister for War in Paris, Recompenses, Avances Sejun Hom, Car, Seal on Nitating Grat in Veslui, Il Sivenserate de Lui Meme, Reward that young man, Promote him, for if his services are not recognized, he will promote himself. That advice had been taken. In the following year, having saved the convention virtually single handed from the Royalist insurrection of 13 Vendemi Air, he had been made second in command of the Army of the Interior, and five months later, in March 1796, when the newly established Directory resolved to launch a new campaign against Austria through Italy, the slim, solemn young Corsican, bilingual in Italian, seemed the obvious choice to lead it. No one, however, except possibly Bonaparte himself, could have foreseen the measure and speed of his success. Montanot. Millissimo, Digo, Saver, Mondovi, almost every day brought news of another victory. Before the end of April, Austria's ally Sardinia was forced to sign a separate peace, by which she surrendered Savoy and Nice to France. On 8 May the French crossed the Po and, two days later, forced the bridge over the Addo at Lodi. On the 15th Bonaparte made his formal entry into Milan. All Lombardy was now in his hands, saving only Mantua, Mantua, however, could wait. The way was effectively clear to the imperial frontier. True, it lay across the neutral territory of Venice, but that could not be helped. Such considerations were certainly unheeded by the Austrians, who were no longer even sticking to the Goita road, only a few days before. The Austrian general Gerpen, now in full flight with the remnants of his army, had sought permission to pass through Kramer, permission which, since the fortress was in a ruinous condition and utterly indefensible, the Venetian boatster had not felt able to refuse. On learning of this further instance of Venice's imperialist sympathies, Bonaparte had at once ridden personally to Kramer to ask the boatster, a certain Gian Battista Cantarini, for an explanation. The ensuing meeting was of no special importance. Its interest lies chiefly in the fact that Cantarini's report of it to the Senate gives us the first account of Bonaparte by a Venetian. Cantarini was struck by his evident physical frailty, and by the fact that he made no effort to conceal his fatigue. Here was no arrogant young conqueror, angrily pacing up and down the room, berating Venice for her duplicity and threatening dire retribution, merely an exhausted young man lying back in an armchair with his eyes closed. He seemed, wrote Cantarini, serious and thoughtful, and to the direct question are you tired? The general answered yes, I am very tired. 
At no time during the conversation did he express any friendly sentiments towards Venice, but when his only companion and fellow Corsican, General Solicity, launched into a violent tirade against the Republic he took no part, and indeed on several occasions smiled his approval of the spirited retorts with which, if Cantarini's account is to be believed, the indignant boadster gave as good as he got. His own protests were couched in mild, almost courteous language. He seemed more interested in establishing precisely which route the Austrians had taken, and in satisfying himself that it was in fact the only route open to them that could save them from capture by his own forces. The next Venetian report on Bonaparte, from Bodes to Alvise Mokenigo in Brescia on 26 May, shows him, however, in a stormier mood. The retreating Austrians had been allowed to occupy the fortress of Pescira on Lake Garda, the Venetian authorities, apart from the gentlest of protests, had made no effort to prevent them, and he wished to know why. Mokenega might well have pointed out that since the French were by now in Brescia, similarly without leave or opposition, they were hardly in a position to complain, but, given the general's attitude, he seems to have thought this argument inadvisable. Instead, he reported to the Senate that he had finally been able to pacify him, and that on his departure Bonaparte had actually declared his friendship for Venice, but, the report added, he feels in the highest degree the passion of pride. Every occurrence, no matter how innocent, that seems to him to create the slightest opposition to his plans arouses him instantly to anger and to threats. What the poor boadster did not know was that most of Napoleon Bonaparte's anger on these occasions was nothing but a simulated display, and that most of his threats were empty. His plans were working beautifully. A final battle, on the 5th of August at Castiglian, in which the Austrians lost 2,000 men and all their artillery was a fitting climax to one of the most extraordinary campaigns of modern military history, after it Pescira was rapidly evacuated and the surrender of Mantua, the empire's last remaining toehold in Italy, could only be a matter of time. Bonaparte's real purpose in his dealings with Venice at this period was not to enlist her aid or even to persuade her to take a more firmly neutral line, he knew just how powerless she really was, equally unable effectively to help or seriously to hinder him. Rather it was to frighten her, to put her in the wrong, to make her feel guilty and inadequate, to erode her pride, confidence and self-respect to the point where her moral resistance would be reduced to the same level as her physical. Simultaneously he could claim, in her alleged misdeeds, justification for his own. And the success of this technique was never more perfectly illustrated than in his dealings with Niccolo Foscarini. Early in May 1796, the Collegio, worried by the growing sympathy being shown in the Senate for Francesco Pissarro's ever more insistent calls to rearm, had suggested as a compromise the appointment of a Provveditor General in terra firma, with headquarters at Verona. It was an office which normally carried near dictatorial powers. On this occasion, however, the prove editors were clear. They were to ascertain the state of public opinion, to preserve tranquility and to give to the subjects of Venice that consolation and reassurance to which they are accustomed, going promptly wherever he is required, keeping the Senate constantly informed of developments and carrying out its orders. Had Niccolo Foscarini, who as Saviour di Settimon I had piloted the relevant resolution through the Senate, known that he would himself be elected to the post, he might perhaps have framed these terms of reference slightly differently, largely responsible for them though he was, it is impossible not to feel sorry for him. How could he reassure his fellow citizens in the face of an advancing and apparently irresistible army commanded by an obvious military genius? when the entire Venetian land forces consisted of perhaps 5,000 men, scattered across the country in small garrisons, ill-armed, ill-equipped, and destitute of artillery or munitions. How could he carry out the Senate's orders when it never sent any, answering his repeated requests, if at all, with deliberately ambiguous and evasive generalizations? In such circumstances his only sensible course would have been to act on his own initiative, but initiative was not, alas, his forte. From the start, Foscarini's attitude to Bonaparte, like that of his government, 
might have been expressly designed to irritate. On the 31st of May, within a few days of taking up his appointment, he sent his aide de camp to the French headquarters at Valgia to congratulate the general on his successes but, simultaneously, to submit a bill for all the damages reportedly caused by the Army of the Revolution on Venetian territory. This time Bonaparte's rage, real or simulated, was fearful to behold. What? he demanded, were these paltry complaints compared with the harm Venice had done to the French cause? Had she not opened her territory to his enemies, even granting them the fortress of Peschira? Now France would have her revenge, first he would march on Verona and burn it to the ground, then he would deal with Venice as she deserved. When at last the tirade subsided, the trembling aide de comp was dismissed with a message to the prove editor to present himself in person that same evening at Peschira to justify his conduct and that of his government. Foscarini was terrified, and made no secret of the fact. Before leaving, he wrote to the Senate what sounds almost like a farewell letter, calling God's blessings on what he describes as my holocaust for the good of my country and in his subsequent report of the interview he sounds grateful to have emerged alive. Bonaparte, seeing the state he was in, took full advantage. The directory, he thundered, had given him authority to demolish Verona, and he was dispatching General Masson that very night with enough troops and artillery to ensure that the task would be properly done. He himself would declare war on all the princes of Italy at the next sign of pro-Austrian sympathies on the part of any of them, meanwhile he had already written to Paris for authority to march against Venice. He ended by pointing out that Foscarini was at that moment on French territory, since Peschira had been treacherously passed by Venice into the hands of Austria from whom he had taken it by right of conquest. For the same reason he had also decided to annex all the previously Venetian strong places along the Adige. The luckless prove editor could only plead for mercy. For a long time he could make no impression, at last, however, Bonaparte agreed to spare Verona, on condition that Massena and his army were guaranteed free and unimpeded entry into the city, all three bridges on the Adige being given over unconditionally into his control. Venice must also undertake to supply provisions and even certain items of military equipment on credit. When Foscarini was finally allowed to withdraw, he had given away to the French everything they wanted, without a shot being fired or a penny paid. It seemed to him a cheap price to pay for saving Verona from the flames. And so, perhaps, it might have been, if Bonaparte had had the faintest intention of burning it. The truth was that he had never dreamt of doing so, nor had he ever given Masson orders to that effect. A week later he admitted as much to the directory I have purposely engineered this quarrel, in case you wish to get five or six millions out of Venice. If you have more decided intentions, I think it will be in our interest to continue the brewillery, just let me know what you wish to do, and we will await the favorable moment which I will make use of according to the circumstances. The truth about the Peschiro affair is that Bewley, the Austrian commander, basely deceived them, he requested passage for fifty men, then seized the town. In other words the Republic, until recently world-renowned for the shrewdness of her diplomacy, had been the victim, not of a double bluff, but of two single bluffs in quick succession, the first by the Austrians, the second by the French impotent, indecisive and afraid, she had now shown herself to be gullible as well. In Venice, the Senate continued to dither. At last they had learned how to deal with the urgings of Francesco Pissarro and his supporters, rather than attempt to silence them, it was better to propose some hopeful sounding compromise and then, by withholding funds or erecting a sort of bureaucratic blockade, to render it nugatory and allow it to be gently forgotten. It was this policy which had led to the appointment of the Prove Editor, a measure which had had the added advantage that henceforth they had a scapegoat as the situation on terra firma continued to worsen. Admittedly, Niccolo Foscarini had not taken easily to the role, his incessant requests for instructions revealed a marked reluctance to assume the slightest responsibility for anything. This ploy, however, was simple enough to counter, the requests were ignored. The letters went unanswered. At the beginning of June, once again, it seems, 
with the sole purpose of placating Pesaro, the Senate ordered the fleet up from Corfu, then quietly revoked the order a few days later. Next they appointed a proveditor Al Lagoon, an admiral for home waters, in the person of 76-year-old Giacomo Nani. Despite his age, Nani was an able and conscientious officer who had produced a plan 40 years before for the defense of Venice, and he and his equally efficient lieutenant, Thomas Ocandolma, set to work with a will, but his report on the state of the navy proved so discouraging, only four galleys and seven galliots, all obsolete, were even partially ready for service, that it was decided to shelve it. No further funds were voted, and when Nanny died the following April he was not replaced. A half-hearted attempt to strengthen the army was equally abortive, an invitation to Prince William of Nassau to take over its command gave rise to a strong protest from Austria and was immediately withdrawn, almost simultaneously, Napoleon objected that since Venice had made no attempt to rearm when Austria had invaded her territory, he would consider it a hostile act if she were to do so merely because her frontier had now been crossed by the French. At this the Signoria decided that the army, like the navy, had better be left untouched. Never again was the question of rearmament or mobilization publicly discussed. In fact, it scarcely mattered. The time was long since past when Venice might have built up her forces. Five, even two or three, years earlier, strong, determined action, followed by a firm defensive alliance with Austria, might have saved the day, but not now. By the summer of 1796, she had only one chance left to throw in her lot with the French and trust that by bending to the storm she might somehow survive it. Against all probabilities, that chance was now offered her, and she turned it down. We do not know how long Bonaparte had been seriously considering the idea of a Venetian alliance. It is quite possible that it had been in his mind from the first, but that he had deliberately delayed making any proposals until he felt that there was a good chance of their being accepted. On the other hand it is not immediately easy to understand what advantage he saw in wooing the friendship of a state which he already knew to be entirely at his mercy, incurring obligations and responsibilities towards it which might well inhibit his freedom of action after his certain victory. But woo it he did, and assiduously, in less than two and a half months Venice received three separate offers of alliance, the first on the 21st of August from Bonaparte himself in Brescia the second on the 19th of September through the French minister, Lalmont, and the third, most formal of all, on 51 October, from Jean-Francois Rebel, the member of the five-man directory responsible for foreign affairs, through her Venetian envoy in Paris, Angelo Carini. She was to discuss the possibility in the Senate as late as the following March, but the decision, reached almost unanimously, was still the same. No. Dot why did Venice refuse? A probable reason, and almost certainly a contributory one, is that the whole concept of revolutionary France was repugnant to those who guided her destiny. At other levels of society, both on terra firma and within the city itself, support for radical principles might be spreading fast, but to the handful of rich families who now constituted the permanent government of the Serenissima, France was a nation of anarchists and regicides, they could no more contemplate a treaty of friendship and alliance with such a power than, let us say, King George V of England would have contemplated a similar pact with Soviet Russia in the 1920s. Perhaps they allowed their disgust to blind them to political realities, perhaps, on the other hand, they were fully aware of the dangers they incurred by rejecting Bonaparte servitures but were determined nonetheless to make a stand on a point of principle. If so, their courage, however misguided, does them credit. But there is another explanation too, more likely and, alas, less sonorable. It is that even now, with the Napoleonic tide already threatening to engulf them, they were so terrified by the thought of war that any other prospect, even annihilation itself, was preferable. One can argue for ever whether, if Venice had accepted Bonaparte's offer, she could have retained her independence, he might well have sacrificed her anyway, once she had served his purpose. But one thing is sure. By rejecting him, 
she not only convinced him of her instinctive hostility to all he stood for, more dangerous still, she inflicted a dangerous blow to his pride. The decision was suicidal. The moment she took it, her death warrant was sealed. Mantua fell on the 2nd of February 1797, and with it the last outpost of Austrian power in Italy. Six weeks later, Bonaparte led his army over the Brenner Pass into imperial territory. He left behind him only such forces as he thought necessary to maintain order in the towns he had already occupied, light garrisons in Bergamo and Brescia, where he was on friendly terms with the local Venetian Podesta, and where, incidentally, there were strong radical factions among the people, but a considerable force in Verona. This was the one city in which he could take no chances for as well as being Venice's largest and most important mainland possession it controlled the approaches to the Brenna, over which he might well wish to return to Italy in due course. Unfortunately, Verona was also the city in which anti-French feeling was strongest. The massive garrison had long since given up paying for its provisions in cash, and was now forcing local tradesmen to accept tokens and vouchers which everybody knew would never be redeemed. Moreover its commander, General Ondwan Balland, saw his duties as those of a military governor, he showed no consideration for the people of the city and ordered about the recently appointed prove editor Giuseppe Giovanelli and the vice boats for Alvis Cantarini as if they were his own sergeant majors. Even so, the Varanzi would probably have borne their tribulations in silence but for a totally unexpected development that occurred in mid-March. Both Bergamo and Brescia rose in rebellion against Venice. We now know that these revolts were deliberately engineered by a small group of French officers, without the knowledge of Bonaparte. Given the political climate in the two towns, in both of which the radical and anti clerical influence of the Freemasons was particularly strong, the task had not been difficult. A far greater problem was, however, to subvert the surrounding country, where the peasants, having no interest in political ideologies, remained determinedly loyal to the Republic. They poured down from the mountains with staves, pitchforks and any other weapons they had ready to hand, and at one town in the province of Brescia, Salo on Lake Garda, they actually overcame the rebels and restored Venetian rule, taking some 300 prisoners, including 200 Poles fighting with Napoleon's army and a few French soldiers. From that moment there was a limited guerrilla war between the peasants of the mountain valleys and the revolutionaries on the plain below. Despite the prisoners at Salo, the French had from the first played no ostensible part in these uprisings, for which they disclaimed all responsibility. There was, however, a third city in which the same group of agitators had tried to stir up a similar rebellion, and failed. That city was Kramer, about twenty miles south of Bergamo. Here they were obliged to resort to another, more shameless technique, much the same as that used so successfully by the Austrians at Peschira. On the 27th of March a small detachment of French troops asked to be admitted, explaining, to the Podesta that they wished only to pass through and would be on their way the following morning. Permission was reluctantly given, but the next day, instead of keeping their promise, they opened the gates to two more detachments then seized the boats to and his fellow officials and abducted them. Kramer was declared free and the French, together with a group of rebels from Bergamo who had accompanied them, performed the traditional dance round a liberty pole erected in the main square, while the local population looked on in amazement. The news of these defections, when it reached Venice, caused something akin to panic. All the terra firma west of the Mincio was effectively lost. The new frontier formed by that river must be defended at any price, and since Venice's regular army was obviously inadequate, armed militias raised from the local peasantry were the only alternative. General Balland was informed of the Republic's intentions, it being emphasized to him that the measures proposed were to be purely defensive, and directed not against the French but against rebellious citizens of the Republic. Every volunteer was to be given the clearest possible instructions in this sense. Then the recruiting drive began. The number of those enrolled is uncertain, but seems to have been limited only by the quantity of arms available for distribution. There were probably not fewer than 10,000. 
There may have been more. What nobody seems to have properly foreseen is that these tattered Malian forces, suddenly finding themselves for the first time with weapons in their hands, might not be over conscientious in the matter of obeying orders. They had no quarrel with the rebels of Bear, Gamo, and Brescia, who indeed made no attempt to cross the Mincio or even to approach it, they did, however, have plenty of outstanding scores to settle with the French whose foraging parties regularly made free of their crops, their livestock and, as often as not, their wives and daughters into the bargain. Thus, as bands of trigger-happy youths, blue and yellow cockades in their hats, multiplied in the streets of Verona and the neighboring towns, their shouts of Viva San Marco, were increasingly mingled with another, more ominous, war cry, a basso efferency and it was not long before the serious sniping began. A couple of French soldiers, loitering at a street corner, would be picked off where they stood, a whole platoon, out in the countryside on a foraging expedition, might suddenly find themselves surrounded and mercilessly cut down. Ballon's reprisals were swift and predictably savage, but they had no effect. By early April every pretense of civility between French and Italians was gone. Bonaparte on the road to Vienna, was kept fully informed of the worsening situation, and on the 9th of April he decided to send an ultimatum to the Doge, to be delivered at once and in person by the hand of a special emissary, his aide-de-camp General Janot. Janot arrived in Venice on the evening of Good Friday, the 14th of April, and immediately demanded an audience with the Doge early the following morning. The reply was polite but firm. Such an appointment was impossible. Holy Saturday was a day traditionally set aside for religious observances, and neither then nor on Easter Sunday itself could any government business be transacted. The Doge and his full collegio would, however, be happy to receive the general early on Monday morning. This was not the sort of answer that Janot was prepared to tolerate. He was not interested in religious observances and said so. His orders were to see the Doge within 24 hours, and he intended to obey them. If he were not given an audience within that time, he would leave and Venice would have to take the consequences. They would not, he suggested, be pleasant. Thus, when the Collegio reluctantly received Bonaparte's representative, as he desired, early on the Saturday morning, its dignity was already bruised. Ignoring the seat to which he was shown, that normally reserved for ambassadors, on the Doge's right hand, Janot remained standing. Then without preliminary, he pulled Bonaparte's letter from his pocket and began to read. It is a memorable letter, one can almost hear the young general's voice as he dictated it, and it is worth quoting in full Judenberg, 20 Germinal, Year 5. All the mainland of the most serene republic is in arms. On every side, the rallying cry of the peasants whom you have armed is death to the French. They have already claimed as their victims several hundred soldiers of the army of Italy. In vain do you try to shuffle off responsibility for the militias that you have brought into being. Do you think that just because I am in the heart of Germany I am powerless to ensure respect for the foremost people of the universe? Do you expect the legions of Italy to tolerate the massacres that you have stirred up? The blood of my brothers in arms shall be avenged, and there is not one French battalion that if charged with such a duty, would not feel the doubling of its courage, the trebling of its powers. The Venetian Senate has answered the generosity we have always shown with the blackest perfidy. I send you my principal aid to compass bearer of this letter. Is it to be war, or peace? If you do not take immediate measures to disperse these militias, if you do not arrest and deliver up to me those responsible for the recent murders, War is declared. The Turk is not at your gates. No enemy threatens you. You have deliberately fabricated pretexts in order to pretend to justify a rally of the people against my army. It shall be dissolved within 24 hours. We are no longer in the days of Charles VIII. If, against the clearly stated wishes of the French government, you impel me to wage war, do not think that the French soldiers will follow the example of your own militias ravaging the countryside of the innocent and unfortunate inhabitants of the terra firma. I shall protect those people, 
and the day will come when they will bless the crimes that obliged the army of France to deliver them from your tyranny. Bonaparte in the shocked silence that followed, Janot flung the letter on the table in front of him, then turned on his heel and strode from the room to where, on the waterfront below, a boat was waiting to take him back to the French legation. The meeting of the Collegio was not the only extraordinary session to interrupt the Republic's official devotions on that last agonizing Easter Saturday of its existence. The same evening the Senate was summoned, and approved by a vote of 156 to 42 a letter of cringing apology. Bonaparte was assured that the peasant activities to which he objected were nothing but spontaneous expressions of loyalty whose sole object was that of restraining the rebels beyond the Mincio, the occasional unfortunate incidents had been due to the confusion of the moment and were in no wise the fault of the government, which had always stressed the need for moderation. Every effort would be made to apprehend those guilty of violence against the French and to bring them to justice. As an additional and unsolicited token of its good faith, the Republic was also arranging to release all political prisoners taken at Salo. The letter was entrusted to two special emissaries, Francesco Donia and Lunardo Justinian, and dispatched at once. The emissaries had hardly had time to leave the lagoon, however, before reports arrived from the mainland which caused even greater consternation than the appearance of Janot. All Verona had risen, spontaneously, against the French. Throughout Holy Week, placards and posters had been mysteriously appearing all over the city, calling upon the populace for a mass uprising, torn down by Venetians or French, they would be replaced almost at once. The priests, too, always prominent in anti-revolutionary agitation, had profited by the seasonal opportunities to inflame their congregations against the invaders, besides which there had been the usual influx of peasants who had come in from the country the better to celebrate the feast and who, by the afternoon of Easter Monday, the 17th of April, having duly celebrated it, were wandering noisily and somewhat unsteadily around the streets, more than ready for a fight. In such circumstances, and given the already explosive situation, it was not long before individual acts of violence gave place to general rioting. Before nightfall some 400 Frenchmen had been taken prisoner, and the rest had been driven to seek refuge in the city's three strong places. The Castel Vecchio, the Castel Espiatero and the Citadella Ves. Felice. There they were penned in and forced to withstand what was effectively a siege, until on the 20th of April the arrival of a new detachment of French troops secured their release. Even then it was another three days before order was fully restored throughout the city. Bonaparte's retribution for what came, to be called the Pasquaveranzai, the Veronese Easter, was harsh. An indemnity was demanded of 120,000 ducats. Verona was systematically despoiled of her pictures, sculptures and works of art. Silver was seized from the churches, the Monte di Pietà mercilessly looted. 40,000 pairs of boots were demanded, without payment, for the army, and other clothing in similar quantities. Scarcely a single horse was left anywhere in the city. Of the leaders of the rising, eight, including a Capuchin monk, Luigi Coloedo, were executed by firing squad. And what part, it may appropriately be asked, had Venice played in all this? A surprisingly small one since at the earliest possible moment her two senior officials, Giovanelli and Contarini, disguised themselves as peasants and fled from the city. On the following day they were briefly persuaded to return, but disappeared again almost at once. Meanwhile the Veronese Count Francesco Emily hastened to Venice to implore, even at this late stage, the support of the Seremsima for the rising. His request, it is hardly necessary to record, was turned down flat. Venice, how many times did she have to say so? Dash was neutral, and neutral she proposed to remain. To Napoleon Bonaparte in Austria, long before he heard the news of the East arising, the situation in the Veneto was causing considerable anxiety. He had never deluded himself as to the extent of anti French feelings there and he knew that the longer the war was allowed to continue the more dangerous this hostility would grow. 
Meanwhile reports were coming in of similar insurrections over large areas of the Tyrol. He had no doubts, for the moment, that the forces he had left behind him could keep the situation in hand, maintaining his lines of supply, communication and, if necessary, retreat, but there was no indication that they would be able to do so indefinitely. All this was worrying enough but he was also receiving daily information from another sector that gave him still more serious grounds for concern. His army formed only one prong of the French attack on Austria, there was also the Army of the Rhine, commanded by his brilliant young contemporary and chief rival, Lazare Hock, which was now advancing eastwards through Germany at terrifying speed and threatening to reach Vienna before him. This was a possibility that he refused to contemplate. He, and no one else, must be the conqueror of the Habsburg Empire, his whole future career depended on it. He could not allow Hock to steal his triumph. For both these reasons, Bonaparte had decided that France must make an immediate peace with Austria. Already as early as 31 March he had written to the Imperial Commander-in-Chief, the Archduke Charles, one of the most hypocritical letters of his life suggesting that the war should be ended on humanitarian grounds colon one Charles had responded favorably and a week later an armistice was agreed upon as a preliminary to peace negotiations. Thus it came about that on the 18th of April 1797, at the castle of Eckenwald, just outside Leoben, a provisional peace was signed between Napoleon Bonaparte, acting in the name of the French Directory although in fact he had never bothered to consult it, and the Austrian Empire. By its terms, details of which remained secret until they were confirmed six months later at Campo Formio, Austria was to renounce all claims to Belgium and to Lombardy, in return for which she would receive Istria, Dalmatia and all the Venetian terra firma bounded by the Oglio, the Po and the Adriatic. Venice was to be compensated, most inadequately, by the formerly papal territories of Romagna, Ferrara and Bologna. Bonaparte, it need hardly be said, had no conceivable right to dispose in such a way of the territory of a neutral state. He would probably have argued, however, that in his eyes Venice was a neutral state no longer. He could not accept her continued protestations of goodwill when, by her every action, she blatantly betrayed her pro Austrian sympathies. Again and again he had offered her his friendship and invited her to join him in an alliance, but she had always refused. Those that were not with him were against him, and had no more claim on his consideration. On the other hand, there was no escaping the fact that the laws of international diplomacy did not look kindly on the arbitrary carving up of neutrals. However hollow Venice's professed neutrality might be, she would still have to be shaken out of it, and if, during the process, she could be made to appear in an unfavorable or even aggressive light, so much the better. At this point, one might have expected the Republic, which was well aware of the possible consequences of a Franco Austrian peace and was still trembling at the prospect of Bonaparte's wrath over the Pasquarens I, to have leant over backwards to avoid giving him any further offense. Instead, just two days after the signing of the Leoben Agreement, Venice committed an act of such supreme foolishness as to be, even in the context of this whole miserable saga of blundering ineptitude, almost beyond belief. In doing so, moreover, she played straight into Napoleon's hands. On the morning of Thursday, the 20th of April, three French les appeared off the Lido port. At their head was the somewhat provocatively named Liberatur d'Italie, commanded by citizen Ensign Jean Baptiste Largier carrying four guns and a total complement of 52 which included 20 Italian volunteers recently recruited from Ancona. They were on patrol duty, their principal task being to protect French shipping in the Adriatic, and to harass such Austrian vessels as might come their way. Largier and his fellow captains obviously knew nothing of the Leoben agreement of two days before, nor, in all probability, were they aware that on the 17th of April the Council of Ten had issued a decree closing the harbour of Venice to all foreign ships of war. There is no reason to believe that their intentions were aggressive. But the commander of the fortress of S. Andrea, Domenico Pizzamano, was taking no chances. 
The moment the Liberateur entered the channel he fired two warning shots across her bows. At this the two other ships immediately went about and were not seen again, Largier, however, continued on his way until two armed pinnaces from S. Andrea came out to intercept him and block his path. What happened after that is uncertain, French and Venetian testimonies, not surprisingly, conflict. At some point, however, the Liberateur, hove to but carried by a strong tide, collided with the Venetian galout, its crew immediately boarded her, as did the crews of the two pinnaces. Meanwhile Pizzamano opened fire again and continued his bombardment despite Largia's repeated signals of surrender. By the time the firing eventually ceased, Largia and four of his crew were dead and another eight were wounded, as were five Venetians, one of whom, a fisherman from Kyogia who had been taken on by the Liberateur as pilot, subsequently died. The surviving Frenchmen were put in irons, while their ship, or what was left of it, was towed to the arsenal. The French minister, Lalmont, at once lodged a strong protest. The Liberateur, he maintained, was being pursued by two Austrian ships and had simply sought refuge from them and from the weather in a neutral port, as she had every right to do. When a Venetian officer had come on board and demanded her immediate withdrawal, Largia had had no alternative but to comply but before he could do so the guns had opened up both from the fortress and from the neighboring ships. Caught in the crossfire, he had ordered all his men below and himself remained alone on deck, protesting through his megaphone his readiness to submit. He had been killed almost instantly, the other casualties had been sustained only after the arrival of the Venetian boarding party, who had cut down any crew member who made the slightest resistance. Lalmont accordingly demanded the arrest of Pizzamano, whose own account of the affair he condemned as a tissue of lies, the imprisonment of all others concerned and their eventual handing over to Bonaparte for punishment, the restitution of all the impounded property and the immediate return of the survivors to Ancona. The Venetians must have known that they were in the wrong. They cannot have seriously believed that a single small French lar intended to attack their city, or that even if it had, it could have done much serious harm. Largia might have been a little cavalier in his behavior, but that was no excuse for Pizzamano's apparent determination to blow him out of the water. Their only sensible course, to minimize the consequences of this disastrous incident, would have been to apologize to the French, make reasonable reparations, which would have cost them very little, and institute an inquiry, which could have been allowed to drag on until the French had returned to France or the whole thing had been forgotten. Instead, on the 22nd of April, the Senate passed a resolution thanking Pizzamano, congratulating him on his courage and patriotism, and voting an extra month's pay to the crews of the Pinaces and all others concerned. If Venice had deliberately set out to convince Napoleon of her hostility, not that he needed convincing, she could hardly have made a better job of it. Among all the unhappy characters who play their part in this last act of the Venetian drama, there are few more deserving of our sympathy than Francesco Donia and Leonardo Justinian, the two deputies sent off to Bonaparte with the reply to his letter and instructions to placate him as best they could. Even the physical aspect of their task was disagreeable enough. Throughout his career, Napoleon was famous for the speed at which he travelled and for two middle-aged Venetians, those grueling days and nights spent trying to catch up with him, the endless jolting over some of the worst mountain roads in Europe only occasionally interrupted by a few hours rest snatched at some verminous and evil-smelling inn, must have been a nightmare. Nor can their spirits have been improved by the prospect of the stormy scenes that they knew lay ahead of them when they finally ran their quarry to earth. And even that was not all, in every town and village at which they stopped, either to rest or to seek information, the same rumors besieged their ears. France had made peace with Austria, and on the altar of that peace Venice was to be sacrificed. The pursuit lasted over a week, it was not until 25 April, at Graz, that the two exhausted deputies finally drew up before the French camp. Bonaparte received them at once, courteously enough and listened in silence to their protestations of friendship and goodwill. 
Suddenly his expression changed. Dot, have the prisoners been freed? Justinian had started to reply that all the French and Poles, and even certain of the Bressons, were now at liberty when he was angrily interrupted. Dot, no, no, I insist on the release of all prisoners, all those who have been arrested for their political opinions since I arrived in Italy. If not, I myself shall come and break your prisons open, for I shall tolerate none of your inquisitions your medieval barbarities. Every man must be free to express his opinions. And what of all my men, whom you Venetians have murdered? My soldiers cry for vengeance, I cannot deny it to them. The murderers must be dealt with, any government unable to restrain its own subjects is an imbecile government and has no right to survive. Throughout this outburst the deputies were doing their utmost to appease Bonaparte's mounting fury. Those guilty of violence against the French, they assured him, had already been brought to justice. If he knew of any further evidence of crimes still unpunished, he had only to inform them, all such matters would be immediately investigated. But by now he was past listening. Striding backwards and forwards across the room, the speed and volume of his heavily accented Corsican Italian increasing with every step. He launched into a searing diatribe against Venice, her government and her people, accusing them of perfidy, hypocrisy, incompetence, injustice and, most serious of all in his eyes, hostility to himself and to France, ending with the words that were soon to echo in the heart of every Venetian I will have no more Inquisition, no more Senate, lo sero unati le polo stat hovenito. I shall be an atla to the state of Venice. By now, the two deputies, from whose detailed report of the interview, in the Venetian state archives, this account has been taken, were longing only to escape. But Bonaparte had not yet finished with them. His anger subsided, he now insisted that they remain and dine with him, and throughout the meal, which they credibly describe in their report as incommodissimo, submitted them to an interrogation, sometimes teasing sometimes openly hostile, about the Council of Ten, the Inquisitors of State, the prisons, the tortures, the Orfano Canal, where, in the Middle Ages, the Republic used secretly to dispose of its undesirables, and, as they put it, other fabrications by French authors seeking to defame or discredit our government, from which, we protested, the righteous had nothing to fear and which was genuinely beloved by our people. After dinner came yet another tirade before the miserable pair were finally allowed to withdraw. The following morning they left for Venice, only to be intercepted by a courier with a further dispatch from the Signoria, a dispatch as unwelcome as anything they could possibly have imagined. It began with a detailed, if somewhat tendentious, account of the Liberatura incident, the first they had heard of it and ended with instructions to seek another immediate interview with Bonaparte in order to give him the approved Venetian version of the story. Still shaken from their experience of the previous day, the deputies can perhaps be forgiven for interpreting these instructions a little freely and deciding to break the news, in the first instance, by letter. Two hours later they received a reply Gentlemen, I have read with indignation your letter concerning the murder of Largia, which event without parallel in the annals of the nations of our time, you have made still more outrageous by the tissue of lies by which your government has sought to justify itself. I cannot receive you, gentlemen, since you and your senate reek with French blood. When you have delivered into my hands the admiral who gave the order to fire, the commander of the fortress and the inquisitors who direct the police of Venice, I will hear your justification. You will meanwhile be good enough to evacuate, with the shortest possible delay, the mainland of Italy. However, gentlemen, if the dispatch that you have just received concerns the large or incident, you may present yourselves before me. Bonaparte tremblingly, they did so, there followed another stream of invective, the general shouting that, just as he had already brought liberty to other subject peoples, he was now coming to break the chains of the people of Venice. The government, he knew, was now in the hands of a mere handful of nobles. The Council of 800, sick, had not been summoned for the past three weeks. Both Donia and Justinian seemed to have been genuinely astonished by his ignorance, or misinformation, 
about Venetian affairs, if the Republic wished to avoid destruction, he continued, those few men who were using their power to stir up hostility to France must be prescribed at once. In their despair, the deputies were unwise enough to hint that Venice might offer another kind of satisfaction, but this only aroused Bonaparte to a fresh outburst of rage. All the riches of Peru, he thundered, would not deter him from avenging his men. The two Venetians saw that there was no more to be said. Collecting the few shreds of dignity left to them, sorrowfully and in fear, they took their leave. When the report by Donia and Justinian of their first meeting with Bonaparte reached Venice, Doge Manin and the Signorio already knew that the Republic was doomed. War was imminent, further negotiation was impossible, the terra firma was as good as lost and the only hope of saving the city itself from destruction lay in capitulation to the conqueror's demands. These demands were terrible indeed, nothing less than the abdication of the entire oligarchy, the abandonment of a constitution that had lasted more than a thousand years, and its replacement by a democracy. A revolution, in fact, but a revolution initiated from above, by those who were to be its principal victims, the suicide of the state. But how was this suicide to be accomplished? It could not come to pass constitutionally, through the Senate, where such a proposal would meet with violent opposition, the resulting debates would drag on for days, and long before they were resolved the French would be within the lagoon. In any case, what use was discussion when the issue was inevitable, and why respect a constitution in the very act of abolishing it? The Senate gathered on the 29th of April to conduct some formal business of no particular interest or importance. When that business was over it broke up as usual. It never met again. The following day, towards evening, the Dode summoned a special meeting. Present, apart from himself and his six councillors, were the three chiefs of the Quarantia, all the Savi including the three outgoing Savi del Consiglio the three Carpi of the Council of Ten and the three of Ogadere di Common. Although such a grouping was wholly unconstitutional, its 42 members included representatives of all the principal executive organs in the government, its moral authority was therefore considerable. Robes of office were set aside. The members all wore informal black clothes, and the Consultanera, as it came to be called, was the only effective decision-making body in the Republic's last days. The Great Council, however, was still in existence, its 1,169 members still constituting the fount of political authority in the Republic. It could not be cast aside as the Senate had been, and the first decision of the Consultanera was that it should be summoned to an extraordinary session the next morning when the doge in person should officially inform it of Bonaparte's ultimatum and seek its approval for the measures proposed. The consulta was still discussing the precise terms of the resolution when there suddenly arrived a dispatch from Thomas Ockendolma, written from his flagship off Fusina, reporting that the first French soldiers had already arrived on the shores of the lagoon and were even now positioning their heavy guns well within range of the city. The effect of this news was electric. In the general consternation some members panicked, others broke down and wept. Francesco Pissarro, hitherto one of the most courageous and robust advocates of a strong line against the French, openly declared his intention of taking flight to Switzerland. The Doge himself set an example only slightly more edifying, walking up and down the room wringing his hands and repeating those words which, for the rest of his life, he was never able to live down, stand not, no semo securi ni ansh nel nostro letto, tonight there will be no safety for us, not even in our own beds. But the night passed uneventfully enough, and the next morning, the 1st of May, the great council met as arranged, in a doge's palace now heavily guarded by Arsenalotti and Dalmatian troops. Doge Mainin his face deathly pale and with tears streaming down his cheeks, comma one took his place at the rostrum, warning his audience at the outset that his emotional and physical state might prevent him from finishing even the short allocution he had prepared. Then, simply and sadly, he described the circumstances in which the Republic now found itself, and proposed a resolution instructing the two deputies, Donia and Justinian, 
to inform Bonaparte that all political prisoners would be freed at once and all those who had taken up arms against Frenchmen punished. The deputies were also empowered to discuss and elucidate the constitutional changes the general required. The Doge was not to know that, by the time this resolution was approved, by 598 to 7, with 14 abstentions, the deputies were already on their way back to Venice, nor that on that very same day Bonaparte was issuing a manifesto adducing 15 separate proofs of Venetian hostility, most of them travesties of the truth and formally declaring war on the Republic. Simultaneously he sent instructions to his representative in Venice, Lalmont, to leave the city forthwith, his sinister and intrigue-loving secretary, Villetard, remaining as charged affair. Other directives were sent to the French commanders in Italy, ordering them to treat all Venetians as enemies and to pull down or efface the Lion of St. Mark wherever it appeared. Henceforth the collapse was swift. On the 9th of May Villetard produced an ultimatum, spelling out Bonaparte's requirements in considerably greater detail than before. These were the following the Comte d'Antreigues, the self-styled ambassador of Louis XVIII, but never recognized as such by Venice, to be arrested, and freed only after the seizure of all his papers and their transmission to the Directory in Paris. The Posse and Pumbi, respectively the cells on the ground floor above the water level, of their prigium and those immediately under the leads of the doge's palace roof, to be opened for inspection by the people, after the release of the last three political prisoners from the latter. One, the cases of all other prisoners to be reviewed and the death penalty abolished. The Dalmatian troops to be disbanded and discharged. The policing of the city to be entrusted to patrols under the authority of a specially constituted committee headed by General Salimberni the former Venetian commander-in-chief on terra firma, and others of known democratic sympathies. A tree of liberty to be erected on the piazza. A provisional municipality to be established of 24 Venetians, later to be supplemented by delegates from the cities of terra firma, Estria, Dalmatia and the Levant. A manifesto to be issued announcing the creation of a democracy inviting the populace to choose its representatives. The insignia of the former government to be burnt at the foot of the Tree of Liberty, a general amnesty to be proclaimed for all political offenders and the freedom of the press to be decreed, with the proviso that there should be no discussion about the past, either of personalities or government. Services of thanksgiving to be held in St. Mark apostrophes. 3,000 French troops to be invited into Venice, to take over the arsenal the fortress of S. Andrea, Kyogia and any other strategic points that the French general might designate. The Doge's palace, the Zecca and other important buildings to be entrusted to the Civic Guard for protection. The Venetian fleet, such as it was, to be recalled to the lagoon and to be placed under the joint command of the French and of the municipality of which Menin and the democratic leader Andrea Spada were to be co-presidents. All Venetian ambassadors abroad to be replaced by Democrats. The credit of the Mint and the National Bank to be guaranteed by the state. To approve these demands, there was no longer any influential voice to advocate resistance, or even argument, the Great Council was called for Friday, the 12th of May. From soon after sunrise the people of Venice had been congregating in the Piazza and Piazzetta, just as they had done countless times before in the city's history. In the past, however, they had usually assembled for purposes of celebration or, on rare occasions, to express their dissatisfaction or concern. Never before had they gathered together out of fear. By now all were aware that the end had come, but none had any clear idea of what form that end would take. The atmosphere was an unfamiliar one in Venice an atmosphere of uncertainty, bewilderment, and ill-defined apprehension. Among the working population there were many who, in contrast to their enfranchised superiors, believed that the Republic, doomed or not, could and should have fought for her survival, for them, there was anger mingled with their shame, and they were in no mood to conceal it. Bands of these rough loyalists were roaming the streets, crying Viva San Marco and hurling abuse at any patricians they chanced to encounter on their path. Partly, perhaps, for this reason, though many of the nobles seemed already to have fled the city, 
or to have hurried to their mainland estates in an effort to save them from the French soldiery, the council fell short, by 63 members, of its constitutional quorum of 600. But the time for such niceties was past. The Doge called the meeting to order, apprised it of Bonaparte's terms and proposed a motion by which, with the most high object of preserving unharmed the religion, life and property of all these most beloved inhabitants, the oligarchy surrendered all its powers to a provisional democratic government. When he had finished, one of the members mounted the rostrum to open the debate, even though the conclusion was foregone, the council had to be given the chance to express its views. Scarcely had he begun to speak, however, when the sound of firing was heard just outside the palace. At once, all was confusion. To the terrified members of the council, such sounds could mean one thing only, the popular uprising that they had so long dreaded had begun. Some saw themselves being torn to pieces by the mob as they left the palace, others had visions of days and weeks in the Posi or Piombi, so recently vacated by their former occupants, while the guillotine was set up in the piazza. All had one single object in view, to escape from the palace, in disguise if necessary, while there was still time. Within minutes, the true source of the firing had been established, some of the Dalmatian troops, who were being removed from Venice on Bonaparte's orders, had simply discharged their muskets into the air as a parting salute to the city. But the panic had begun, reassurances were useless. To urgent cries of vote. Vote. The debate was abandoned and the remaining legislators of the Venetian Republic rushed to the ballot boxes to perform their last hurried duty to the state they had claimed to govern. The final count was 512 in favor of the resolution, 20 against, and 5 abstentions, but few of those who voted remained to hear it. Leaving their all too distinctive robes of office behind them, they were already slipping discreetly away out of side entrances to the palace when, to an almost empty chamber, the doge declared the resolution adopted. The Republic of Venice was no more. Lodovico Menin himself made no attempt to flee. Almost alone among his fellow nobles, he had maintained a quiet calm amid the hubbub, a calm born, perhaps, of fatalism or even of despair, but a calm nonetheless that enabled him to keep his dignity, even while the last frail structure of the Republic crumbled about him. In the sudden stillness that followed the breakup of the meeting he slowly gathered up his papers and withdrew to his private apartments. There, having laid aside his ducal corno, he carefully untied the ribbons of the close-fitting cap of white linen worn beneath it, the cuffietta, and handed it to his valet, Bernardo Trevisan, with those sad words which, more than any others, seem to symbolize the fall of Venice, Tol, Costanola do Peropu, take it. I shall not be needing it again.